questions to anybody? Um, both in the room, as well as those of you who are online, please put your questions in the Slido, and we're monitoring that as we're going. Um, with that, I feel like maybe you want to start with some comments. I'm happy to start. Um, so I think everybody knows who I am at this point, uh, but Jim McManus, Division Director of Division of Ocean Sciences. Um, I... I'm happy that Rick is here. <laughs> Rick might not be as happy as I am, but um, <laughs> but as Tuba said in the beginning, uh, Rick was really, uh, shall we say, on the ground floor of the the first uh, or the, the previous decadal survey, and so it, I couldn't possibly provide you with the context that uh, Rick Rick would have and in the comments relevant to your question about what. Did, CE, what did the division do in response to the, the previous uh, decadal survey? And so I'm going to turn it over in just a second and let Rick talk through that. But um, but I want to sort of emphasize as a matter of of matter of course that we we are here to help answer your questions. So if we're not answering a question, it either means we can't, we will tell you that. <laughs> um, and, uh, or um, we're, we may not understand that that's what, that's what you want. And uh, so we're, what I'm saying in a long-winded way, those who know me know I do that, um, is we would like this to be about dialogue. Um, so we're here to help you. We're here to help you help us. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And I guess before right, I, I should have maybe prefaced this whole session with the idea that um, this isn't really about like, I don't want this to come across as well. We produced a DSOS 1 report and what did NSF do with that? Did you do everything we told you to do? That's not what this conversation is about. It really is about more, um, you know, what is it that we can do? How can we help you help us? Um, and what kind of a report would we have to produce in order for it to be really truly actionable? So that's that's really the information we're after. We also realized that um, the landscape when the first report was put together was very different compared to what it is now. And we've actually spent, our, one of our subcommittees has spent a significant amount of time thinking about the way in which the landscape is different. Um, and so there too, I think we're going to be listening, Rick, to what you have to say with that lens on, that the landscape then was different, that the committee then was really asked very specific questions, um, and we're being asked different specific questions for good reasons. Um, and, and the more we understand about how the landscape was then, the better it is, I think, that we can relate what we do to the landscape that we have right now. So... Let's keep that in mind also. Yeah, thank you. And I also want to draw attention to the fact that Jim Yoder, who's co-chair of the current DSOS, was a member of that first committee as well. Um, and so he also has you know, knowledge from that committee's perspective. So you have Jim on that committee. I was the recipient of the report. And we have Jim here and Shelby from NSF, um, but you know Jim calling for the current uh, report. Picking up on Tuba's main point, um, it was a long time ago that I was there, and I received this report, which was a beautiful report, I'm um, truly, uh, in January of 2015. As I said earlier, I had been there full time about three weeks. I'd been a casual for the previous six months or so back and forth, but I really um, knew very little. Um, and it was one of those times when I remember I got the, the preview version one day ahead of time before the report was issued. And it came out of email and I remember just thinking, when I click on this PDF, my life is going to change. I just have no idea. How, you know how what you... You get that review from somebody, you're like, I gotta click, you gotta click. Oh God, what does it say? I gotta go on a run first before I can put it in. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and it was a very, very different time. I mean, budgets are always difficult. Um, then the times were particularly acute. Uh, infrastructure was the real main driver, as I understand, in 
in issuing that report um, with the uh, with a flat budget and infrastructure costs continuing to rise as a matter of inflation and uh, human personnel costs and fuel and and everything the uh, infrastructure cost rising meant there was an erosion in the uh, science budget uh, the science programs the four core programs plus all the ancillary programs that are interdisciplinary and so on and so forth um, two comments first of all is the, the team at NSF was perhaps the best team of scientists I've ever scientists and staff I've ever worked with and so it was truly a pleasure to be able to work with them upon receipt of this report. Secondly, I considered that report as a true gift because it was very well written. It was very targeted. And, you know, when you come in as a new leader to some whatever unit it is, you're often asked to put together a strategic plan. Well, I didn't have to do that. Um, and all these other plans, it was delivered to me literally three weeks upon my arrival. And with the talented staff that we had, in particular, the um, uh, section heads and program managers and everybody, I don't know how many staff there are now, but there were 42 total staff in, in, at the time, including admin support. So it's a small group, a focus group, and we were able to roll up our sleeves uh, and work on it uh, you know, together. Um, <clears throat> it was a long time ago. Between Jim and myself, there was another division director, Terry Quinn. Um, and so he dealt with some of the um, items, you know, to my understanding, that I was not able to deal with. The short answer I have is, we took the report extremely seriously. We went through it with all the program managers, recommendation by recommendation, graph by graph, and analyzed it and dissected and uh, figured out where we agreed, where we agreed strongly, where we agreed weakly, and then where we, where we disagreed. We kept NSF's leadership fully informed. Um, I recall going up, um, sometimes being asked, sometimes being demanded up to the director's office. Uh, it was France Cordova at the time, and she had the suit change hard copy, and it was highlighted, and there were post-its everywhere, and she would open it up and say, what do they mean by recommendation 4.12a? And then, oh, Jesus, everything. so you know, getting into it. I point that out somewhat anecdotally, but I'm assuming um, that you know NSF leadership will be paying attention to this. Uh, congressional staff pay attention to these McCable surveys. Um, I was called up to the to Congress for private meetings about it as well, um, and so on. So it's a big deal. It's not just a report that lands and that goes on to the shelf. Okay. We were pretty successful, I think, in achieving the main goal to a first order. We had detailed conversations about how to decrease the cost of infrastructure and transfer those monies dollar for dollar. They stayed within OCE. They did not get vacuumed up to GEO. They did not get vacuumed up to you know, telescopes or something else in the foundation. All you know, worthy investments, but we were also given the gift inside the building that those dollars guaranteed to stay in OCD. And so every dollar we were able to economize, and I do mean that not just in a bureaucratic, gentle way, but we really focused on economizing what infrastructure was doing, where some infrastructure was less of a priority as perceived by the community, and dollar for dollar, they went into the core science programs. By the end of my time there, and some of these decisions were quite controversial, but by the end of my time there, we had transferred um, roughly $25 million out of infrastructure side into the science programs, the core science programs, and in particular, um, uh, um, OTIC, Candy Bakelet, yeah, Candy Bakelet's program. 
how we did it was fortunately those 41 people, they were all the same people. They were, they are all involved in infrastructure and they're all involved in science support. And so that real guarantee as the dollars would transfer internally and stay within OCE, a person would be saying, okay, well, I sure I'm gonna miss that infrastructure, but on the other hand, I oftentimes the exact same person, I'm gonna certainly welcome the investment in the science program. And that was what we did for three and a half years um, with the drilling program, the big three being the drilling program, OOI, um, and the academic research fleet. With the drilling program, in particular, because there's congressional language and um, you know long-term contracts and so on, we did not have much flexibility. So we focused on economizing the money that was going to the U.S. science support program and some of the ancillary activities of drilling. With the OOI, we removed the two Southern Ocean moorings, one in the Southern Ocean, one in the Argentine Basin. Those were each about $8 million of annual uh, uh, O&M. <clears throat> that was extremely controversial uh, to do. Um, people lost their jobs at various oceanographic institutions because there was no longer a need, and we were acutely aware of that, but we had to do it, and we did. And then with um, the academic research fleet, we did a lot of things with various operators uh, the main thing that we took up was the seismic research vessel, the Marcus Langseth, um, which at the time was owned by NSF, and that was a that was deemed to be, you know, financially non-sustainable on our part. So we had deep and long conversations with Lamont about how to um, make that more sustainable. We put a cap on their dollar values um, that we were awarding them. And then initiated a long process that uh, I think it was during Terry Quinn's time. Um, Lamont ended up owning the vessel, uh, you know, eventually. So we got it off of NSS books. That was very controversial, um, but that was what we did. So that was the landscape. Um, it was actually simple to understand the tasking, and it took a lot of people in the building in OCE, in GEO, and at the director's level to make it all kind of work out. But it was pretty much infrastructure is eating our lunch scientifically. We've got to put some caps and controls on that and then move over those monies, which we were able to do. Um, I won't get into all the internal discussions we had about it, but we really encourage candid, um, animated uh, you know, uh, conversations in that way. So two things that Rick, one thing that I'm hearing is that you had to make some difficult decisions. And in, while you were doing that, if you have a report that you can point to, well, the scientific community wants us to make these decisions yes. in some sense that, that enables you to keep moving in that direction, even when you're meeting resistance. In that sense, that's why it was a gift. Right. Um, and But the second thing I'm hearing is that there was a lot of visibility of the first report all the way up and down the NSF architecture, you know, yeah, yeah. Ship. and is that, um, and that maybe this is a question for Jim, um, is that by default, every decadal survey gets that kind of attention, or, you know, how do we make sure that we write a report that will receive, you know, will be thumbed and, and you know, underlined by folks up and down the chain at NSF? Um, I, I don't know the answer to your question of how to get get the survey in the right places. Um, what what Rick did in ways I just couldn't have done because I don't have the historical context is really set the table for where we were then. Where we are now is much closer to um, <coughs> focus on our priorities and what do we need to the future. And so in some ways, the, the previous decadal survey was a little bit looking backwards and a little bit taking stock of where we are now and addressing those challenges that are much more immediate. And where, what I would say is to get the right audience, Tuba, which I think is your question, is it needs to be a much more of a visionary document than the previous document was. So um, it, in, in that document, I'm just gonna 
use an example in that document, it talked a little bit about technology and the needs for technology going forward. Um, the overprint of what that means for the future is even more important today. Um, what do we need? What kind of infrastructure capabilities do we need to be doing our job well in 2035? Um, I, I made this comment, I've made this comment more than once. I'm doing my job correctly. The division director in 2035 won't be wondering what on earth was he doing? <laughs> Meaning me in this instance, right? It, it would be much better if they didn't think about who was around in 2025, mm. because it is operating in a way that makes a lot of sense in 2035. So I, I, I neither need the, the adoration, if you will, of success, nor the criticism of failure. I don't want either. I want success to be its own goal. And that success is 10 years from now, what are we doing and what do we put in place today? And that is your question. To, that's how I'm taking your question. Mm -hmm. what, what does our community need to put in place today so that the, the basic research, broadly defined, community is well situated a decade from now? Um, we still have challenges that the sort of, I don't think Rick would say, I don't want to put words in Rick's mouth, but I don't think Rick would say, we did a bunch of things and all is great, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we're still addressing some of those, those legacy issues because you can't simply, you, even though we're in the federal government, so it'll be obvious, we can't move quickly inside the federal government very well, but we also can't inside our field. So it's just, it's not a snap of the fingers is all I'm, all I'm saying. And so that's why I am very focused on what can this report help us with over the next 10 years so that we're in a place where the following decadal survey is, is continuing to look forward and, and can look forward with what we've left behind. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a lot of fancy words, but, but if you've read it, by the way, I reread it for the third time. I've been in my job for 18 months. I reread it for the third time yesterday, just to make sure it's heavy on exactly what Rick is talking about. That's not where we are, and please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And and so really aspirational is what we need. The other thing that was mentioned, and it's not a subtlety, it often gets, and I think everybody in this room is aware of it, but the decadal survey is one of a number of inputs that we take. Um, Rick mentioned the Hill. Um, lots of those folks know who I am. And I participate, my colleague Shelby Walker is often in those meetings, um, often related to facilities and questions from the Hill about facilities. So keep in mind that we're not the only voice here. Uh, there are lots of voices. Um, the Executive Office of the President, congressional folks, um, the upper reaches of the foundation. You know, the NSF has a strategic plan. It has uh, aspirational goals as well. It's important that we, that we are cognizant of those as we move forward. Um, so lots of feedback we get. I think there's about a half a dozen we normally say that we get get feedback from, and this is this is certainly an important one. Um, I don't think I've answered any questions. No, you, um, you did great. So in fact, um, let me let me ask you a clarifying question, because you sort of hinted at this, I think. Uh, Rick talked about how, um, you know, they were essentially trying to reduce infrastructure costs and pump that back into the core research part of the house. And you, you almost you said, you know, that you were guaranteed that that wouldn't be sucked into something else. Where are we at in terms of the landscape today about how all of that works? In a very different place. Okay. I'll tell you what I can, maybe. Um, the, they're much, the, the infrastructure side of the NSF house, if you will, is 
managed slightly differently than it was a few years ago compared to the basic research side of the house. And so what that really means is the freedom to move back and forth um, is much, much harder. What, what happened 10 years ago might not be able to happen today. I, I don't want to speak in absolutes, but I will say that the the where we the good news of where we are and my colleague Shelby can sort of uh, contradict me if I'm wrong, but we are dedicated as as an institution to taking care of our facilities, quite frankly, um, and in ways that maybe we haven't been as attended to the rising costs of of executing on those, both in terms of labor parts. You know, you all know. I don't need to tell anybody in this room that shipbuilding has not gone up linear, linearly the last couple of years. It has gone up way, way faster than it was going 10 years ago. Simple access to materials, you all know coming out of the pandemic, that supplies are not what they were 10 years ago. So all of these factors roll into, we've really got to have a lot more eyes on the facility side of what we do. Um, and Shelby's position, which is relatively new in, in, the, in the directorate, is see, helps us oversee at the directorate level how facilities are being executed within the divisions. And then there's a parallel at the, up in the, on the 19th floor. So we're doing things quite differently than we did once before. So that, the real point is that movement back and forth is much, much harder. Yeah, that's important for us to know. Um, Susan, I see you have your hand up. Um, and usually, you know, even if you are a committee member in the room, if you want to ask a question, let's use the hand um, on Zoom to kind of equalize mm -hmm. access to questions a bit. Oh, and I see things are coming in on, <laughs> um, on um, yeah, things are coming in on uh, Silo as well. So, mm -hmm. Susan. So I had a question because 2035, to me, it sounds like it's way out there in the future. I know it's, you know, from a planning purpose, it's not. But thinking about how, you know, we, we get caught by surprise, surprises very often. And I'm thinking, you know, something like the pandemic or what really happened, I think, lot, one of the things that happened last time was that escalation in the fuel costs. And so I'm wondering, is that something that this committee should think about the, you know, some of the surprises and it could be a new technology, right? It could be some fabulous new technology that really, you know, the ocean community adopts and mm -hmm. suddenly our needs are a little bit different. I'll answer that from my perspective. Um, I would say no, in, in, a, in a word, we can't, we inside the federal government, it's very difficult for us to plan for the unforeseen. And so having high level aspirational goals and things, directions we need to be going, we need to be pretty resistant to another global pandemic. Um, and day to day, the, the team inside of OCE will deal with those problems as they come up. But I would say that that's not energy well spent. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, you know makes me think about it is that it helps us understand what level to think about those aspirational goals. You don't want them to be too specific, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. If I could, if I could yeah. add something to that, not about what's going on in the building now, because I don't know. I just mm -hmm. want to be very clear about that. But one thing I think is very important for people to recognize is that NSF still needs to be doing their job of running the programs they have, meeting the needs of the community, and the day-to-day -day really important work. It's not like they're going to receive a report and stop everything else they're doing and throw all their dedication into implementing a report because they've got the very real pressures of the day-to-day of everything that's going on at sea, on land, programs, and so on. So there's a there's a, a blending of the implementing the aspiration 
implementing what they're currently responsible and enthusiastic about and and moving in that direction. So that's another important component to keep in mind. So, um, but the question about the Sue's, Sue's question about the specificity of our recommendations actually dovetails really well, Jason, with the question that you have in silo. So, um, Jason, you want to ask a question? Yeah, that, I was thinking the same thing. Thank you. Uh, in the last report, there were 10 priority questions. And Rick, what I heard you say is that gave you cover to move from infrastructure and plugging in those areas. At one level, I'm curious to see how well that played out, but that's secondary. And the question really is for you, Jim, your statement of tasks is you know, give us two or three priorities. Otherwise, they're not priorities. And I get that when you manage it, but that there's a tension between two or three priorities and a level of specificity versus everybody that knows I'm on this committee is saying, hey, here's a great idea. Why don't you champion this? Here's an idea. And what is the right balance? Where, where should we head with that? And can we have a discussion about that? Because I'm concerned if we get too limited, we're going to miss some things. And I, I see the other danger too specific and we miss everything, you know, other things. Yeah. That's a clear question. Jim. It, it's clear. It, it's probably clearer than my answer is going to be, but um, <laughs> when I read through the decade, the previous decadal report, as I was working my way through some of the, the science nuggets, um, some of my reactions were, well, that's just a proposal. And so it, and for context, I spent decades on soft money writing proposals. Uh, I was a, uh, a program officer, uh, a rotator. Um, so uh, it is easy for, I find it easy to look at something and say, is that a priority or is that a proposal? Keep in mind, what Rick is saying is that we've got this infrastructure um, Rick didn't use these words. I'll use these words. Uh, we're in the proposal receiving business, right? And so at, at the very core of what we do, we are constantly looking for innovative ideas. The fact that a particular question or a particular uh, path of, or path of research um, is written in the decayed survey is not going to impact a decision about whether or not a proposal is funded. And so, so there's a, a broad spectrum between what the this report would, would say from the perspective of their individual proposal ideas to uh, very visionary where the field needs to be and be going. And what I would say is lean way this way. Mm -hmm. if, if you query a question and say, well, that's a, that's a half million dollar proposal. That doesn't belong in the decayal survey. And that's what I would say. Um, others may. So, so if I could follow up, yeah. you're saying think strategic, thematic, big picture. Yes, please. Not. Yeah. yeah. That, that brings to mind another question for me, at least. Um, I went back and read the original Bush report that led to the creation of the National Science Foundation. That was an interesting read as well. Um, because NSF, after all, is the science, basic science agency for the U.S. There's a couple of questions on silo about how the work that NSF does relates to other agencies. But Mona, I think your question is really timely um, uh, about sort of the, that definition, that piece of it. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. So basic research, what does NSF mean by basic research, broadly speaking, as you said? And how does it differ from use-inspired research? Because in many solicitations, we see use-inspired use and co-production. So to what extent do you want us to focus on co-production, use-inspired, the direction in which other disciplines are moving? Yeah, so I, I think in the tasks, it's pretty clear that I would like this committee to address that question. Um, so the, your last question is to what extent do part of the charge here is I need you to answer that question. 
okay? So we have a basic research framework and it's how we operate is under that framework. If you wanna see uh, something of a difference in approach, so use inspired to me, and, and I, I did not read the Bush document, by the way, just in full disclosure. So, but as we, as a, as a, as an agency, we think about use inspired research, which on the spectrum of things is between applied and basic research. And, but it, it's driven by a use question, right? So it's, it's basic research applied to that question, if you will. It's not, you know, I, I hope this is a little bit clear. It, it must not be perfectly clear in my mind. I'd have a clearer answer. Um, but, but it really, we are at a point in the ocean sciences community where we're asking the question, how much or, and what of use inspired work, where do, where do we fit in and we belong as a community? I think we belong there. I'm happy to reveal my own uh, feelings on this. And I would also say we do this work now. We are, I could rattle off a bunch of examples, but at the risk of getting some of them wrong, I, I don't wanna do that, but, but we already operate in this space. What else can we be doing in the use inspired space? Still very much consistent with what we want to do, um, but it, it's, it's a spectrum. There's not, it's not a simple A or B choice. There's one of my colleagues likes to use NSFA and NSFB to describe where we are. So we, we sit on that spectrum all the time. It's not just NSFB or NSFA where one is use inspired and one is basic research. There's a spectrum. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, let's see, uh, I have a lot of questions on silo. I know we're not gonna get to all of them. And I also see that we have folks joining who are going to be part of our next panel, which we were going to start at nine, but we're about 15 minutes running um, late. So I hope it's okay. Um, I hope you all have the time to accommodate for that. Um, Rose, Debbie, um, Doug, Rob, and Bob, um, and Kip. Um, yes, I'm getting some thumbs up, so thank you for that. Let's see, let me go to Ajit and then Peter, since you all are. Thanks. So then, um, so from where I sit, I, I see a little bit of more, the things change the more they stay the same. And it doesn't seem to me that the challenges are that different in some fashion with infrastructure budgets and all the rest of that. But very specifically to this report, I do worry that I might be misunderstanding something I've got to be confused about something so I'd like to like your clarification. Um, you were asking for something that's visionary. Um, I have been thinking that we need to have it in some fashion grounded in reality so that what we suggest actually is useful as opposed to a fantasy. You need to find some space between the two. Um, very specifically, I guess, to illustrate that in the previous report, almost every priority question had at the end of it, talk to other agencies. I know how difficult that is. And so I, I want know. to make sure that we don't make suggestions like that, that you know are just not going to make that much progress. So I just wonder if you can sort of clarify or help me. Uh, Ajit, that's a good question. As I mumbled, I know you know. <laughs> um, but what I would say in the last year and a half of my time in OCE, there's, there is a much, much greater awareness for talking across the federal family um, where, you know, I could be getting part of this wrong, but a lot of the crosstalk of, amongst the federal family was very, historically was very much focused on program officer to program officer. Um, that still occurs. But what I'd say is now we sort of all the way up to the 19th floor, those, con that's how many floors we have. So <laughs> all the way up to the 19th floor, those conversations are happening. And so as much as we can, we are constantly trying to figure out how we can solve challenging problems that individual agencies may have together. And that 
that's happening maybe not day to day, but it, but it's happening pretty frequently. I spend a lot of my time in interagency meetings. Um, and as you know, our separate bureaucracies are often um, gentle hurdles. <laughs> if I can just say one, one thing to that, just to the community is the, the interagency working group environment that IWGs is very, very robust. And I believe it still remains robust. And what Jim is talking about is very, very true. There's a lot of conversations between the different agencies at mid and low level, mm -hmm. mid levels, and also relatively high levels. And um, to speak to that point, you know, directly. So just a quick other point is, um, I have been thinking that we're talking about um, the balance between making suggestions on how you do something and what you do. Yeah. Right? Correct. Yeah. And do you want to say anything Carl, about your um, desire for a vision on either end? I would please minimize the how suggestions. Um, unless folks ha really do have a, a way a way forward um, on on particular. I spend a lot of my time on how, and so do my colleagues in the division, how we can actually accomplish something. And I'll give you an, an anecdote without any specificity so I don't get anybody in any trouble. But there are at times conversations where someone may say, I'd appreciate your help, but it's probably more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> and we've got this. And so that, that's okay. That's life, right? <laughs> no, I don't need your help. I, I've got this myself. And so those conversations are, are just part of the dialogue. Um, and so sometimes you might not see us working with no one, just pick an agency on something because it's better if we don't. Um, so anyways, let, let us worry about the how. Okay, I'm going to go to Peter. All right, thank you. Everybody. Thank you both for, for sharing your thoughts. I'll, I'll keep it short, but it's I, I'm, what you said about the, the kind of separation and management between infrastructure and basic is what caught my attention as we think about developing this report, I want to make sure we don't proceed from sort of poor assumptions, right? Are we really talking to kind of two different management entities? In other words, if we're making recommendations, are you, would you encourage us to not say, oh, well, you know, infrastructure, uh, you know, support can move from here to basic research. We should really be saying, here's an infrastructure recommendation. Here's a basic research recommendation. That's, that's what I'm hearing you say then I am effective at communicating that message. Very good, thank you. Um, Marsha, I see you have a question on silo. Do you wanna ask that? Yes, so um, you said that we shouldn't anticipate things like rising fuel costs um, when Susan asked that. However, there are some trends such as the cyber trend. So we have an exponential increase in data. We have the advent of ARML. I understand not anticipating things that we can't anticipate like a global pandemic, but can you make a couple comments about realizing that we have trends going forward and anticipating the effects of those trends? That's sort of like the landscape now being different from 10 years ago. Yeah, so um not exactly sure how to answer that question, but I'm gonna steal something from your language and use it as an example. So you mentioned cybersecurity, so. Well, I'm, I, just to be clear, um, cybersecurity is a part of it, but the whole cyber infrastructure, so data storage, data access, computing infrastructure, and security, I would say is kind of all part of that landscape. Yeah, so. It's no secret because we put an ad out on the street for somebody, a program officer on cyber infrastructure, cybersecurity, who would work underneath our integrated programs, aka facilities infrastructure. So our recognition that this has grown as very much part of the portfolio of things we do under the um, under the auspices of our data collection and and our facilities is getting us to respond to, okay, we need some more expertise in this space. Um, I know the UNOL's office 
thinks about this as well. Um, and lots of our colleagues within the foundation, all the way up again to the 19th floor, is we we hired a, a person recently in the foundation, Shelby, I don't remember his title, but it's very much in this space. And so, do you remember his title? He's the Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity. So we are responding to what is sort of the growth I, maybe you implied explosion of of data cyber infrastructure and cybersecurity challenges, and so we're doing what we can. It is reasonable to make recommendations in this particular space, um, knowing that we are moving in in this direction as well. Um, Excellent, thank you, Jim. So we have a few minutes left. Um, and there is a question online from Mark Abbott that I think is an interesting one because it relates to, Jim, what you said about what versus how. The first DSAS report did have some items where they were sort of saying, here's how you do it. Um, and how easy was it to respond to that or not? It, it, Mark, really, it's a two-part question I see, and I don't know if you can unmute yourself and ask it yourself. I'll just watch the Zoom here. There you are. Um, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, it's actually uh, recommendation number seven in the report uh, talks about creating a high level standing infrastructure committee that would look 10 years out and would look at 10 year plans and look at puts and takes on the, the whole infrastructure side. I can't see if that anywhere in the NSF documents, if that was ever created. And if it is or whatever it is, there are all sorts of issues. What are the issues right now? So, for example, renewal, of, and maybe it'll be in the next section, renewal of the global class ships, but also biogeochemical Argo. That was a one shot. What are the what are the larger issues that the NSF OCE division is looking at in terms of high level structure? And I think even though it is sort of a, high, a how recommendation, it really is, we really want the agency to always be looking you know, at least 10 years out in terms of infrastructure, because that's sort of the time scale. So it's a bit of a, how do we engage the community in that planning process? I'll stop there. Thank you, Mark. Very quick answer. Hi, Mark. This is Rick. Very, very quick answer to the first part with that recommendation. We decided not to put together that committee at the time because we wanted to get that house in order, as it were, first, get to a particular point of stasis of doing the very first round of realignment and then leaving it to the future leadership of NSF, not as a punt, but as a need to get things stabilized. And then that committee, if NSF chose at the time to do, you know, would, would move in that direction. So that was a conscious decision on our part at the time. But over to Jim, I guess, for the rest. Yeah. So Mark, that's probably the one recommendation I read again yesterday, <laughs> thinking, hmm, I wonder what they mean by that. Um, so, well, and so I interpreted that uh, a little bit that it was a community driven oversight community. Um, and what I would say is in, internally, we have grown our um, institutional oversight on uh, facilities. That, actually, I'm going to ask Shelby if she'd be willing to comment um, on that at all. It, no is an acceptable answer, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, oversight is probably not the term we want to use here. Um, I think oversight is within the agency. Um, so if we're thinking about uh, community input into the portfolio of assets that we're considering, you know, that that is, um, you know, that is advisory in nature. That is something that certainly could be considered. Um, and I know that conversations have existed within NSF as to what level does that really live when we think major facilities, so things that are supported out of our major research equipment and facilities construction, there's the sort of eternal debate of, well, how do we prioritize this and how do you then prioritize, say, something coming from astronomy versus coming from mm -hmm. ocean sciences or something like that. So it's, it's difficult to sort of figure out what the level would be within NSF as an agency. Um, but certainly feasible within the geosciences directorate or within the division of social sciences. 
Um, and I would I would say that we just need to be cognizant of again the level of the for the of the assets that we're considering within that portfolio. Is it a ship? Is it something like the OGC? Is it um, you know something that is more like a distribution or smaller equipment? Um, so it's again advisory in nature. Mm -hmm. Oversight would be really amazing. So, so are... Tuba, can I ask a follow up on this? Do you have time? Um, maybe not. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Because we are out of time. But yet, I feel like there's one more question that came in silo that is really important. So, Kristen, I want to give you the floor to ask your question really quick, and that'll be our last question, and we'll move on. I have two questions. Yeah, the one, the, the second one about okay. a strategy. Okay, um, yeah, Jim. So you asked us to focus on um, the what, not the how. I get that, except I, when I look at our statement of tasks, we're specifically asked to recommend strategies. And when I think strategy, I think that's a how. So can you help uh, help me understand better? Yeah, I that. I think I answered the original question at, on thinking in terms of a spectrum of of leaning. So it is okay to get strategy, no doubt, from the committee, which is the which is how um, a little bit. But what I would say is the my answer is heavily biased by my reading yesterday of the previous decayo report, which was way too heavy on the how for what we need now. So so is this is this a, an appropriate way? If we are um, recommending strategies, um, we don't want to get too prescribed Correct. into, well, you know, as you were saying, like a, where it starts to sound like a proposal, but we can give for examples or things like that that help, you know, we need a strategy to address law, here are some possible ways forward. Is that an appropriate approach? Yeah, that, that's a that's an appropriate approach. The sort of further down the road on that would be you need to talk to Noah about this specific thing. Oh, we probably you. already have. Yeah. <laughs> so so I would stay out of overly prescribing how we might execute something. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Excellent. Um, and uh, those of you who are online or in the room, if you have further questions, please do put them in Slido so we have a record of it. And I think Mark just put his um, uh, follow-up question in there too, so we're aware where he's thinking was going. And with that, I want to thank Rick and Jim for talking to us this morning. And uh, we want to transition to our next panel on the status and future of the academic research suite. And Jim is online and is on... Um, uh, I'm going to tap him for moderating this conversation. Okay, can you hear me okay? We can. Yep. Okay, fine. Um, so we're going to talk about the academic research fleet, and by that we mean uh, operationally, those are, the those are the ships that are scheduled through UNALs. They do not include the NOAA research ships or uh, the, some of the ships that are uh, operated by uh, private foundations. So we're talking about the... the uh, the UNAL scheduled ships. Um, just very briefly, that um, the way the the way these ships are managed has been a very effective partnership for many years, and that that includes um, uh, the Navy and NSF, who have built or acquired most of the ships that are in the, in the UNALs. They're scheduled by UNALs, and um, also UNALs itself, which is a community based organization that does the scheduling, and also the individual institutions that operate the ships. And also provide things like uh, docks and uh, space for the uh, ship ops groups to uh, participate in. It's been a very effective partnership that uh, soon will continue to be effective in the future. So, with that, I'd like to um, have our panelists uh, begin their presentations. I'll, I'm going to stopwatch these things so that I'll give you a warning when you've got hit nine minutes because we really want to save time for questions. But the uh, I'll go down the list unless the panelists uh, have some other suggestion but i think i'm going to set it up jim so oh, all right okay if that's okay. okay it's fine with me debbie go ahead 
Okay, Sorry. so I've got a few introductory um, remarks and then we'll go into the, the presentations and then I'll wrap things up. So I was elected chair of the United Council about three years ago. Um, even though I had spent, what, almost 30 years as a researcher going out on UNAL's ships, I uh, served at the National Science Foundation. I thought I had a pretty good idea, as I'm watching, I thought I had a pretty good idea of, of the fleet, and yet it's been a really eye-opening experience. So some things I'd like, kind of the frame of reference um, that I'd love to have you consider some of the data you're about to see in is... When I started in grad school in 1986, the United States was the unquestioned leader in ocean science. Um, and in many, many fields now, that is not the case, which I think should be alarming to everyone. One of the things you're gonna see from Doug Russell is the academic research fleet has been cut in half over the last 50 years, um, which I think is really concerning. And the fact that this decline in what is a foundational infrastructure for the kind of research that we do has continued over the last 20 years, while other countries, most importantly China, have made these massive invest in, in, investments in ocean research is, is very concerning. And when you consider the geopolitical landscape we're in right now, to allow this trajectory in, to continue, I think, um, affects our national security and it affects our economic competitiveness. It's We just have to stem what's happening right now. I also think it goes farther than just the United States. I mean, there's a lot of knowledgeable people in the room there that know that humanity is facing a, a existential crisis right now in terms of climate change. And the ocean is the largest yeah, driver give me a break. of the global carbon cycle. <laughs> so investing in infrastructure that we need to, to not only understand how the ocean works, but is of a scale that we can begin to test solution-based research is absolutely critical, not just to the US, but to the quality of life that literally billions of people will have in the future. So while we're talking about the academic research fleet today, you know this is not an ivory tower academic question. Um, this fleet is foundational to what we need to do to rise to the challenges we're facing right now as a country and literally as a species. And I think all of us need to keep that in mind in the field that we're in right now. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Russell, um, who's executive uh, secretary for UNALS. Um, he's gonna talk about the UNALS fleet, answer some of the questions that you've given him. Uh, that you've asked us to address. Then Rose DeFore is gonna give you the NSF perspective. Rob Sparrick will give you the ONR perspective. Uh, Kip Sherman, who is the chair of the Fleet Improvement Committee is gonna talk about the fleet we need in the future. And then I'll come back with a few takeaway messages. So with that, take it away, Doug. Thanks Debbie, and thanks for having us. Uh, what I'm gonna to cover today, I think a lot of you already know about much of this, but we wanna make sure you have the information to win your report. And also, uh, we know it'll be uh, it'll really be a catalyst for you asking more questions to us. So I'm glad I always provide all the data you need to help you generate your report. But I'll give you the review of what the fleet is today, what it's doing, what are the other pieces? This it's not just the ships. There's a lot more to this, as you well know, that make the ships able to go out and support science and for you to be successful out there. So we do want to review all that. So it's fresh in your minds as you're answering this tough question of. What's the science of tomorrow? What do we need to be able to do that science tomorrow and help us, you know, as we define where we're going to go in the next 10 years? So what's the fleet today? Right now it's 17 ships. We know they're global class and down to the smaller local uh, coastal ships. They're owned by and National Science Foundation, the Foundation, the owner, 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 strong partner of the Navy. In my view, I hope they're not causing problems. And uh, of course, and universities own a lot of their own vessels. Operated by 13 different institutions currently, uh, while we're waiting for the uh, first the RCRVs to come online, and we'll be back to 18, um, 14 operating institutions as we're currently set up. And we coordinate all the access to the, the vessels in an equal and equitable fashion uh, to the community. And our, we make sure the ships operate. Uh, we with our, our partners, and it's particularly the agencies, make sure the ships operate to the a higher standard, research vessel safety standards. Um, our ships are the safest ships out there on the oceans, which is really incredible, which is important. We take students out, we take scientists out, we take non-mariners out to sea to do hard work. Real quickly, the fleet, you know the fleet, the global class ships, the, the Atlantis, the Thompson, the Ravel, the Sekuliak, and the Langseth, which we, we've already talked about, focuses on seismic research primarily, but they do a lot of general oceanographical 
research these days to help us with the all the, the demand we have. And we'll talk more about that. The ocean ocean intermediate class, um, the Kill Moana, the Endeavor, which is where we're going to probably talk a little more about when is she going to be retired, given uh, what the schedule is with the RCRDs. Of course, the uh, BIOS, the Atlantic Explorer, um, and of course, the the, uh, the astronaut class, the Excelling Ride and New Armstrong are workhorses for the fleet these days. The SHARP, and then uh, the RCRVs, which we'll, we'll touch on uh, down the road here. Of course, we're here, the, the future home of the, uh, the Gilbert and Mason, which is really incredible, we're able to do this. And then our small vessels, which are so important to getting future oceanographers out to sea, the, the future scientists, this is where they get their fundamental training, as well as doing important local and coastal research. So these are critical to our fleet as well. The, the Pelican, you know, just down the road a little bit, Sproul, the Savannah, the Walton Smith, the Blue Heron, and the Rachel Carson. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. So Debbie touched on it briefly. Where has the fleet gone since you know, you know started in 1972? We've, we've cut in half. We're down to 17 vessels right now. Um, and with that, we've seen a decrease in births at sea for scientists. We're down 4% in births right now uh, from where we were not even long ago. Um, but this will just give you the history when you're as you're doing your deliberations. Where where is the fleet been? Where are we looking now in the next few years in 2025? Based on what we you know the current uh, the current plans as we know them. And this gives you this shows you the trend. But it's interesting you see a couple plateaus when you look at this along the way over the years of uh, what the fleet has done. There have been transitions. There's been plateaus, and there's been transitions. And right now we're kind of in a plateau uh, at 18 you know 17 18 ships. There's more, and I mentioned earlier, there's more than just the ships that make all this happen, seagoing research happen. Of course, you know, there's NDSF with Alvin, Century, and Jason, which is just critical to the research. And they keep invest, investments in these, keep these relevant. Uh, you know, Alvin's 50 plus years old and it's still, you know, it's still the, you know, sets the standard for the, the whole worldwide community in deep sea research. Uh, Jason and Century, similarly. Um, all these other pieces that get forgotten about, but they actually are critical for getting successful <laughs> science done. All these pools, the technician, the, the technician pool, which allows us to keep, you know, with the best technicians at sea with our scientists. Obsec, you know, Marsan, which we, we, now we're, this is a kind of a learning lesson for us. We need expertise in dredging, pouring, because that's something we don't do every day, but it's critical to the scientists that we're successful at. We do go to sea, so that's been an investment in us in the last few years. Let's develop centers of expertise. And we've got to continue to do things like that. When we see there's a problem, we've got it, we know we need to have that capability down the road. Let's not forget that is part of this investment in infrastructure. Um, MISO and PFP, PFP, those are all important. Who we enter more into expertise. And there's also all the other pieces, the softer piece side of it, but it's really critical, like the multi beam advisory committee. We, have, we keep investing in you know, NSF and ONR, keep putting better and better multi beam systems. That meet the you know the needs for better mapping of the ocean bottom so we do better science. Um, ODF, you know, is doing we're collecting water all over the oceans, continuing to monitor the trends and the changes. That is critical. So these investments are still continue to be important and will we'll in the future as well to do the science of tomorrow. R2R, which you, you all know well, and all these other pieces of it. and you know the satellite network advisory, we've NSF and ORM invested so much in. In the uh, the communications infrastructure last few years, which allowed more scientists to access in real time the ships that are out doing science at sea. So we may have lost some bunks at sea, but a lot of more people actually have direct access, you know, to be able to you know engage with the people on the ship at a time uh, to, to see what's happening and to help modify and change plans and all that on 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 a moment's notice is is really critical. You know, as community, it starts at the federal agencies. You know these things, but it's just always good to have this in your record. Without the agencies, we wouldn't be able to support the science community. That's what we're all focused on, we're all here for. We have, we've got 58 member institutions, all very, and most of them are very active in our community. They help us uh, you know, define where we, where we are, where we want to go, how we do it. These, this is all it gets down to these, the fleet we're talking about, and all the ship and facility operators and technical staff. It's all, these are such an important part of our community. There's a UNALS council that helps lead the UNALS as the facilitator, the coordinator, the center of gravity for all this. 
Um, and then that leads down to the office and we're kind of, we handle the behind the scenes work to make all this happen, to make, make, uh, allow the, enable the community to move forward, to, be, to engage in these important issues and to help us move forward so that we can provide advice to the agencies. Um, and we could also deal with a lot of the communications outside, like the regulatory agencies on behalf of our community, which is a big piece of what we do as well. Um, we're still, you know, we're in nine community, uh, committees now in, uh, you know, is in the community. We've also expanded, you know, the last few years, you know, in recognition of where our, our, you know, our, you know, our society is now. Maris is now a standing committee, which was initiated previously. Um, uh, and it's just like a subcommittee, it's, it's just too important to elevate it to a higher level now. Um, and they impact a lot of what we do and shape how we do business. The safety committee, we've added, you know, the recognize we need more expertise in coordinating OBSs and more and more critical to the geophysical community. So we've elevated, elevated that, created another committee for them as well. You know, and then, you know, so this is, this, this is no surprise here, but it's just, it is active, it's busy, it's engaging. Um, We've got, and we've also want to add, we've got some great mid career scientists leading a lot of these communities, these committees now, which are really taking these on and really focusing on early career scientists. So, not only thinking about where do we go with facilities and the, 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 the fleet and all the supporting facilities, also let's make sure we're taking care of the young scientists come along. We need them for the future for what you're looking at the next 10 years and beyond. The UNO's office, I won't give you all the details, but I will tell you. Our tasks and responsibilities and staffing continue to grow because the complexities are getting bigger and bigger. And we are we have to support really the agencies, you know, NSF, ONR, to be able to, to respond to a lot of these other things that help enable the fleet to run, dealing with like the Coast Guard requirements, for example, dealing with Buy, Buy America, Build America, Buy America Act. There is so much stuff that has to happen behind the scenes so your ship operators can operate these ships and support your science without it being interrupted. So we, you know, we've uh, NSF has tasked us to hire a contract to support dealing with all the bureaucracy that comes with a new, you know, good, you know, well-intended change, but the bureaucracy behind that is amazing. And our ship operators don't have extra people on top of that to answer all the questions and do all the inventories of their ships and then go fight the battles for waivers because we have every ship in the world these days has foreign components in them, and a lot of these systems on these ships you cannot break apart. And say this is by the American equivalent and insert it in there. That's just impossible to do right now. And so we we have to answer a lot of questions so that they can keep operating and NSF can keep ensuring the ships get maintained, you know, and on our, you know, it's just it's a, an amazing continuum. COVID-19, we all suddenly became experts in writing guidance to the fleet about how we can do this safely. These are just examples of why it's a complex world, it's getting more complex. The UNO's office continues to grow, NSF and ONR have been amazingly supportive of us but we we our little office keeps growing and you know it's part of the cost of running the fleet you know, quite frankly um so how's the fleet being used i just show this real slide this is what the scheduling of the community looks like and this is not even all the ships it is way complex we look at a one-year schedule of ships and most of the blue is underweight doing science projects and purple and orange are combinations or you know transits and maintenance period's not, so I, I don't expect you to look at this, but I just want to give you, it is, there's a lot of pieces of this that's, uh, you can understand why it's difficult to come up with schedules every year for the community. Where are the fleet, where's the fleet been? It's been everywhere, and you know this. You're taking the ships to sea. Our globals are everywhere in the world, which is, and they're highly recognized and welcome around the world, so it's incredible the amount of science that still gets done. We will provide, these tables will be in there. I'm not going to dwell on it. We, I can tell you is we are back up and above where we were pre-pandemic levels for the, the you know, the, how, much, how many days are fun, uh, funded at sea by the agencies. It's incredible amount of work we do. And we're doing it with less ships, but the ships are underway. And we'll show you in a minute that they are well accounted for for every day of the year dedicated to being doing science. You know, and that's, that's the important message. Our ships are fully utilized. But you have, there's a lot of other things that come with that, and I'll show you in a minute, I'll explain it more. But I just wanted, these tables are in there to show you that your fleet is well used, it's well supported by the agencies, and NSF is the primary funder of this, pours a lot of money into this. Doug, sure. Doug I want to interrupt, uh, interrupt you for a second. You've been going, you and Debbie have been going for about 13, 14 minutes, and if you want to save time for her at the end, we need to move on. So you should try to wrap up in the next minute or two. Okay, we will do. I, I can be done in a minute. And so... 
Uh, this is the other one. This right here shows you how but the ships are tied up where they're underway doing science, they're getting ready to do science, they're un being un undergoing inspections, they're doing major maintenance, which is a lot of it's required by the federal regulatory agencies. And uh, and then there, sometimes there's a deal with crewing issues and stuff like that. So I'll leave it in that. And this is more tables in here. We've taken a lot of people to see. These are the numbers for that. So I won't dwell into that. And I'm going to turn it over to Rose for her perspective from that. Hi, thank you very much, Doug. Um, so I think as a group, we decided that we were going to just do it all, do our presentations together and yield our time. So I'm definitely not going to be taking the nine minutes. Um, so there was the question is, um, how might this look in the coming decade? So when we're looking at the science that we feel we're going to be doing in the coming decade, I feel like that's what we're asking the report to, to give us. But, you know, we have sustained observations that we foresee that we're going to continue to do. We uh, recognize the change in biology, the paleoclimate research that needs to be done, the geohazard. We're highly invested in STEM and outreach programs. So um, we can make a very long list, but these are just a few items that are a few topics that we think we're going to continue doing in the next decade. And we hope that this report will inform um, that creativity that we're talking about. So next slide. Okay, you asked for an update on the RCRVs and we there was a meeting last week with the, the shipyard. And so we have some new updated dates. Uh, delivery of the first vessel, the Tawny will be um, one July, 2025. Vessel two, one January, 2026. And vessel three, one June, 2026. So um, they, the, um, after delivery, there's about 262 days to outfit the ship, to do sea trials, to do a uh, familiarization of, uh, you know, for the crew on how to, to run the ships. Uh, there's going to be warranty and fallout time. There's the NSF inspection that satisfies that for acceptance into the UNILs. Um, as a UNILS operator. So there's a lot that's going to be packed into that 262 days. And um, by the time we're all done in 2027, we'll have all three doing science. So some NSF successes. I, I wanted to focus on some of the things that I think have been successful in the last decade and um, you know whether we can improve on them in the next decade and if they need to uh, talked about in the report, it's up to you, but um, it's this idea of having barter so that we can access foreign and other federal fleets. We already have a barter with NERC, and that gives us access to some of the European ships. And we think that that's important because reducing transits is helpful in getting more science done. So if they already have work in a certain region and we can you know, add a cruise to where they're at and vice versa. I think it's helpful for both of us. Um, so we want to also increase, we want to continue that and, and also add, for instance, NOAA. We'd like to see if we can do barter with NOAA. And a barter is something where you don't exchange money, you just exchange ship time. You kind of have a running tally of how much you owe each other and, and then you try to get onto their schedules. Um, I think it's already been touched on by Jim, but there's definitely been increases in NSF infrastructure funding. So it's a different environment than we were when we did the last decale survey. Um, I think that the foundation to their to our credit has realized that, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where the tail is wagging the dog, so to speak, but in order to have a very functional fleet, we need to do the investments necessary to keep the, the ships maintained. And um, there's a long list of, of items that, were potentially deferred and, and now we're catching up with that. Um, one of the things that Doug mentioned in the increase in their staffing is a uh, crewing coordinator. Uh, about two years ago, we recognized that we were actually leaving cruises at the pier because we didn't have enough crew, um, licensed crew to get underway. So, this became a critical issue. We, uh, I think it was Scripps that had a three month uh, downtime because of lack of crew. So anyway, we ended up with a crewing coordinator 
And I feel like it's been a big success. Uh, we have very few vacant positions now. And um, part of that was also recognizing some of the recommendations that came from a, a crewing uh, tiger crew um, committee. And they provided a list of recommendations to the agencies that included increases in salary for crew members, uh, retention bonuses, habitability, so we've been addressing all those things, and luckily there's been money from NSF to be able to um, realize those goals. Um, the deferred maintenance, as I said, had always been an issue. In the past, when we had flat budgets, which is actually a decline, we had to make hard choices. And so we would always do the safety items first, but there are other items that ended up being deferred. And so those things we've been dealing with in the last year or two. Habitability upgrades, you know, you just need to go on foreign ships um, and some of our our partner um, agencies to, to see that we were kind of behind the times as far as habitability. So we're trying to make our ships a little nicer to be on. Um, and then scientific inst instrumentation has also seen an increase in funding. We've mentioned the pools, uh, the wire pool, the winch pool, the van pools, the tech pools. Those are all, I think, success stories and whether we can use that blueprint for other types of pools, I think will be important. And I can show you that on the next slide. And then the other success I think we've had is the early career science training opportunities that's been going on for at least 12 years, maybe longer, 14 years, 15 years. And we recognize that we need to make this uh, uh, a codified way of handling early career training opportunities, but right now we're still doing it kind of ad hoc as opportunities present themselves. Okay, next slide. So challenges. Um, and I think we'll get into this discussion later because I think it's important. You know, we have the current mix of global and ocean class ships. And is it the right mix for the kind of science that we think we need to do in the next decade? Um, we touched on cybersecurity. That's definitely something that we see um, now, not on the horizon, but now as, as an issue. And so, as Jim mentioned, we have a new program uh, director coming into OCE that will be all things cyber. Um, the um, next thing I think I want to mention is the NDSF assets. So everyone loves to use Century and Jason and um, Alvin and this can be difficult for challenge, for scheduling. So sometimes cruises have waited three or four years to get to sea in order to get the ancillary assets that they need and the timing on the ship schedule. So if there is a way to have duplications in some of those areas, that would be that would help the that pressure we have with scheduling. Um, so this was a number that I got from Doug but they did a little um, you know, review on the bunks for science community and there's been a 4% a decline. And I think that's attributed to the fact that these ships are much more complex. I mean, you go into the bridge of these, these new ships and it's uh, computer driven. So with that, we need to bring the people along that can support um, the, the bridge and the, and, and the engine room. So that takes away from bunk space. So how do we deal with that? To, you know, and that's something like bringing in telepresence, having more, more satellite connectivity and, and, and just figuring out ways to get the community on the ship remotely. Um, you know, I hate to pick on Kiel and Wana, but I'm just gonna say that the ship when it was designed was designed for the type of science that we no longer hold as a priority. And so the things that we think are priority science for us and in the Pacific, the Kilimanjana isn't the best ship for, for doing that kind of science. So I think uh, ONR will touch on that, but they have a decision and kind of a an off-ramp, so to speak, on whether to invest in a future midlife or do we cut our losses and say the ship, even after midlife, isn't going to support our priorities. <clears throat> okay, we've touched on the pools. And you know, if we were to look at something like glider pools, this would be a, a, a you know force multipliers for bringing in PIs that may not have access to gliders, but this makes it easier by having it taken care of through a pool. 
Um, greening the fleet, we have a, a requirement from the, the White House to get to net zero by 2050, which, you know, on one hand, we're bringing in, we want more globals um, and we don't have the technology to get to that net zero. So that, that's a big challenge for the fleet. And how do can we do offsets to, to get to that, the, those numbers that they're looking at? And then the, the, the harder question is the underutilization of the local and regional class vessels. So we've seen this big pressure on the global and ocean class ships, but not so much pressure on the local and regional class ships. And you know why is that? Is why is the science turned to these big uh, science expeditions instead of looking coastally, locally to uh, do their science? So do we need to reevaluate how many local regional class ships we have in the ARF? So those are definitely hard questions and big challenges. I think that. Oh, yeah, I, I I threw up, you want to go back, just so you have some perspective on how the day rate is divided. So, you know, the it's been, way- uh, wrote, It's been 10 minutes, so okay. I should wrap up. Okay, so if you don't want to, we can talk about that one later. Okay, thanks. Thanks, next slide, please. Hi, I'm Rob Sparrick. I'm the program officer at the Office of Naval Research, uh, responsible for a significant portion of the hardware related to the academic research fleet. Uh, ONR as an entity spends about 15% of the current operating budget. Uh, I try, we'll try not to read these slides to you, but the takeaway for the first bullet, somebody used the term ground truth. G ground truth is gonna be what Congress authorizes. So the Navy can make a plan and we do that with shipbuilding. The Congressional Budget Office reviews it and analyzes it. And in the end, we get the fleet that Congress authorizes, but you can't buy a ship without congressional authorization. Um, we are about, one of the questions you ask is, what is the Navy plan for replacing the globals? Since that plan is still 12 years away, uh, there is no formal plan. But even in the formal planning that the Navy does for shipbuilding, we do not include vessels like oceanographic research vessels. So all of our ship planning is based on what we call battle force ships. Uh, I will highlight though, in the timeframe between 2036 and 2042, the Navy expects three of the globals plus uh, Kilimuana, and incidentally, uh, the NOAA ship Ron Brown will reach their end of service life. So that's four ships, which is a huge portion of the academic fleet going away, vessels that will have been around for four and a half decades. Um, also in that same period of time competing for money will be midlife refits for the other two Navy owned uh, ocean, uh, ocean class research vessels, uh, plus uh, the Sekuliak owned by the uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, if you were to do some quick back of the envelope math, you're talking about a billion dollars in a very short period of time, something that historically does not happen very often. Uh, so this creates great opportunity because what you'll get is a new fleet, hypothetically, that will last another four or five decades. Um, the risk, on the other hand, is with shipbuilding. Uh, you've probably seen it in your questions related to RCRV, but any delay in a construction or midlife project means making hard choices such as investing money and in keeping ships that have reached their end of service life and you're just trying to get them to get by or alternatively let gaps happen in the fleet capacity and that impacts science. So my three kind of bullet takes away, the Navy's plan is gonna be the one that Congress approves with lots of churn and things in between. There's a period of time coming here in the time that you care about in the next decade when there's a huge shift in the academic fleet. Uh, I can't overemphasize how big getting rid of four ships and replacing them with whatever the next thing is, because that's going to last four or five decades. Uh, and on the other hand, because it's so many ships and a lot of stuff going on, there's a lot of risk. So hopefully we'll get it right. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rob. Now is um, okay. Sherman's going on. Go ahead, yeah. Kate. 
Thanks, Jim. I'm Kip Sherman. I'm a physical oceanographer from Oregon State University, and I'm the chair of the Fleet Improvement Committee. Uh, it's our job to sort of look at the near-term and long-term uh, future of the academic research fleet. So we've touched on all these things, but uh, first, uh, I'm going to present two slides. One presents a somewhat shiny view of the future, and the second one per, uh, shows some fairly stark facts. Uh, first off is autonomy. Uh, in the future, autonomy will be commonplace uh, as the technology becomes more robust. First and foremost, though, uh, autonomous platforms will never be a replacement for people going out on ships. Uh, autonomous platforms, uh, are they, they add value to the research. And so a nice example is exports uh, from 2018 and 2019. That's what the schematic shows. The field work for export used a combination of ships and autonomous platforms operating uh, together. Um, right now, though, those operations primarily come from boutique operations uh, at academic institutions. Um, as the demand and scope of autonomous work grows, um, we may need to consider other modes of working uh, for the autonomous fleet, uh, maybe things like a national facility. So, um, for example, the National, Oceanogra national Oceanographic Center uh, in the United Kingdom, they have the marine equipment pool, uh, which has a lot of um, autonomous platforms. The an, that's one thing we could consider. Uh, a NERC report, uh, recent NERC report, recommended doubling the support for autonomous platforms every five years. Uh, and so that's an interesting feature to consider if we're considering investing in that. Uh, the next job for the Fleet Improvement Committee is uh, finding the right, or the main job of the Fleet Improvement Committee is finding the right composition of research vessels. And as Rose mentioned, uh, the global class research vessels are currently oversubscribed. We have a backlog of cruises, uh, and it's not shrinking. Um, and, and our, un, our coastal and local class vessels are undersubscribed. Uh, and so the questions are right now are, you know, what's the right makeup for the, the future? Do we need more global class research vessels? Do we need uh, different sized vessels? Do the global class research vessels need to be potentially bigger? Um, some of this is due, our, our current condition right now is somewhat due to the fact that we replaced two global class research vessels, the NOR and the Melville, with ocean class research vessels, all right? Uh, which were um, a reduction in berths um, and capability. Uh, the next thing is polar research. Um, polar research is becoming more and more important as uh, you know the focus on climate change. Um, there are plans for an Antarctic research vessel, um, which are currently unfunded. Uh, this Antarctic research vessel would be a replacement for the Nathaniel B. Palmer. Um, and uh, the U.S. Coast Guard um, is currently taking input from UNOLs on an Arctic surface capability, um, and they're specifically asking for science mission requirements from us, which is the sort of the first step in planning um, uh, research vessels. And these would be, um, you know, polar um, capable ice breaking cutters. Um, None of this will happen without the input of the community. Uh, and the last thing is the greening of the fleet. Uh, there's an executive order that requires net zero emissions from the overall federal operations by 2050, including a 65% reduction in emissions by 2030. So this is a pretty uh, big ask for the academic research fleet currently. Uh, next slide, please. All right, here are the stark facts. This is a table that takes us out into the future to 2035, uh, and this is what the fleet will look like. The summary of this is in from 20 to 25 to 2035, uh, we'll see the academic research fleet shrink from 18 to 10 vessels uh, and 13 to eight operating institutions. Uh, the three globals, um, the, the Atlantis, the Ravel and the Tommy Thompson will end their design life uh, and enter their extended life. 
uh, which as Rob mentioned, will require investments. Uh, and uh, the academic research fleet will see the retirement of all the intermediate, coastal, and local vessels. All right, that's um, the summary from the FIC. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to go over these really quick, and some of them I won't mention at all. So next slide, because they're they're just building off, you know. So some some suggestions we'd love to be included in the plan, and yeah, Doug, you can go, you can put them all out. Oh, back. Okay, you know, we mentioned Kilimoana. Should it be replaced? If so, with what? We just heard about the the ocean and global class capacity again and again. Like, what's going to fill the vacuum with that? One point I want to make about the coastal and local class, as a researcher that has worked in both blue water and the coastal zone, there's a bit of a scarcity mentality with a number of coastal researchers. They don't ask for you know, ships. They worry that it's going to make their um, proposals too expensive. So is this a problem in that there's, they're getting all the work that they need to get done um, with the ships that their institute or the, the, the boats that their local institution is running? Or are we, do we have blinders on some of these scientists and they're not asking for what they really need because they don't think they're gonna get it. And I'm not convinced about that. I also wanted to point out that these vessels are very valuable for training. Is that worth the cost? But something to throw in. Next, you can put up the next budgets. Um, <laughs> One question about the autonomous tools that we've talked about at UNALS. Um, do we need a national strategy around this? Uh, you know, they are becoming as valuable as ships in many cases. And so, um, but right now they're more discrete groups that are using them. Do we need to, how do we make them more accessible to researchers across? Um, national Deep Submergence Facility. I'm gonna toss out a phrase that came to my mind when I uh, got involved in UNALS. We've got great things out there in the fleet, right? We've got Alvin, we've got Sentry, we've got, um, oh shoot, Jason. But I, I will say that I was like, is that still all we've got? They're great vessels, but are there things coming down the pike at NSF being developed that I don't know about? Because otherwise, why not? And I don't know if I just pissed off Peter Gerges or if he's like, go girl. I don't know. I should have probably asked Peter about this. <laughs> um, the, the carbon net zero, you've heard, you know, we are, it's 2024 and we were supposed to do this by 2025. And I'm going to push back on Mark Abbott. 10 years isn't long enough for a plan when you're talking about ships. We are way behind the eight ball. Um, and you've heard about cybersecurity. So go to the next. So I would... I want to make the case we you know uh, Rob mentioned that the Navy has a plan I want to make a, a case that we need really a bold new vision for the academic research fleet and the funds to implement it right and this is beyond the scope of a decadal survey but the decadal survey could recommend that this be done because what we need is the science of the future intimately linked to the the fleet and the infrastructure that we need in the future and right now we don't we don't have that um, and I think we need to desperately engage the next generation in developing this. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. I think the greatest threat to oceanography right now in terms of infrastructure is not the fact that we might be down to eight ships. It's that next slide, please. It's that I feel like we've become a community that is starting to dream small, right? We're starting to, to again, these blinders that we seem to have accumulated in the community. I'm gonna give you a brief, um, vignette from my first meeting with the Fleet Improvement Committee. I was just sitting in trying to get up to speed on what they're talking about, and they're talking about the next global. And it was one of the most depressing conversations I've sat through because everything that seemed to be brought up about, a, uh, about some capability or some capacity that needed to be on the ship, and then there was instantly a response of, we can't afford that. We'll never get that approved. That'll never get through. So my question is, when did we start thinking this way on such a massive level. At the end of that meeting, I asked if some people could stick around and talk to me and just help, again, help me get up to speed. And then the quote that is burned into my brainstem from one person is, Debbie, if you want a state-of-the-art research vessel, go to China. Again, when did, when did we become that country? So I think engaging the younger generations, thinking really boldly about the fleet that we need um, is important, not just for the fleet itself. It's how we, again, start thinking as a community that we're a country that can do anything. And the facts, the last slide, 
and I'll just leave it up there. You know, the fact we just launched Pace, nine hundred sixty-four million dollars. NASA launched Pace. Billion. We are a country that can do anything, and we need to start being really bold in the requests that we need for ocean science because it is important, critically important to this country and to humanity. And we're not bold enough. We talk too much about what we can't do, and I think we need to knock that off. So with that. We will turn okay, it well, to questions. Yeah, thank you. That's a very challenging statement, and, and I appreciate that, Debbie. I, I had uh, two, two quick questions before we go on to the other list. One, I'm not sure who will answer this. I guess maybe Rose with the first one, and maybe, uh, uh, well, anyway, I'm not sure. But uh, what's up with seismic? My, one rumor is, is that uh, Langseth will go out of service around 2026. And is there, is there thoughts about a replacement for seismic ship? And second of all, I also heard a rumor, that, rumor from somewhere, and I don't remember where, that there is a, a some sort of a plan to uh, build a uh, a new Jason. It would be somewhat uh, less capable, but still very capable for the deep submergence facility. And, and anybody have thoughts on those two seismic and new Jason? I can I can talk about seismic. Uh, uh, Columbia has been working on a plan and doing a lot of background work for. Uh, obtaining a new another vessel and converting it to be a seismic vessel, you know, to do a lot of the seismic capabilities of the land, except maybe not the full suite of them, and also to do a better job of general oceanographic uh, support as well. So that way, it's better utilized. But they are they've been actively working on it, and we don't know all we don't have all the insights in behind the doors what's happening. But that's their plan is to actually obtain a vessel, convert it. And put it into service as the Langsup is retired in 2026 time frame, maybe if they can. As, this is not a quick, easy process, but that's what they've been actively working on. That's what they've briefed a number of times to the uh, Marine Seismic Research Oversight Committee, Operations Committee, excuse me. Rose, I don't know if you can talk about uh, another Jason, Jason Light or something. Well, I was going to ask Jim, since he's in the room, to talk about that. But um, there, there has been talk about having some kind of second Jason, um, and I don't know where it's at in the planning or funding stage. Rose, do you want me to say anything about that? Sure. Brian's on there. Perfect. That's Morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, regarding a, a, a mid-scale, a mid medium class ROV. There's been a lot of interest in um, the community about re relieving the bottleneck of Jason and also uh, standing up a capability that could work from ships other than uh, global or ocean class. One thought is to design and construct an ROV or more that would be compatible with the RCRVs, frankly, and, and other ships of that class. So while there is no you know funding available to do that, the Deep Submergent Science Committee did produce a, a position about the, that need, and it's been, you know, broadly acknowledged and accepted. And I've, you know, I've even discussed it a bit with NOAA about their interests. I'd like to add a comment to that. So, when uh, Doug showed the complex slide on scheduling, one of the things that's not hidden that's hidden in that slide is the vehicles. So, there's only one Alvin and many of the vehicles being sole sourced and uh, drive the schedule. So right now our schedule limitations are often more impacted by the availability of the vehicles than the ships themselves. Okay, I, I think we'll move to the uh, questions that are on um, on the list here. The first one I see is from Layla, that has a lot of support. Do you, do you wanna ask your question, Layla? Yeah, um, so thanks first to the panelists for all of your perspectives. This has been really informative. Um, Debbie actually asked part of my question in her comments in the context of the, the local and the coastal vessels. And the committee is interested in connecting the appetite for ship support with the menu um, of offerings and, and understanding if that current menu or the future projected menu um, is not meeting the need. We're, we'd like to know what's also on the, the hidden chef's menu. I think I'm hungry. Um, and so, um, and that might also show us some, some hidden trends in regional science drivers. And we wonder if NSF or UNOLS has some data they could share on investments in ship time on non-academic research fleet vessels. 
maybe through rapid funding, maybe through other mechanisms where a non-ARF vessel has to be used to support an NSF science initiative. This is Kip. Um, I, you know, UNOLs, uh, I don't think we have that type of information. Um, you know, it's possible NSF might just from the expenditures and where they go, but that's a pretty deep dive in terms of finding that out. You know, the uh, a way of trying to approach that might be reaching out to the oceanographic community via a survey or something like that. May I make a quick comment? Sure. So not specific to the vessels, but to the vehicles. I can't recall a year in the recent past where I didn't rent a third-party ROV at least once or more times per year that is non-JSON, whether it's Ropos, the UH ROV, um, commercially provided Odysseus. Um, that's where I was going with the JSON bottleneck. Any other comments on that one? Those. So I was just going to um, make two observations on that. I mean, obviously, um, the FALCOR 2 does carry out a lot of NSF-supported science. So that's going to uh, a, a ship outside the ARF. As far as the smaller ships, that's something that could potentially be collected through um, the NSF uh, award systems, but it would take some time. But they, but we do ask that they meet the UNIL safety standards, and so there's a whole process for using non-ARF ships. So hopefully through that engagement, there would be some kind of idea of how often this happens. Okay, well, let's uh, see, move on. The other one I see next on the list is uh, from Dipanjana. Dipanjana? Yes. But you could go yeah. ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is really great to know about the air fleets, the services provided by the air fleets, and also the challenges. I was just wondering that as the price of the uh, vessels and the fuel to run a vessel is always a constraint, what are the options to use hydrogen or any other clean air alternatives to run these ships? in an energy efficient manner, but of course, without compromising the research objectives or the safety. Thank you. Vic, or does Vic want to answer that? Or Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, alternative fuels um, and the like. Uh, that is definitely under consideration. Right now, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography is uh, spearheading an effort to design a um, coastal research vessel that is partially run on hydrogen. So um, that is, um, there is an attention being given to that. It's a challenging, um, uh, it's, a ch it's a challenge uh, to, to have a platform that's propelled by hydrogen, and can still complete the research missions. If I can add to that as well, the uh, part of the problem is this being able to source that kind of in the quantities we need, especially for like our global ships that, that travel the world. A lot of places that you go, you can't get the alternative fuels. And the infrastructure is not caught up to where the world has gone yet. So that's, it is a challenge uh, to deal with. And also you cannot convert these ships quickly to move into alternative fuels, you have to basically design from the ground up because the time gauge is way differently and all the other infrastructure for controls and all that, it's not easily retrofitable with the ships we have. Yeah, I think um, just, just a quick comment that um, there is a lot of research on, on, on acquiring large amounts of hydrogen. It's something for the future, but it's, it's, I think it's something to think about. And, and I'm, I'm really happy that Scripps is at least gonna try something on today's scale, but in the future, maybe it's it'll be more uh, it'll be more possible. Brad asked about nuclear um, in the chat. <laughs> the U.S. is really good at nuclear ships. I was true. married to a Navy nuke. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I 
I can tackle that question. Uh, I'm a nuclear trained uh, naval officer. The crew size that uh, comes with adding nuclear power is a, an additional expense. It's probably, if it would be considered, it would be considered in the Arctic, where um, the advantage of having nuclear propulsion is reasonable. There are other nuclear powered oceanographic research ships in other countries. Uh, the U.S. just has not gone down that particular path. Okay. Uh, Ajit, I think I see you next on the uh, question list. Oh, I just, and I'll go back to Peter after Ajit. Thanks, uh, Jen. Uh, for me, I was just curious in terms of what, how we are writing this report, if um, any uh, examples can be provided of how the new RCRVs are supporting the science of the next decade. I mean, it, just examples of things like, it, for my own personal uh, thing, it's like, are they capable of launching um, AUVs? Um, how, just examples of things like that. I think Brian... Oh, oh. All the ships in the fleet are capable of launching AUVs, uh, and the RCRVs will be supporting the sub science in the next decade because those are the ships we'll have. They'll be starting their their service life right at the beginning of the decade you're considering, 2025. I was talking with UAVs just in case of the type of uh, drones. Uh, many of the ships right now can support uh, aerial operations. That's a, you know, we didn't touch on that, but um, autonomous aerial operations are a part of the academic research fleet. Uh, there's a committee at UNOLS called SCORE, uh, which is solely, well, which is focused on that in addition to uh, human-occupied aerial measurements. But indeed, at some point, we should, we can talk about what the RCRVs bring in terms of their seakeeping efficiency and yeah. dynamic positioning, data presence. I mean, those are all the things that the RCRVs bring, I think, that are going to be quite enabling for the research community. I'm and, happy to provide a briefing on that. And we're specifically designed for from day one. Those capabilities. They're very science-forward design. Yeah. Which actually and, and, and they're regional class vessels, um, which put them in a particular size class, which, you know, that establishes sort of their capabilities, what sort of seas they can operate in, how many um, scientists they can carry, which is not the same as, for example, the global class research vessels, which have the broadest range of sea Cap keeping capabilities and the largest science births. I don't mean to put in, but you, you, you guys are you know, ticking on the thing I think about every day. So um, Ajit, to, to your question, um, nice to see you, by the way. Um, the RCRVs are, will be certainly capable of, of launching autonomous and other systems, aerial, surface, submarine, but they, as Tuba pointed out, are specifically designed to well support that activity. We're going to add, you know, advanced USBL capability to, to every vessel, as well as station keeping that's that's far improved over, over the ships they're replacing. Um, they'll have very similar capabilities to the global and ocean class systems with the limitations that, that Kip mentioned that, I mean, I think regional class is a misnomer at this point. They've been expanded to larger than our intermediate class, but, you know, uh, that's semantics. We'll still be somewhat berthing limited, a little bit duration and uh, range limited it, compared to an ocean class ship. Okay, let's, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Gervis, you had a question. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, first off, a major thanks to uh, folks on UNOLS having been in that, in those shoes. I know how much work you all do to, to support uh, science. So thank you. And uh, and thanks to the MSF program officers too. I mean, you do, this is a heavy lift. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge Rose's comment about um, just needing vessels to comply with NSF's you know, sort of safety policies and all the other practices. I mean, that is that is really important. I, I also, I just, uh, having worked with Schmidt Ocean Institute and, and other entities and, and trying to bring together NSF dollars and, and Schmidt resources, uh, it works, but it's all very ad hoc. And, and, and you know, when we look at where the, the U.S. academic research fleet goes, it is pretty biased towards the North Atlantic and some work in the Pacific. And if we want to do global research, either we need a, a bunch more ships or we need to be really smart about partnerships. And I would I would love to hear more about examples 
uh, partnerships that maybe I'm unaware of that exist between NSF and other agencies in the, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere or around the world that might allow us to have a, uh, our U.S. scientists to have access uh, to the global ocean. Thank you. So let me um, start off with just saying that, um, you know, Schmidt is always invited and comes to our UNOLS meetings and we kind of feel like they're a, a kind of an ancillary part of the fleet, so to speak. So um, we have, as I mentioned, the barters that we have with NERC, and that's kind of the idea that we're looking at is how can we more efficiently use ships that are in different regions because we have these requirements for OOI. So we have, you know, the OOI, the BATS, the hot cruises, we have all these um, requirements that keep ships in certain basins. So it, I think it is important to think more strategically about other opportunities. We're trying to do this barter right now with NOAA so that we can exchange ship time with them without having exchange dollars. Um, so yes, I think that, that there is an opportunity to look up beyond the ARF for partnerships. Thank you. Okay, Allison, you had a question? A couple of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, I do have a couple of questions, but I guess I'll start with the one that's highest ranked. You showed some data of where uh, all the vessels have been, and this ties into Pete's question a little bit, but do you have data not just on where the ship has been and operated, but where the scientists on board are coming from? And I guess what I'm getting at is, for example, the regional class vessel operated by URI mostly utilized by scientists that might live in New England? And what's the institutional diversity look like also? We can, um, not all our data is good because it depends on what you know, the operators have put into their, when they collected the data for their participants during the cruises. So that we can gather it cell by camp promise to be really accurate. Unfortunately, because we've had we're working on making more standardized, and so that and through the marine facilities planning application we use now for scheduling, we've incorporated the cruise planning process through that, and that is now becoming more standardized in how people collect all that information. But I can't really give you probably without doing some little digging about where did all this and correlate to each ship. That's a that's a big lift of data work, but if that's what they need, we could work and figure out how to do that. It's best we can, it's the data we have. Do you have any like just anecdotal evidence or like loose idea if that is the case where the regional vessels tend to be more utilized by regional scientists or is it? Um, I would say, well, actually I would say there's pretty good diversity. I mean, I, I've given an example is this like, there's been scientists that have used the Link Explorer oh. that come from all over the place. You know, and, and they've taken advantage of transits to do stuff, you know, from the mainland back to Bermuda, Bermuda to their work. When I managed the, uh, the, the Barnes and then the Carson in, in Seattle, we had scientists from all over the place coming to use the, the ship. Because um, there's just a, a lot of people have scientific questions sitting somewhere else in the country. And we've had people come across the country to use this little, this little ship to actually answer their questions. So I think there's actually quite very good diversity. It's not just biased towards that local institution. Okay, um, uh, Mark, Mark Abbott, do you have a, do you have a question? Sure, just trying to hit all the unmute buttons. <laughs> yeah, it's actually comes out of a report from years ago, back in when the Consortium for Ocean Leadership actually existed, which is we, we need to really think about a portfolio approach of acquisition, you know, leasing to govern own, to contract or operate it, to build own, et cetera. We need to think about mechanisms to manage the funding so it's a bit more predictable than it is right now. And more importantly, a governance strategy for the agencies that really formulates, formalizes their roles and responsibilities. Because right now it's very ad hoc. I mean, I, I agree with Debbie on the blue sky approach, but we've got to come up with 
approaches that manage what are looking like very plausible scenarios. I mean, all the scenarios we proposed over the last or saw over the last 10 to 20 years, a compression of the fleet, et cetera, are really coming to pass. I mean, it, I, I'll put words in, in uh, Rob Sparrick's mouth, but I don't see the Navy being able to play a very big role anymore in, in the next 10 years. They, they've got the gray ship problem. We can't count on NSF to come up with the one to two billion dollars worth of ship costs. So we've got to come up with some strategies that really enable the science we need to do. I don't think that means a, a necessary retreat, but it means a lot more creative and out of the box thinking of NSF go out and come up with the requirements, Navy, you go build a big ship. That's been our model. And I think we've got to think really differently. So I'm curious what the community, what the group is thinking on those lines. Stop there. Do you have ideas, Mark, just to turn your question back around to you? <laughs> well, I think the decadal survey of ships is one part. I think we've got to start thinking about lease leasing ships. I think I've seen a lot of questions about relying on some more private operators. I think even things about, even on the globals, how can we increase their physical footprint? You know, right now, uh, everybody wants to be on them, but you're still limited on how many things you can put in the water at once. So a lot of time, people are sitting around waiting for wire time. So are there strategies, I think Kip sort of alluded to it, of using autonomous platforms to physically increase the effectiveness of the ships we have? Maybe even some of the smaller ships. But I think right now we've we've got to come up with a a governance structure that involves the agencies and the community that really constantly is looking at this portfolio of approaches and thinking just differently than what we've done in the past. I have a comment on that. I would encourage you to take a look at the National Oceanographic Partnership language. You'll find congressional intent. I think you will find that the partnership, while longstanding, uh, possibly could be improved and codified some of the things that you're asking. Uh, I would say, yes, you caught one of my hidden messages when I suggested the CBO report is what views the Navy shipbuilding plan. The CBO would say the Navy shipbuilding plan, which doesn't include research vessels, isn't affordable. Yep. So the Navy already has an unaffordable plan that doesn't include research vessels. <laughs> Can I comment, Jim, on that? Sure, sure, go ahead. Um, so I think one of the things we're seeing right now is the impact of a lack of coordinated advocacy for ocean research in general. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the Consortium of Ocean Leadership, many of the people on the call were involved in that. And I mean, that was, what, seven, eight years of just trying to keep it afloat. Now it's gone. Everybody's kind of scrambling. Um, and so we... We don't have anyone in Washington as a community leader right now that is really trying to make the case for large investments. And yeah. so we could look to, you know, the, the coordinated communities like um, astronomy that is very effective at using decadal surveys and then advocacy with Congress to get to get what we need of what they need. And I think we could learn something from that. There is a gathering at Ocean Science next week on Wednesday at 12.45 um, to talk about ocean advocacy. So join us if you're going to be there. Am I allowed to do that on a decadal survey testimony call? Out of order. <laughs> um, let's see. What do we have here? Uh, Mark's. Um, well, Al Allison, you had another question about, well, let's see. Yeah, did you get to that one about... Um, building a new ship from scratch. And also that, that, that's a more general thing. Are there other agencies like NOAA currently in a ship build that we could tag on to? Does anyone have a comment on that, that to do something to replace the upcoming uh, retirements? Yes, the existing NOAA class B vessels, which started contract about four months ago is for a two ship build with two options that cost about $150 million and could be exercised in the next 46 or 72 months, if my math is right. 
or be lost. Is, is that an option to um, uh, replace Kilo, for example? It's a potential option for acquiring additional vessels should Congress feel the need to replace Kilo Moana. Um, yeah, I tried to hedge my answer on that, but yes, it's an option. And But just to clarify that NOAA variant is the Armstrong class, basically, and then they, they took that design, or not, yeah. The, the astronaut class. Which which might be a suitable replacement for the Kilo Moana. Um, um, but the I think the key point of, of Rob's, well, my interpretation of what Rob said is that there's an opportunity there, but nothing can happen without the dollars being appropriated to capitalize on that opportunity. And that requires the community's advocacy, like Debbie pointed out. I think just I the fact that two of our major ships in the last couple of decades are named after astronauts shows how bad we are at advocating for ourselves. Debbie, just to go back real quickly to my original question, um, I asked it just because I don't know, but does UNAL slash NSF have to build a new ship from scratch, or is it feasible that you could acquire an old oil and gas vessel, for example, and then refit it into a research vessel, which seems like it could be more cost effective and not take as long? I can I can touch on that. So it's it's a complex question. I mean, because you can look at ships and you go, well, there's, there's a ship and it's Looks like it could be rearranged, but then they start digging into it and how what's condi real condition of the ship. It's like doing your house and you do a conversion, you pull down the walls, and you find all those things that weren't taken care of behind. Oh, by the way, the, the code has changed. And now you have to deal with all that. So at the end of the day, between you know, all the design work and all the conversion work, you may end up spending this as much, if not more, for a new one. It may not get done much faster, believe it or not. I know it doesn't seem like it, you go, it's a ship. Go in and cut it up, make some changes, and put it in there. But we have very complex ships. We actually have some of the most complex ships in the world because of all the scientific data systems and all the instrumentation we put into them. And by the time you add all that into a, another ship, you can really modify it tremendously. It works in certain situations, and that's what that's what Columbia is trying to do. We're replacing the lengths that they have found some potential, relatively new ships, not some old throwaways, by the way. So you're not dealing with the rebuilding your old New Orleans house. It's got termite damage behind it. Um, they think they've got, found some that could work, but it'll still be $150 million to do that. And if, you know, and, and that will be focused for a few things, not like general oceanographic work we try, tend to do. What we want, like I always describe it as an F-150 pickup. You can do anything with it. You know, and your neighbor can borrow and use it for anything. That's the beauty of our ships because it can support, you know, you know, geophysical research, the physical oceanography research, the integrated combinations of all of these. That's why our ships are the way they are. So it, it can be done, but you'll, you'll have compromises. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with the process that Coach Minnison has did. I just didn't know if there was like a rule that that can't be done. No, there's no rule that it can't be done. No, it was done with uh, Langseth, for example. Caveat real quickly. Most a lot of these ships are foreign ships, and NSF and ONR cannot spend that kind of money to acquire a foreign ship. Um, I mean, the reason why, like, I'll give you an example: University of Washington, we went over and bought the went to England, bought a ship, and bought it back, and did some conversion work. It's because that was a specifically an oceanographic research ship bought with private funds and not with public monies, because you have to deal with the Jones Act and comp. Certainly, the National Science Foundation and the Navy are not going to commit money overseas. Congress is not going to allow them to do that. But Lamont did do that very successfully with the Langsat. Yeah. Or at least that they, I think they bought it for like a million dollars or something, and then it wasn't that much work to convert it. And they actually had to put most most of the money, I think, went into converting it to be more multi-purpose because it was a dedicated. Right. 
yeah, it was a lot of money to convert. But yes, I, I think they made they bought the Langstaff for less than they sold the uh, uh, Ewing for. Um, you know, we're sort of running out of time, and this has been a really interesting session. I appreciate the speakers, the participants, the questioners, and um, it was a bladder buster. So maybe we need a break. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break at this point, and then that way we'll be back on schedule. And I'm trying to make sure that I know you all have accused me of cutting your breaks short. So I'm trying to make sure we keep the lunch hour full hour so that everyone has an opportunity to interact with each other informally. So let's get back to 1045. Bye, Bye everybody. Back. Thank you. I'm just going to um take it away okay um all right everyone we're going to get started on the next session this is a session on public private partnerships and ocean science um this session is geared to developing information on successes lessons learned and future opportunities for nsf to advance their mission and goals through public private partnerships uh, we have uh four speakers in this uh, session three are online and one of them is in person and uh, we will get started off with Dr. Henry Jones. He's the Director of Research Development and Scientific Enterprise at the University of Southern Mississippi. And he will share some lessons learned um, on the development of a data assembly college for unfruit systems. Great. So I'm sure you've already been welcomed to Mississippi and to uh, Southern Miss. So I'm gonna do that yet again. Really glad that you're here. Thanks for letting me be a part. Like everyone in this room and online, my career has taken me in all sorts of different places, uh, but one common theme is some different element of public-private partnerships. Um, from the very first company I started about 25 years ago, that was a collaboration between the, the um, government and academic partner and my small company, um, to most recently the project that I run here at Southern Miss, as Layla described, um, where we are building a data assembly hub for improved systems. You go ahead. So, you know, it's tough for anybody, especially in academia, to only talk for 10 minutes. Um, I was given four possible things to talk about. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is put about two minutes into each um, just to sort of give some summaries based on these experiences that I've had so far um, with uh, different implementations of public private partnerships. So, we can go to the next one. So, one thing is a model uh, that I think about frequently for how to think about the relationships between government and academia and industry, in particular, small business. Uh, the, the gears of the machinery of government, such as it is, is just enormous with lots of inertia for good and for not so good. Um, and lots of things can be uh, generated. There can be lots of energy through uh, participation by the government, but for industry, and especially for small businesses, it can absolutely just decimate that small little gear um, represented by a small company of just a few people when you're trying to work with the government. So what I have observed is that academia can be a really excellent transmission uh, between those two um, parts. And uh, that can manifest itself in many different ways. One example, so we'll go to the next one, is uh, this data assembly hub that I'm the, the principal investigator for. So the way that this came about is a good example. Southern Miss had a good relationship with NOAA and NCEI is, is uh, you know, broadly speaking, the archive. And we were just in discussions with them because we have relationships with them. And they were describing this really difficult new problem um, ahead for them, which was a lot of video streaming in geo referenced not a lot of standards and not really sure how to handle both processing it in real time but then also making it available in the long term so this was a this is a very difficult problem um, the good news is that the defense department has spent billions of dollars over the last 20 years solving very similar but not the same problem and what's also as good is that usm had a relationship separately with Hyperion, which is a business that is the DOD contractor who had been working this problem. And so what USM could do is connect NOAA to Hyperion, two entities that really would have not known to connect and would, have not, would not have known how to connect. And so 
the initial step was for Southern Miss to be the connector to just see if we could work that problem together. And then what it has turned into, thankfully, is executing a solution to this problem where, um, again, it would have been difficult for Hyperion, who's used to working with the Defense Department, to know how to, and they're a small company, um, to, to know how to navigate NOAA. And it would have been difficult for NOAA to know how to work with the, the government um, own software that was available to them that um, Hyperion was aware of. And I, I've just seen the same uh, construct over and over where academia is really an excellent um, transmission point for connecting the big gears of government and the small, rapidly um, spinning gears of, of industry. So on the topic of how to maximize data use and research impact, I come from an entrepreneurial background. Um, one thing that I believe is worth pointing out is that commercial entities start first with the customer. And this is not some alchemy that is difficult to figure out how to do. This is something that Silicon Valley makes sure is done first, because if you do not figure out um, where the customers are coming from, what the market is, and you do that first, if you're a commercial entity that decides to figure that out last, you won't be a commercial entity for long. Um, and so what they have done is develop many tools. On the screen here, I have the Getting Jobs Done Canvas, the Lean Startup Canvas, the Value Proposition Canvas, a few concepts that are well-known and understood in the commercial industry. I teach a class on this at Southern Miss um, for using this within the context of the Defense Department. And my perception is that we could see a lot better data use and research impact to the extent that we can include these tools up front in the conversations as opposed to at the end. NSF does have its uh, i -Corps program. It seems like these exact tools and campuses and so forth, it tends to come at the end um, when you are trying to find out how to commercialize a product. My experience has been that the best way if you want to make the largest impact is to try to include these tools up front. Why is that? In part, it's because there are often a lot of things that are required to make something thrive once it is created, as opposed to just exist. Um, that is the typical, uh, what we call the blind spot or the gap to close between the conversations that I've had as someone in industry compared to somebody who's just funding the initial research from, especially from government and sometimes from academia is it's not just enough to make the thing. You've got to make the thing be able to thrive in the marketplace of some sort um, so that it will endure um, and not just be. And uh, you know, there's a list here of some of those things that are all not taken into account um, that if they are, um, they are all things that can be accountable. And when they are, they can result in a um, a system that can thrive, whether it's a product or a service. So um, we've now, we're, we're through two of those four topics um, from the beginning. Uh, I want to bring up a really big challenge ahead. I think everybody's generally aware of this, but I have seen this firsthand. I saw this firsthand when I was working with the Defense Department to handle these streams of video data. I also, uh, I founded and ran a quantitative hedge fund. So I saw what sort of uh, appetites automated algorithms can have for data. AI algorithms, I say here, are, they are relentless data consumers. We, generally speaking, have had as a cap on our desire for throughput from data our individual brains. There's only so much that one researcher can really try to process through. When you... Properly construct an AI algorithm, it will demand as much data as it as, as the resources will allow. Whatever the resource constraint is, it will maximize that resource constraint. And when that constraint is eliminated, it will just maximize until it finds the next constraint. So that's what I mean here when uh, it fully stresses the infrastructure weak <laughs> points. If you are building out something and it's got and, and everything with regards to AI needs storage and compute and network capability to connect all of that. The AI algorithms will max out one of those three and you'll be pressed to 
increase it, and then it will max out that resource or one of the other ones and so forth. And that's the reality of when you have these sorts of algorithms implemented and, you know, especially in, in systems that can be uh, accessed by, by a broad variety of people compared to just some internally, you know, when you're opening it up to the public. So uh, in our project that we are currently uh, doing for Noah and the archive, mm -hmm. we recognize that this sort of demand cannot be free. So one way to accommodate these sorts of demands is to, from the beginning, put in place the um, infrastructure to pay to, that to get some sort of financial compensation. But that's not always the most appropriate, um, or you know, sometimes for, for policy reasons or for reasons, you know, the, the customers that you want to support don't have the, the finances to adequately compensate for that the um, the resources. So what you can do as an alternative is to require that they submit their results back into the system for other people to use. And I think this is a really important insight is that these relentlessly consuming algorithms are also the most productive things that you can imagine. And if we can get their results to be inserted back into the set of data that is subsequently available for other researchers, it is a very, very powerful feedback mechanism. And I've seen that firsthand, and I'm excited about what we can do for NOAA when we implement this for them as well. Um, and it's uh, something that I'm, you know, I, can, I can talk about at length because it is so exciting what you can do when you implement this sort of positive feedback loop into a system like this that's automated. All right, and then the final topic is, I was asked, what, what have you seen that was really a big deal that really made a big impact? Um, so with regards to data, some of you may be aware of these FAIR um, policies for, made for, for good data stewardship. You see them here, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, FAIR, FAIR standards and so forth. That is a really good concept. Um, it has not percolated into operations all that much. I have seen in some of my past endeavors <laughs> that what really makes things happen is creating a school. And uh, as I note here, there is a reason why everywhere you look, there, you, there's stars, and some of the thumb, some you know, likes and all this sort of thing. It is because simple metrics thoroughly drive producer and consumer behavior. <clears throat> Um, stars are a, you know, they seem to work. So we're, we're starting with stars in our system. Um, when data is pulled in, data is ready to be shared. We have a very simple, at this point, um, rubric for giving a fair metric. We are not the fair experts. We do not want to be the fair experts. We're just putting into place the ability to score based on fairness and then to publicize that so that it can drive both the behavior of the producers of the data to make their data fair, and for the consumers of the data to highlight, emphasize, and utilize that because it's been made clear to them that this is the most fair data, the fairest data of them all um, <laughs> that would be available for them to use. And that's, that's it for me. Hopefully I made my time. So we'll hold the questions till the end with all of the panelists. Um, so our next um, two panelists are joining us online and uh, both are um, presentations from NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. And um, Karen uh, Grissom, Deputy Division Chief of NCEI Coast of Ocean and Geophysics Section, and Tim Boyer, Oceanographer at NCEI. Uh, we'll be talking about strengthening partnerships through the blue economy services and products. And I'm not sure which is going first. I think Karen. Yep, I got a thumbs up. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Okay, thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Karen Grissom, and I'm very new with the NCEI. I just joined the organization three weeks ago, so um, 
Tim is the expert regarding the organization, but I'll try and help you um, learn what we do a little bit. So um, today I'm here to speak with you regarding the public-private partnerships, specifically the blue economy with a focus on unmanned systems. And I would like to thank my contributors, Jennifer Bowers, Carrie Wall, and Sharon Masick. Without their help, because I'm such a newbie to the organization, this presentation would not be brought to you. Um, next, please. Okay, so just a very high level v overview of what NCEI is and its value to the nation. A lot of you are aware of the data stewardship that NCEI provides. We provide the archives for um, ocean atmospheric and, um, data from the depths of the ocean to the surface of the sun. And we also provide a range of products from hourly to decadal time scales and cover a local to geographic um, locations. The expertise that we have in-house, we have two science divisions and three support division, two support divisions and the data stewardship division, of which is the archive, which most of you are familiar with. But we have a plethora of expertise from geophysicists, um, marine geologists, to uh, space weather scientists, to climate scientists, um, people that focus in paleo, climatology, um, aerosols, coastal inundation. Um, a lot of expertise went in-house. And moving um, on the far right of this graph, you'll see a pie chart that shows you our stakeholders by section. And one thing that you'll note is that the bulk of our stakeholders are external to the NOAA um, enterprise, which means that we have a lot of stakeholders in the ecosystem, aquaculture, um, agriculture, transportation. Um, in insurance is a big one, um, education and emergency management. So we produce a lot of higher order products that um, benefit these stakeholders. Next, please. So Karen, just a, a quick note, we're not able to advance your slides right now. I just wanted to let you know that the room can't see your slides at this moment. Hold on, those of us who are logged on. Oh, oh you can? Know. Okay. Oh, oh, we we could, could, but not anymore. Disregard. <laughs> Would you like me to share my screen? I, I actually think we have it. If you're, if you're looking online, you're okay. My apologies. Okay. There we go. All right. So yeah, we're, we're all good, Karen. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, next. Thank you. Okay. So a lot of you have heard the new blue economy. So the question is, is what is new and what is blue about it? The ocean economy we're all aware of is comprised of navigation, um, exploitation of those natural resources, uh, tourism is another activity, fishing, et cetera. There's a lot of things that go into the existing ocean economy. And what makes it new and blue is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on um, economic growth within that sector but also um, have components of social inclusion and uh, make sure that it's sustainable and that um, it improves the livelihood of people around us. So as far as how this will benefit the public-private partnership is it's a, uh, a intersection of technology, data, and information are coming together to catalyze this. And um, what are the benefits of that? How does that play out? We'll see that in the next slide. Okay, thank you. So the New Blue Economy was founded on capabilities of acquiring data and developing information that will enable the nation to spur responsible long-term economic growth while the idea is protecting ocean health, human health, and ensuring social equity. And here, what you can see is we have um, three areas. It's um, three legs of the stool, per se. It's propping up ocean health because we want to make sure that it is a sustainable development of the new blue economy. And the three areas are research or science, um, policy. That's all. That's how we can inform decisions on management, resource management, and venture-based um, there we go. 
venture-based innovation. So the venture-based the venture -based innovation is where we are focusing today. And those are innovation, workforce, and application. In the innovation, we're, we're focusing on areas like we want to increase our coastal observations for a variety of applications. We want to make sure that all this data is accessible and um, available to the public. As Henry mentioned in his previous talk, he brought up the fair principles of data management. We definitely want to follow that. Another thing is this can't happen in a vacuum. We need to make sure that we're adequately engaging with the stakeholders and the public out there so that we need to know that what we're doing is benefiting the economy and we are spurring innovation and increasing that public-private partnership. Um, lastly, a lot of this is based on a foundation of research and experimentation. But none of this can happen without the workforce. So that's one of the big roles of the New Blue Economy is developing a workforce that is able to um, support this new blue economy, which means that it um, will, we will need data managers, we'll need computer scientists, we're going to need people who have expertise in cloud computing, we're going to need a whole slew of scientists, we're going to need pilots for unmanned systems, we're going to need manufacturing sector. There's um, It's almost endless, the, the applications as far as how the workforce expansion could grow. And of course, it is just going to depend upon how um, we manage the resource of the new blue economy. And lastly, all of this needs to come together, the science and the research come together and influence our policy on how we're managing it. Next. Okay, so um, the case studies I wanted to focus on is looking at unmanned systems. And here's the region of where we're kind of forming this nexus for unmanned systems. And you'll see that there's a lot of activity going on here in the Gulf of Mexico, the northern Gulf of Mexico, around unmanned systems. We have um, an innovation district that's located in Gulfport. We have USM campuses. We have Stennis. And of course, there is also um, laboratories. There is a number of unmanned systems and uh, that are being developed here along the coast, along with a lot of data processing and coastal data management um, capabilities. Next. So who are the players? These are some of the players that are active here in the Gulf. Um, inside the circles, those are the, the, the dash line. Those are the current players that are active in that um, Gulf uh, the Gulfport Innovation Center and are spearheading a lot of these efforts in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And the, um, the logos that intersect with the dash lines are part of a current um, cohort pilot project for um, Vincent to fund six venture capitalist um, companies in um, blue economy develop. And it has to do with technology develop of unmanned systems. And uh, further out, we move more away from the local area. We move into companies that are already existing in this uncrewed um, arena and are established and are competing. Next. Okay. so. Um, what are we doing here? Um, we're building a regional uh, blue economy nexus, per se. In this area, it's not so much that it's an application, but it's trying to build the workforce. USM is, has a, tr a training program going on um, for unmanned systems. I believe it's the first of its kind in the nation. And um, we're, we're building partnerships to develop the capability to increase the collection of observations for in, um to collect more environmental observations for longer times and in harsher um, conditions, areas where it's too difficult to send a ship out or too costly to send a ship out. And of course, we're promoting data-driven decisions to foster that innovation. Some of the benefits to stakeholders, and when I say stakeholders, this is the public, This is um, these are the, the technology companies, these are um, researchers, scientists, resource managers, are the data um, 
to support decision making in public interest. For instance, um, we can provide data on sectors from pipelines to wind farms, fisheries, weather, and just any kind of plain in, um, exploration. For example, um, South Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. The charts for um, NOAA producers are very um, valuable to the commercial and recreational fisheries and aquaculture sector. Sector And as you'll note in the middle image, that red um, unmanned system, they're utilizing unmanned systems currently for, um, for doing that kind of mapping for charts. Um, another is the data is open to the public. NCEI takes this data in and also refines it and makes more advanced products, as I mentioned previously um, when I was speaking to that stakeholder sector. Um, to make it available so that decisions can be made on this. One example is the World Ocean Database, of which my colleague Tim will be speaking to in the next presentation. Um, another is to promote workforce uh, development and technology. The whole idea is to bring jobs to the local and regional area through this, this regional um, nexus and unmanned systems. And um, out of all these benefits, it, it creates some opportunities that we can um, look to to the future to expand this. And some of those are the technology development and transition, going from research to operations. That seems like a pretty straightforward um, uh, air, um, area, but it's actually quite complicated to take it from the research to operations. So there are some areas where we need to focus there. We also, um, as I mentioned, the workforce development, we have a need for um, pilots and drone operators. We also have a large need for data managers too, um, people that have experience in managing large sets of data, writing computer code, um, and particularly with uh, migration to the cloud and um, AI ML learning. We also have, um, an, uh, there's an opportunity for rapidly advancing data science skills. And that is something that I'll speak to more on one of the, um, the end slides next. So expanding this, this um, unmanned system test case, we could take it from a regional nexus where we're developing capabilities in this region to a national application. And one of the national applications for unmanned systems is using it for fisheries monitoring to um, make informed decisions and data-driven decisions on things such as stock assessments. Um, this application is scalable. It allows us to go from a local to regional to, um, from a, excuse me, regional to national to global um, scale. We can also monitor habitats and water quality. Water quality that we're looking at monitoring with unmanned systems is um, a whole slew of things that are costly and expensive to do if we put out a um, a buoy or have to go out there and manually sample, we can cover a lot larger areas and that would be water quality, um, sea surface temperature, salinity, DO, these are dissolved oxygen concentrations, a whole slew of things that it makes it easier to do with an unmanned system than if we were to do manually sampling. Um, another thing is we can minimize our interaction with protective species. Um, turtles is a fine example through telemetry monitoring. So we're remotely monitoring them and we can telemeter that data, meaning it's transmitted to satellite and we wouldn't have to have a, a direct interaction with that species. We could do that through um, use of passive and active acoustics. And lastly, this all comes together and it's going to help us with um, to assess population size and determine prey abundance. Um, a good example of that are the um, the rice wells. So that's a, um, a good application for that. Um, we're, this will support different stock assessments such as Hake in the West Coast, Atlantic Cod, um, here in the Gulf of Mexico, Snapper, Shrimp, Grouper. Those are three examples of where we can um, apply this, this fleet of unmanned system technology to manage our fisheries. So um, what are some of the benefits of this? 
I would say some of the benefits of this are we do get this increase in this exponential increase in data collected signals in regional water. So it's going to allow us to have a better indication of what the ecosystem is and what kind of stocks um, it will support. As I mentioned, we could do the water quality, ma water quality mapping. So that's going to um, couple with the um, use that for determining what kind of conditions um, will the stock will it support. Um, another thing is the expansion of workforce. I think I mentioned that before on the regional. This is something that I cannot um, stress enough that it, this is a new area, a new emerging technology. It's been developed in the development stages for probably 10, 15 years, but that's relatively new as far as um, Earth system monitoring. And so we really need to develop a workforce that has experience in piloting these unmanned systems, um, monitoring the data, processing the data, um, writing code for it. There's, there's a never ending um, need there. Along, of course, we need oceanographers to look at the data and tell us what's going on, biologists, fisheries, um, fisheries specialists. There's a lot of need for workforce of, um, development there. Um, so some of the facts about fisheries that I thought were kind of interesting, and this shows you the potential for the scalability. It goes back to our first, um, our first benefit of scalable from a regional national to a global. Three out of seven people depend upon ocean as a primary source of protein. So that's a significant um, market sector per se, if you're going to look at it from an um, economic standpoint. 2.5 trillion annually was the ocean contributions to the economy and 600 million that's the worldwide number of livelihoods that depend upon at least partially on fisheries and aquaculture so that's a huge market sector any company that's looking to expand in this can just look at these numbers and realize that there is a market sector out there next next slide please so another application is more um, has more of a global impact. Um, I mentioned the fisheries on a national impact because fisheries are managed on a re on a national and a regional level. There's something that are exclusive to our EEZ. Excuse me, my light just went out. <laughs> um, on a global impact, uh, we could use unmanned systems to to have a, a discernible impact on monitoring marine weather observations. And um, an example of this would be um, disseminating data in real time from unmanned systems to the global community for numerical weather prediction and natural hazard detection. And we'll work with our global partners at the World Meteorological Organization and um, the, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the International Hydrographic organization to collect this data and make this data available in real time or near real time so that it can provide a benefit to um, numerical weather prediction centers globally all around the world. Um, some, some benefits of collecting uh, this kind of observations for marine weather include process studies. Um, process studies are, the, the unmanned systems are ideal for process studies to inform the needs for longer term observations. A good example would be um, measuring air or sea surface temperature to understand how the tropical Pacific impacts global weather, um, as well as climate and how hurricanes form in the Genesis region of the Eastern tropical Pacific. These would be um, ideal for that, where you might not be able to sustain a long-term observing system out there, but you could send out an unmanned system. Um, another example that is benefits to stakeholders are data buys. So we don't have to actually um, go out and build the infrastructure within NOAA or within NCI to do this. We could buy the data from a commercial sector and provide that. Um, it allows for more uh, flexibility and it's also a shorter spin up time and versus developing the um, developing that capacity in house. Um, and another um, benefit from using unmanned systems for marine weather observations are they provide a rapid response capability. You can be at um, the right place at the right time. A good example of this would be um, 
driving one of these into the center of a storm, um, which has been done previously. Um, AOML, one of the NOAA labs, sent one into a hurricane, I think it was a year or two ago, and was able to collect observations within, the, um, within a hurricane. And previous to that, you know, the, the possibility of a, the, um, the probability that a hurricane is going to go over one of your observing assets in the ocean is very minimal and in situ assets. So here we have the capability of directing them to the storm versus um, waiting to see if the storm goes over the asset. Um, another um, unknown fact about these is that they're also, they promote environmental sustainability of observing systems and methods. They have lower um, impacts than a lot of the current, um, than the Institute current observing methods. Um, the National uh, Weather Service National Data Buoy Center recently replaced a mooring in um, the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary that was causing scouring to the benthic layer from its anchor with an unmanned system. And so there's no impact there. It's a low impact in that area. And we still collect the data that, provo um, that pr pr is provided to the global marine weather infrastructure. So um, the opportunities, what are their opportunities here for marine weather observations? We're living in a changing climate. We know that there's a big market need for more observations of, of weather, whether it's over the land or um, in the ocean. Um, in order to do that, we need to have um, technology innovation. Some of the limitations currently are the duration that these can go out, um, the distance that they can go, um, how long they can be out in the water, and of course the operating envelope. Some of them don't do so great in high currents or high wind conditions. So there's those type of um, things to consider and that's areas where um, public partnership can intersect and um, stimulate technology and in, um, innovation. And um, once again is the inexperienced workforce. There's very much a need, this is the third time I've hit on this, is the need for workforce development and capability in the unmanned systems area. Operators, data managers, people interpreting the data. So it's definitely an emerging um, workforce need. Um, some other opportunities are cost. Uh, the cost of these can vary, but some of them are actually quite cost effective and um, would in compared to a long term observing platform. So that's something that as we develop them more, ideally, the cost would come down and then it would be rolled back into um, more private public partnerships. We'd be able to put more money into the private sector as the cost comes down. That, that goes back to the data buys. Um, next slide, please. Karen, I just want to give you a time check. We're um, at about 20 minutes for this one, so we'll, we will need okay. to- Okay, actually, um, I am just going to say the last thing is data landscape. So the data landscape is changing and we need data managers because we're going to get a lot of data coming out of this. And um, the data from this is, like I said, from the regional to the global level. This is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our speaker is uh, Tim Boyd. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Tim Boyer, uh, Karen's colleague at, at NCEI, and I'll be expanding on some of the themes the, uh, for the blue economy. I, I, I gave it a little different title to, to focus on those themes, uh, coll collaboration all along the instrument to information chain. As an oceanographer, I'm acutely aware that there are not enough measurements in the ocean that we, we don't have enough measurements, we don't have enough data to understand the ocean, not historically, not presently. Uh, and when we do have data, as we do have a lot more data than we had previously, um, it's a struggle to go from data to, to actual information, research or monitoring or, or uh, usable um, policy information or policy ready information, I should say. So I, I'm going to that, that that that's this is a, a global task it's not uh, and it's also a 
a task that can only be accomplished with public uh, private partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to, to drive that home, this the, the UN Decade of the Ocean, we are in the UN Decade of the Ocean for Sustainable Development. And uh, I, I did finally get a communication from someone from the UN Decade um, Coordination Office uh, talking about public-private partnerships, but I didn't have time to, to put it in, in this slide. But uh, Luis de Mergen, uh emailed me today to say that uh, of the 300 actions in the UN Decade of the Ocean, more than half have some type of public partnership, private partnership already. And um, there's actually a specific office set up to facilitate public private partnerships. So the UN Decade of the Ocean is, is a good way to facilitate partnerships and it, it, it's set up to sustain uh, the, these public private partnerships for, um, for the seven decadal outcomes, which include a uh, productive, a uh, productive ocean. Uh, next, please. So our, our, our own particular, or one of our actions in the UN decade is uh, what I'm involved in, which is the World Ocean Database, which uh, it, it is kind of a an aggregation uh, and data to information point uh, for for oceanographic data. We have the oceanographic observing community, um, which which feeds the data into the NCAI archive, and that's that's where all that data is preserved. And then from, from there, the World Ocean Database aggregates all the data from all the different observing systems. Uh, and I, I should specify that I'm speaking of the subsurface ocean, most specifically, although the surface, this applies to the surface as well, uh, where the World Ocean Database integrates these different sources from the Global Temperature and Salinity Profile Program, Argo, Mortar Rays, ships, gliders, uh, anything, uh, animals with, uh, with instruments, instruments uh, mounted on animals, anything that we can get and synthesizes that, enhances it, common format metadata, uh, and uh, assess the quality of the data, and then make it available to the community and also make information products such as the World Ocean Atlas, which are uh, benefits to the nation and, and globally. And so with this, we're trying to meet the, the goal of the UN and decade, uh, which, which are contingent on the ocean monitoring, on equitable data access, and on tools for transforming that data into accessible information. Uh, next, please. So uh, this, this, is, this is a historical database. And so the data go actually all the way back to 1772. But for most of the time, we, these, these data have come from ships, from instruments on different ships, from uh, mainly from research vessels, uh, merchant ships, and, and, and so on. And you can see a big bump up a little bit after 2000. That is, this is somewhat of a golden age of, of ocean observations. You have the Argo floats. Uh, in purple there, you have the gliders that, that both Karen and, and Henry mentioned, uh, un, unmanned systems. You have pinnipeds. Uh, you, you have more buoys. So we are in a golden age. It's still not enough data, but uh, it, it is at the same time a fire hose of data coming in. Uh, next, please. And so where do public-private partnerships fit in there? So, so a, a lot of those data, the ship data, do come from merchant ships. Uh, anyone who works on the ocean, merchant ship companies and, and, and so on, have a high interest in, in understanding the ocean. Karen mentioned uh, that a, a, a lot of the, the marine global uh, meteorology information and a lot of that from ship-based comes from merchant ships, but also for the, the, from the ocean, even subsurface ocean, a, a lot of data comes from merchant ships. And uh, because the merchant ship fleet and the owners have a, a, an interest in the ocean that's, that goes beyond self-interest even in weather forecasting and, and, and ocean currents and so on, just a, an understanding of the ocean. And this is an example, the Oleander, it's a merchant ship that was actually retrofit. They, they uh, allowed researchers to drill a hole in, in the ship and uh, to put some special oceanographic instruments. And so for 45 years, the Oleander has been uh, part of this public-private private partnership to, uh, to measure the ocean. You can see in the lower left there, that's, those are expendable bathythermograph lines uh, across the Gulf Stream from the Oleander, 45 years worth uh, 
a, a gold mine of information. Uh, on the bottom right there, we, we also have kind of the other end. We have actual private institutes that have been set up that maintain their own research vessel, and they do contribute the, the data that, um, that they measure uh, to, to the, the, the general public access. In, in this case, the, the FALCOR and FALCOR 2, well, the FALCOR, I'm not sure the FALCOR 2, is part of the National Science Foundation's rolling deck to repository. So those data are part of the, uh, uh, the public record. Next, please. And uh, other, this is a, another example. This is a data exchange agreement with private companies. Uh, that this is from 2012, and on the left you see this is a memorandum of understanding between NOAA and uh, Shell and and other oil companies that uh, are were exploring on the on the shelf on on the Alaskan slope where it's, it's very difficult and costly to get research ships up there. They're taking information, so this information was shared with NOAA and then publicly shared through the World Ocean Database and through the archive, and so. There's a public benefit to this, and there's also a benefit to the oil companies in that we take their data and we compile it with all the other uh, source data and then provide it in a quality control form back. So they, they get a, a whole picture, not just their data, but a whole picture of the area of their interest. And publicly, there is a much augmented understanding of those areas. Next, please. And so I'm going to talk a lot about the Argo program because this is the, the main subsurface ocean observing system right now. And you see it on the, the top right. Merchant ships, any ships are fantastic, but they're going along shipping lines. And even research ships don't take a lot of data uh, in, in the winter in either hemisphere. Argo floats are, are autonomous profiling floats uh, that have uh, been developed and have been uh, operating for about 25 years now. And it is, they have only been operating and only been able to keep costs within, um, with, within possible bounds by collaborations, private-public collaborations. And you see here the, the instruments, the, the Solo 2 on the far left, that was developed at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. That was one of the, well, it, it is one of the main floats that's out there. But uh, really, to be cost-effective, we need a, a commercial manufacturer. And so there's been a partnership with MRV Systems to manufacture these floats and floats that were also developed at Woods Hole. And you can see that the sensors on top, the CTD sensors, have also been developed with public-private partnerships in close collaboration with Seabird and with RBR. And I'm sorry, I don't know what RBR stands for. I couldn't even find it on their website. I used to know, but it's become one of those acronyms that is, is the word now. So uh, this, is, this is another example of public-private partnership. Uh, next, please. And this is ongoing right now. A new float is, is being produced uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Steve Reiser and the University of Washington and, and Seabird, the, uh, uh, excuse me, and MRV systems. And so this is the next generation of floats uh, and it can, can handle biogeochemical sensors, uh, which is the, the, originally Argo was temperature and salinity, but now there's biogeochemical floats and uh, these instrumentations are extremely uh, uh, expensive and, uh, and, and difficult to, to, to maintain. Uh, and so this partnership, um, with MRV is, is getting the next, the next generation of the BGC Argo floats uh, out there and, and hopefully keeping costs down and keeping up quality of the commercial manufacturer. Uh, next, and this is through, I, I really should mention, this is through the National Ocean Partnership Program, which has developed most of the it facilitated most of the development of the Argo instrumentation, or much of it, I should say. Next, please. And so this is biogeochemical, the, the sensors. Uh, so nitrate sensors here, and this is uh, Ken Johnson of uh, Marine, uh, Marine Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Steve Reiser of University of Washington, in conjunction with, uh, with, with commercial, in this, this case, again, Seabird, and you, and they've developed this biogeochemical sensor for nitrate, which is extremely important for understanding the ocean system. There are also carbon sensors out there, which will help us understand the, the carbon cycle and, and other sensors. And so this was developed. Uh, you see on, on the right, this is the Seabird Specs page. Now these are out there and, and they're starting to, to be used. Uh, next, please. Thank you, Richard Ranker Research. Um, 
And this, this is a, another type of collaboration. And this is with the Argo is extremely uh, difficult to maintain uh, much, much easier than going out on the ship and getting these measurements, but uh, seeding the Argo floats and maintaining them, developing the instrumentation and deep Argo. Deep, so most Argo floats go to about 2000 meters. Deep Argo is, is full depth of the ocean. And we need that to understand the, the changes in the earth's energy imbalance and the heat and the, the current changes in the deep ocean. And the, the Paul Allen Foundation uh, saw this as, as an important, uh, a, a really important scientific question and has actually funded the deployment of these, these Argo, deep Argo floats off of, the, off, off of the Brazil basin. And so this is extremely important because it is difficult to get, even for a program like Argo, to get the funding to, to uh, develop uh, the, the Argo array, the deep Argo array. Of course, the maintenance of the Argo array will still be the responsible of the Argo program. Uh, next, please. And so moving on, so, so this is a lot of getting the instrumentation developed and, and uh, taking the measurements. So now we need to get those measurements out to, to the public. So, uh, well, to researchers, to everyone, to anyone, public, free, free and open access. And this is where uh, the, th this is the NOD, this is the NOAA Open Data Dissemination. And this is a, a public-private partnership with with the uh, three th with three cloud providers with uh, with Amazon Web Services, with Microsoft uh, Azure, and with uh, Google BigQuery. the The easiest way now to get data out is is through the cloud, but there are costs associated with that. But uh, um, th so the NOD is is working with the cloud providers so that they they allow for those data sets that they see as environmentally um, important and also for which they then can uh, incorporate into their search engines, into their uh, artificial intelligence and so on, uh, allowed for the, the free input and output of these, these data. Uh, next, please. And Tim, I'm just going to give you the time check as well. Yeah, sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to zip through these fast. So, uh, this is actually, uh, we are able to, the World Ocean Database is now available through uh, Amazon Web Services in the cloud, free free and, and open access through the NOD. So this is a, a great public partnership for, for getting the data accessible and equitably, equitably accessible to everyone. Next, please. And so finally, okay, the data is out there, but uh, we, at least, uh, my group doesn't have the the resources to 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 we, we we do make the world ocean atlas which is one step in getting from all of those data into uh, a coherent information and that can be used by models and so on but the next step really communicating that information um, to to the public to the users uh, we, we don't have a great facility for that and so there's a public private partnership. It's not actually ours, it's the US Geological Service with Esri, a private company. And they've developed ecological marine units which take in the World Ocean Atlas information, which uses the World Ocean Database information from, from the uh, ocean observing system. And they take it a step further, both in, into a, a tailored product for customers that, that they are aware of that, that need this something called ecological marine units, which will help them make and assess uh, ecological areas in the ocean. So this is a public-private partnership for that last step, really going from data to information that, that consumers can use. Uh, that's that's what I have next. Oh, I do have a summary, but I'll just leave it up there. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And uh, we have one uh, last speaker in the session, Dr. Almisha Campbell. She's the Assistant Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Jackson State University. Um, she'll be talking to us without slides on partnerships with NSF's Technology Innovation and Partnership Directorate. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. And I see my buddy, um, Dr. Gordon, here. Hi, Dr. Gordon. Good to see you. <laughs> um, one of the things that, um, as I listen to the presenters before me and the innovation and the technologies that they're discussing, is how do we ensure that these technologies are protected and also the how do we, we deploy them 
um, within the new uh, blue economy to impact economic development. And one of the things that we have been working, Jackson State has been working with um, USM on for a number of years is how do we work um, and helping these emerging technologies that would impact um, the new blue economy. So we started with the Build Back Better program, um, working with them um, through our NSF ICO program that was mentioned earlier, um, teaching the Lean Startup methodology um, to some of the teams there um, in at, at, um, at USM, working with um, the early stage technologies. And throughout those efforts, we have been able to um, have many successes. Um, some of those successes will be um, of course, collectively in our collaboration as the Mississippi Research Consortium, working with um, our state legislators and our institution of higher learning to find seed funds that can support these emerging technologies. So from the private-public partnership with the Mississippi Smart Business Act of giving um, credit to companies that work with universities on research, they can get a rebate back. But we also looked at the other side of it. How do we support those early technologies that are coming out of our universities to impact our ecosystem? And so we now have what we call the Smart Accelerate, and that gives up to $150,000 in funding to support um, some of these early stage technologies that are coming from our institutions that we consider state-owned IP, which is state-owned intellectual property. So as we work through some of those um, nuances at first of not having the funding, and now we have some opportunities where we do have some funding to do some of these work and to impact what's happening um, working with them as well and the Blue Navigator program and looking at how we're supporting those companies that are getting those investment to come to the coast and work in the new blue economy and doing the training, the entrepreneurial training that's needed, making sure that they have what they need to pitch in, in front of investors. Um, we're getting them ready now to come to Jackson State University for the, the, um, the SBIR road tour. They'll be able to talk to program officers on the SBI and STTR side to see how they can develop their proposals to get some of those follow-on funding to support those technologies. Because the whole idea is um, we want these technologies to be based in the state of Mississippi. We also want those companies to relocate in the state of Mississippi. And so whatever we can do with those resources, um, the training as well as helping to find the follow-on funding is some of those things that we've done. And I'm proud to say that in a short space of time that we've been able to win not only the phase one of the Build Back Better program that was funded to EDA, but we were able to win the new um, um, program by the National Science Foundation, which is the NSF Engines Type 1. It's a $1 million phase um, one for us to see the feasibility of us running an engine in the state of Mississippi, covering from down the coast to all the way up to the some northern parts of Mississippi. And with that program, we so far, we're looking at our different stakeholders. We're looking at what we need in the blue new blue economy in terms of the technologies that are needed. Um, and this whole topic is around food and water security. And of course, you know, all of that, we will be looking at aquaculture. We will be looking at healthcare. We would also look in at export. So we're talking to companies like Dole and others in how they can support um, the work that is happening um, here in the state of Mississippi and among our two institutions. We also, um, with, with USM leading, has now won one of the newest program by the National Science Foundation, which is the Accelerating Research Technology um, Program, or NSF Art, and that's a $6 million program that was funded to um, University of Southern Mississippi. So I give them very good kudos for the hard work they're doing to ensure that we have the resources that are necessary to make sure that the companies that are relocating to the Gulf Coast, as well as the technologies that are developed are successful and that they're really um, geared towards impacting um, society because everything we do is about societal impact. And then comes behind that is those investments that will come into the state and help develop our um, economic systems here in the state of Mississippi. So I wanted to bring those pieces out because a lot of times when we're talking about these new technologies that are developed, 
sometimes we fail to think about what can we develop in the state? What can we develop to solve some of the problems that we are having, whether it be in the ocean systems or whether it be in other areas that may impact um, um, the, the new blue economy? And so we are looking at um, some of the lessons we learned during that is that understanding that there are different types of technologies that are going to come through that may impact ocean science. And how do we address those um, different areas? Someone mentioned AI before. I was listening to a podcast and the conversation around government is not regulating AI, right? They haven't had conversations about AI. Now, is it too soon to have those conversations? Um, we know the impact of AI when it comes to anything we are doing in terms of um, technology, when it comes to uh, movement of people, when it comes to the ocean, when it comes to other areas, and how do we use that? Um, I know the conversation is going on about who owns the intellectual property when AI is involved. That's completely different, but how do we use these new tools and technologies to impact and enhance um, the work that is taking place um, in, in the new blue economy? And how do we support those um, early stage technologies and to support the workforce that's gonna be needed um, to do some of the things that we're trying to do? Because everything we think about, even though we have AI, there has to be a human component um, behind that to drive those data, to put those data in correctly and train that AI tool in order to make sure that what comes out of it, it's um, it's accurate. Um, we, we the AI will not operate without that human element providing that input that's needed. We're seeing a lot of new technologies um, coming out. Um, I will give kudos to my uh, my partner in crown there at USM, Brian Cuevas, in the Office of Innovation Management, who really has his hands on the pulse about what's taking place. Um, everything from the uncrewed systems um, to all the way up to um, the, the species in the ocean, looking at those technologies, looking at the, the faculty that are developing those technologies and make, making sure that they're provided with the resource uh, resources that are needed. And not only are we looking at um, um, funding from our federal partners like NOAA, um, National Science Foundation, NASA, and others, but we're looking to our companies that are investing in the economy and seeing how we can partner with them to develop new technologies, um, how we can get workforce um, development opportunities um, for our students uh, and sometimes our faculty as well. But I think with all that is happening, uh, those conversations about making sure that we have the, the right workforce, make sure the talent is there in the different spaces that we need um, would be critical. And that's why those funding that we are receiving from the federal government to do the training, the entrepreneurial training and the commercialization training, that we are staffing up our offices to provide that support because the technologies that take are happening. We have to make sure the technologies are working the way they need to do. We make sure the protection is there. And then how do we deploy um, those technologies to have that positive impact? And so now we have, um, I would say for the first time in a long time, and must thank the Chips and Science Act and must plug here our Senator, um, Senator Wicker for champion that Chips and Science Act on behalf of the state of Mississippi and the Exco states to make sure that we have that funding. And not only that we have that funding, that, that we are able as state institutions to compete um, for those funding as well. So um, again, as a recap, um, some of the lessons learned is understanding that we need the human capital um, to help us do some of this work understanding the different type of technologies and how do we work with those technologies. Some of the technologies have a social um, component to them that we now have to pivot and be able to help train um, social entrepreneurs to do some of this work. Um, we also um, making sure that we have the resources to scale up um, because before we can serve um, a certain capacity, but now we have scaled up with the resources that we have and the training of our new um, staff that's on board, and we're happy about that. Um, and then of course, um, as we are recruiting companies into the Gulf Coast, making sure that they have what's needed 
to stay in the Gulf Coast and to stay in Mississippi, setting up their, their business headquarters. So I think collectively with the team that's surrounding the efforts that are taking place in the Gulf Coast, that we have a solid um, partnership, we have company support, um, and we also have support from our federal partners. So definitely have to give um, kudos to all those different public-private partnerships that are taking place and that's necessary for us to um, really have a meaningful impact in the new blue economy because we, Brian and I talk a lot about when people talk about the blue economy, they often forget about the tech side of it and that we have to make sure we have um, those tools and resources that will be able to accelerate um, process. And I'll step back and say it, you know, for someone who um, more on the tech-based side, a lot of people do not know that six years of my career was in the shipping industry. Right. So that's what my love is. And so having to do this partnership with the University of Southern Mississippi, it gives me that, that opportunity to go back to my first love of being on the dock and seeing the ships and looking at the tools and resources that they use um, in that process. And if you're old as me or older, you remember the telefax machine that you had to type to the ships and say, stop next, you know, little words as possible so you don't spend too much money. Um, that's how we learn. But now there are new tools and resources that can be used to really manage the operations and the export um, um, process within um, the shipping industry. So with that, I'll stop there and just say thanks again for this opportunity. Um, this is a space that I really love working with. And I'm glad I have, you know, the tools and resources as well as the partnership with the University of Southern Mississippi and the Office of Innovation Management to really help um, um, these companies and these technologies that are coming um, in the Gulf Coast region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia. So we have uh, time for some questions. There's quite a few questions um, in the chat. Following Tuba's uh, model, we want to elevate the committee questions first and maybe hear some voices we haven't heard yet. Um, so there's a question from Kristen, if you'd like to go ahead and have yeah, that. Um, when I wrote this, it was initially for Henry, um, but really any any of the speakers might have uh, come to this. Um, I, I saw how academia can be a critical connector in public-private partnerships, but I wondered if these were happening um, in your experiences more because of some initial individual connections that are already there, you know someone, they, they you know, all of those things that are sort of happy chance or are specific strategies mm -hmm. being implemented to identify and bring multi-sector groups together that kind of launch these partnerships. So here we have the um, third Wednesday night of each month, we have the Gulf Blue Navigator uh, networking event, and it brings people from government and from academia and from industry all together, because I do think initially it is just who do you know and having those conversations. So that's that is part one. And then part two is having the infrastructure and the practices in place and some experience and connecting all those from a contracting and grant and, and collaboration perspective. But you need them both. Thank you. Karen, Amisha, Tim, did you want to comment there? I agree. The networking is is key and, and getting involved. Yes, absolutely. And if you've been working in, um, also, if you've worked in the area, to, in the arena, it helps, too, because you build a lot of, um, you build a lot of connections that way. Uh, but are, um, I wonder, do professional societies and play any role in, in these developing these connections? Or has that the look on your face and thinking maybe not? Doesn't see, it seems like those tend to be siloed among that. My okay. I'm just thinking is what about like the Marine Technology Society? So that's a good that's a good example. Yeah. I, I'd say there are some exceptions like the Marine. Technology, is it technology society, technology mm -hmm. society um, is a good example of maybe the exception to the rule. It does seem like for the most part, they just, those things can maintain silos. But... Um, so the next question, 
apparently from me. Um, and I think this is one that any of the panelists can address. And I'm wondering if you all have to, to continue this conversation about networking. Um, do your thoughts on developing teamwork, teaming frameworks and proposal submission models for us to consider maybe as a recommendation to NSF to help us focus on um, use inspiration and ultimately increase the use of fundamental um, funded science. I would start off in answering that um, we currently have a program um, that is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's for translational research and we're teaching um, team science. So we bring in um, faculty right now from the different institutions in the state and they go through a series of workshops together, working together, figuring out how to collaborate and working yeah. on major proposals um, together as a team to impact that interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary standpoint, but also looking at a grand topic. So right now the team is working on food security and the next cohort will be working on resilience. Other oh. oh. thoughts here? Could, could you repeat? I, I'm having a, a difficult time hearing from the room. Um, the question was that was on um, developing team teaming frameworks and proposals uh, for submissions to NSF to focus on use inspiration and ultimate success of fundamental ocean research. Yeah, I it, it is difficult. I I have tried to to join or or initiate proposals through through the NOP or as well as through the, the UN decade. And I, I don't have an answer, a good answer for you, but because I I have not been able to, to accomplish, I, I don't have the, I don't know how best to team. And it's been very difficult, at least from the government side to, to find ways to, to team with, with NSF and with, uh, with, with private organizations. I know the NOP is, is very successful and, and a very good way to do that, but I I guess I would turn turn the question around and 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 ask. I I need help on that as well. So I, I don't have a good answer. Um we have a, a couple of questions from the uh, Pete and Allison, kind of on the, the same nexus. Pete, do you want to ask yours? Um, why don't I let Allison love what we got Thanks, Pete. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Pete's question was, when considering the advantage, advantages of public-private partnerships, what are some of the biggest challenges to establishing and maintaining these partnerships? And then, as a follow-on, I had... Um, what are your biggest recommendations for successful partnerships to be maintained? So um, biggest challenges and or strongest recommendations for ensuring success. So I would think that the previous question also hits on one of the biggest challenges, which is getting the teams created. Often the biggest problem is there's a deadline and just getting the meeting set and the agreements and the paperwork and so forth, there's a lot of energy initially, and then you just sort of put the pieces together and decide, I don't think we can get this done by the deadline after all. Mm -hmm. And what frequently happens is you have some set of entities who have done something in the past, and so the paperwork is already put in place, and so those are the easy partners to continue to work with, which is fine in one sense, but it makes it really difficult for new entrants in the ecosystem mm -hmm. um, because they just don't have any of that in place. It makes it hard, if not impossible, to be a team member in a timely fashion. And so I would recommend, just like what I understand about what Almisha described a second ago, proactively putting the teamwork in place before you actually know what the opportunities are going to be is just necessary to actually meet the opportunities when they arise. And, and academia, as my first slide showed, is 
very frequently the best way to do that because it is just about impossible from experience to create teams without something already existing between a small company and the government. But you can have agreements in place between small companies and universities, and, and which take a little while, but they can be put in place proactively so that when the government opportunity comes along, the university and its infrastructure is able to respond quickly and bring those those industry partners, those small businesses in particular, in when there's just nobody they could have otherwise. Any other panel thoughts? Karen, is to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak um, to that a little more. I, my, from my experience, the biggest um, hurdle has been there's been between public pri part, private partnerships has been the time frame within the government side of usually by the time things are released and we're able to take any kind of action. It's a relatively short turnaround and trying to, and then coupled with that, we have to jump through a number of legal hurdles to enter into any kind of new partnership. So um, the best thing to do if you're planning on entering any kind of partnership is you do need to plan in advance and look out to the opportunity may not be available at this time, but what can you do if this opportunity becomes available? So that means working to build the teams in advance, and those teams would be comprised of the academic sectors, cooperative institutes, um, the commercial sectors, and maybe even other um, governmental sectors, and look at what you can do if this opportunity becomes available versus waiting for the opportunity to become available and then taking action. You definitely have to be proactive. Yeah. So we're at noon, I don't know if you want to keep on schedule. Okay, that's okay. Um, though Tim has his hand up, maybe just give the last word to Tim. Absolutely. Um, this isn't so much the last word, but a, a real difficulty in, in public-private partnerships that I've encountered, especially on, on, on the, the data side, is, is the, the difference between the, the need that we have for free, public, complete public access to data. Oh, yes, there you go. And, and on, on the private side, more of a, 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 a proprietary attitude yep. towards it. There you go. Mark, you are unmuted, so we can hear your mutterings. <laughs> no, that that's the uh, that's the that's the nub, because the, you're talking about a very different seascape of private academic government partnerships. Uh, it used to be the private sector was a, you know, they provided the gear or maybe they were an outsource recipient to now they're trying to make business on what used to be a government or maybe a government academic partnership. And uh, that's, that's really different than where we've been. And so you have very different values and governance structures in place where companies want a cost schedule and performance and delivering value to investors or shareholders, so academic wanting promotion and tenure. Uh, government trying to keep Congress happy or their constituents happy, et cetera. And, you know, just as I put in the in the chat, how do we make private proprietary data transparent, particularly in terms of quality control and quality assurance? Uh, and also we're for the ocean, we're looking at infinite time scales. We're looking for decades. And a lot of these little companies, if they go out of business because of market forces, we're left holding the bag uh, and critical time series all of a sudden become not available. Okay, thank you to our panelists. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. To, um, sir, Zoe. Yep. And so for those of you who are online, we will be back um, at one o'clock. Well, other really important. This, this the topic of this next panel, I think this committee has spent so much time thinking and talking about the topics of inclusivity. Um, and so it really, really important conversation. And I am thrilled that we're having such a robust panel on this topic. And so, Mona, I will hand it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Uba. Uh, should I, Kelly, should I unmute myself when I talk or no. should I just talk? Just talk. Just yeah. talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay, well, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Uba. Thanks uh, to all of our, uh, we have an amazing panel today, everyone. Um, so the thanks to all our panelists for um, for agreeing and for their willingness to participate in this uh, in this discussion with us and engage with us. We had a couple of cancellations um, due to a variety of reasons, but still we have a pretty solid um, uh, group of experts here with us. So uh, Christine Chin is from Lawrence uh, Livermore National Laboratory. Tori Garza from University of Washington. Brandon Jones from the National Science Foundation and Aradna Tripathi from U UCLA. And um, so we, how this is going to work, I am going to drop a link in the chat window to some definitions for diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, accessibility, because these are the terms that we'll be using throughout the conversation today. By the way, we, we have two hours so we can dive deep into this conversation. So um, we'll, uh, we'll I'll, I'll share some of those definitions. Each of our panelists is going to share a couple of remarks, um, uh, and then we'll have uh, we have a couple of discussion questions with the panelists. So I would suggest that you uh, once again use Slido to add your questions. We'll take the questions after a facilitated discussion with uh, with the panel that we have today. Um, so with that, uh, let me first invite Christine. Christine, are you with us? Hello, yes. Can folks hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, terrific. Um, let me start sharing my slides. Um, okay, are folks seeing something on the screen? Yes, we are. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, hello everyone. Thank you very much to um, the committee as well as the program organizers for having me here today. For my remarks, I'd like to briefly summarize uh, the main results of a paper that me and uh, several others pictured here uh, co-authored in 2022. In this paper, we examined publicly available data on funding rates by PI race and ethnicity at the National Science Foundation from 1999 to 2019. Um, and we found evidence of persistent racial funding disparities. Um, and after, after this, after just providing some high level highlights um, about this paper, I'd then like to offer some thoughts about how these funding trends impact science and society. So I look forward to discussing this more with the committee and the other panelists afterwards. So diving right into the funding trends. Uh, okay, so I think most of us know this, but uh, NSF receives many tens of thousands of proposals each year. And unfortunately, the NSF cannot fund them all. And so like most other funding agencies, the NSF undergoes a merit review process to try to figure out which of these uh, proposals to fund. And over the past two decades, overall funding rates have fluctuated between 22 and 34% due to changing budgets as well as overall proposal submission numbers. Now, despite these year to year fluctuations, when we look at funding rates based on PI race and ethnicity, we see patterns that are sometimes uh, remarkably stable. Here, we've normalized fluctuations in overall funding rate to see what differences remain. And we see that proposals by white PIs have been consistently funded above overall rates over uh, this period. In contrast, most other groups appear to be funded below overall rates most, if not all, of the time. Uh, Black and Asian PIs are consistently funded at lower rates, and you'll notice that some groups experience greater year-to-year -year variability than others, specifically for American Indian and Alaska Natives in purple, uh, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders here in orange. Now, that difference has to do with the number of proposals that each group submits, so I'd like to show what these uh, funding disparities represent in that context, in the context of total proposal numbers. And to do that, um, let's just look at one year, the year 2019, as an example. 
I'm going to show you a graphic where each box represents 10 proposals. And that means a five by five square is 250 proposals. And then four of those squares together as a block represents a thousand proposals. So in 2019, uh, White PI submitted 20,000 or so proposals. And this is what that number looks like in terms of boxes. And here's the number of proposals submitted by uh, other groups. Now, the overall funding rate in 2019 was 27.4%. If each group were funded at the exact same rate, we'd expect these many awards outlined in black uh, to be granted to each group. So if everyone were funded at this rate, 27.4% uh, in that previous plot that I was showing with all those lines, they would all, all those lines would just fall along the 0% relative funding rate line. However, this is what the actual breakdown of awards was for that year. Uh, white PIs were funded at a rate of 31.3%, a rate that is higher than all the other groups except for American Indian and Alaska Native PIs. Uh, and because of the differences in the total number of proposals that are submitted by each group, each percent difference in funding rate has a different uh, impact in terms of absolute award numbers. So for uh, white and Asian PIs who submit the most proposals, the funding rate differences represent hundreds of awards and surplus and in deficit. So uh, yes, so this is a snapshot of overall of trends in 2019. Um, I don't have time to go into detail on the other results we found, um, but I'll just say here that for some years, we were able to examine more detailed disaggregated data on trends by proposal type. So research proposals versus non-research proposals as well as by scientific discipline or NSF uh, directorate. And when we looked at those more detailed data for those years, we found that regardless of proposal type or scientific field, these trends generally remained. White PIs are funded above all overall rates and at rates higher than most other groups, regardless of proposal type or scientific field. So, uh, Yes, so coming back to uh, this schematic here, if we consider the annual number of awards in surplus and in deficit to each group um, for all of the years, not just 2019, you start to see uh, the extent of the cumulative impacts of these funding disparities. Uh, so this is really a story about cumulative advantages and disadvantages. Uh, a back of the envelope calculation using these totals and the average award size uh, given uh, suggests that this could represent several billions of dollars in unbalanced funding. Uh, given how important funding is to the success of a researcher's career and productivity, it's more than likely that these funding trends have played a huge role in why the racial demographics of STEM faculty have not meaningfully improved over the past few decades. Uh, these are compounding trends that again, play an instrumental role in uh, the stagnation of diversifying STEM. And I also want to emphasize uh, that these trends, oops, sorry, uh, also uh, impact uh, our body of scientific uh, knowledge. Uh, here it's worth noting that similar racial funding disparities have been reported elsewhere at the NIH, NASA, and the UK, various philanthropic funders, these trends are widespread. And similar to the NSF at the NIH, they've been happening since at least the year 2000 uh, with no changes to the magnitude of funding gaps for 20 years. At the NIH, they found that topics more commonly proposed by black PIs like community-oriented disease prevention, minority health, and ironically, racial health disparities were funded at lower rates compared to other topics. And not only that, that uh, they were also underfunded with much smaller grant sizes compared to white PIs. So basically, uh, we know less than what we should know about these particular topics because the funding structures at the NIH were set up to deprioritize such topics. During the pandemic, I read about how racial differences in mortality among COVID hospitalizations were occurring. Uh, say it bluntly, black and brown people were dying at higher rates compared to white people uh, when affected by COVID. And I can't help but wonder how things might have uh, been different had the NIH managed to close this black and white funding gap uh, over the last 20 years. So I asked the committee to consider these same questions in the context of ocean sciences 
in the context of climate change. What don't we know about the ocean because of these uh, funding disparities, racial funding disparities? And what does that mean for which communities benefit or do not benefit from our ocean science research? So to end uh, my remarks, I wish to emphasize the following. Uh, in the absence of inequalities, uh, our body of scientific knowledge would more closely reflect the spectrum of topics relevant to all of society. And so these racial funding disparities therefore uh, jeopardize the integrity of knowledge as a public good for all. And if we're gonna have any chance at uh, eliminating these uh, inequalities to make sure that science doesn't perpetuate or exacerbate existing social inequalities, then we have to go to the root of the problem. And that means we need to reorganize what causes inequality in the first place, which is unequal access to social prestige, insider knowledge, and perhaps most importantly, material resources, money and funding. Okay, so thanks very much. Uh, looking forward to discussing this further. Much gratitude, Christine. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Cory Garza. Cory, take it away, please. Uh, sure. uh, can I share my screen? Yes, you can. One second. Can you see that? Yes. Great. Great. So uh, thanks for having me here today. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, just about uh, my sort of take or perspective and how I approach um, working with diversity in the ocean sciences. Uh, and so I think some folks are familiar with this paper. It came out about five years ago. It's the uh, Bernard and Cooper doc uh, paper. It talks about no progress and diversity in 40 years. And really it's a summary of about 40 years of uh, diversity-based geoscience program uh, for minority students uh, in the U.S. and funded by uh, NSF. And this is one of the key figures that you want to take a look at here in that if you look in this center part here, race and ethnicity, the black line are sort of those who are getting PhD but who are, are classified as white. Uh, these lines down here are those getting PhDs but come out of groups that are considered minority groups in the U.S. So you actually have to zoom in over here in Table C to actually get a better sense of what those trends are like. And you can see uh, for geoscience PhDs, you know, Native American, non-Hispanic, Black, non-Hispanic, right, they're attaining PhDs at much lower rates than other groups. That blue line are Hispanic or Latino groups in the U.S. Uh, that are attaining uh, PhDs. You can see that that rate's still not high. And I've got that red circle there uh, for a reason. Uh, 2001, you'll notice that there were five Hispanic, you know, there were five Hispanic Latinos who got PhDs in the geoscience. And the reason I highlight that, I was one of those five. So it's helping to put a face to the data in this case here, like who was actually getting their PhDs, you know, back around that time. So when we talk about, you know, the ocean sciences, we also have to deal with some of the implicit biases that result in the lack of diversity. Um, you know, some of these uh, center around, you know, basic engagement and inclusion, you know, who we're bringing in to the ocean sciences, uh, resource allocation, how we're allocating resources, right, to individuals from different types of groups, and also our academic identity and the currencies, you know, that we work in. One of the things that I'm starting to get a bit out of is just solely focusing on student programs. You know, that's one of the more common things I see whenever I ask someone how they're going to deal with their DI issue. It's always they're going to they're going to develop another student program. So you see, we have a lot of those. Uh, as my colleague Brandon Jones is here today will tell you, you also have to deal with the environment, right, that you're putting students into as well. Because if you don't improve that, they're not going to stay. And so I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in my comments today. When we talk about you know, engagement and inclusion, this is usually the first step right, for somebody coming into the ocean sciences. You know, often there can be a really unclear understanding by those outside of the ocean sciences, you know, what we actually do. You know, if I were going to, in a room full of ocean scientists, they're going to describe ocean sciences based on their very specific research area that they look at subsurface microbes in particular parts of the Pacific, or you know, I'm a marine ecologist, I might talk about that. I look at predator-prey interactions. You know, I might have other colleagues that talk about doing modeling of fisheries. So you can get a really unclear impression, but if you look at, for example, the biomedical sciences, they have very clear messaging about what they do. You know, it's messaging that resonates right, with the student populations that they're trying to get to. And so the other thing that we, we struggle with is this ineffective messaging and engagement that we have right, with students from underrepresented groups, particularly that early undergraduate stage. Uh, even some of the imagery that we use, this is an image that I've been using for a number of years. 
Uh, on the left there, kind of your classic graduate school brochure, a bunch of guys, you know, hauling heavy gear on an A-frame there. You know, I went and Google construction jobs, and that's actually the first picture uh, that pops up right there. If you're a student coming from, say, a blue-collar background where, you know, you have a history of construction work in your family, these don't look any different, right, from one another. You're also sending different types of messages, right, to you know, an individual who's looking at this before you even get to talk to them. One, it's heavy manual labor. If you're physically disabled, you're out of luck, you have to be a guy. Right, there's all types of messages that you're sending just through the imagery that we use. And because of that, you can often have this lack of community and belonging if you don't fit into these very specific models, right, that we put out to, out to the world about what it looks, what it means to look like an ocean scientist. Right, but even when we get, you know, students in the door, they often also struggle with finding their footing in there. This is a paper by Hofstra et al. in 2020. It's called the Diversity Innovation Paradox. It's actually talking about to a large extent, how once you get graduate students from minority backgrounds into graduate programs, they actually, when you do a retrospective analysis of their theses over 40 years, they're actually innovating at much, much higher rates, but they're rewarded less often with that reward being they weren't getting faculty jobs. Because right? what was happening when you go back and you analyze that is they were doing work that wasn't the norm for the time. So often because they were doing work that different, it tended to be grounded in the fact that Oh, because they don't know how we do work in our particular discipline here. So they're not actually getting rewarded here. So it's this diverse innovation paradox and in that, that that innovation, it isn't getting recognized until much, much later on uh, in this case. Yeah, and then resource allocation is another one, you know, where we struggle here. Uh, and this implicit bias pops up, you know, who we collaborate with. Right? We often talk about the old boys network. You know, I'm a marine ecology. There tend to be a small series subset of schools that only work with each other right in that realm. And so it can be very exclusive. And equity and who receives funding, you know, this just came up in the previous talk, certain institutions have a tendency to get more funding uh, than others. Even internal uh, barriers that we face, you know, I was at a minority serving institution for the last 15 years of my career in there, and it can actually be really tough, right, once you even get the funding in there um, to actually get the internal resources to support the types of work that you wanna do with the funding that you might bring in from an external source. Right. And the other way, you know, that this crops up as well, as you probably heard this term parachute uh, science, you know, this is a paper by Stephanudis et al. in 2021, and they're actually using the coral reef research community as an example of where this kind of resource allocation issue, right, pops up here, where the majority of coral research, when you look at publications, it's being conducted by Western institutions. You know, just for example, of the two of the top 10 countries in the world in producing papers on coral research are Germany and Canada. Right, countries that actually they themselves don't have coral reefs right in their territorial waters there. I mean, one thing that happens is, is they noted here that local researchers and their knowledge right, are often excluded. So even though you've got researchers coming in with lots of funding and resources, that local knowledge base and the people who have that knowledge aren't being included. And so it creates a resource and accessibility right, and equity. And what happens is that then feeds into your future hires in the discipline. And so really a big part of what we have to start thinking about is how we reframe our science identity, like how we want to actually sort of frame ourselves as scientists. Now, I have this quote up here because it's actually a quote from a colleague of mine uh, years ago. You know, I'd asked him about taking over uh, an education program that I was getting ready to move on for. And the feedback I got was, I'm not an educator, I'm a researcher. And I was like, well, your faculty member tends to be part of your job, right? He's also being an educator. Right. But this is a, a photo of a colleague of mine, Josh Coha from Rutgers, and he's a really good example of someone who's kind of reframed his identity. Right? A lot of people know him as somebody who's got an active you know, glider program down in Antarctica, does really cutting edge work, you know, telemetry work with penguins down there. But he also takes a lot of that and uses it to try to understand like how he can engage audiences in polar sciences. Right? This is a program uh, that we ran for a number of years where we were actually taking polar data right, from Antarctica and then working with elementary school teachers to help them Right, craft lesson plans where they could actually use the science of the polar regions right, to engage you know, student populations and student groups that wouldn't normally have access to that. And so it's a really great example of how doing this type of outreach work, it actually doesn't sort of cut down on your science. right? They can actually be seamlessly merged with one another. And that's really where we need to start going in the ocean sciences. And so finally, you know, why do we want to change our research model and how we're, how we're doing research in the ocean sciences? Well, one, it improves the diversity of those that we're engaging right, and STEM as a whole, right, we're bringing in new perspectives, right, new ideas, right, the solutions to those thorny problems we've been dealing with for the last few decades might be in a community that you haven't historically engaged with, or it might be at a university that you haven't historically, right, engaged with, and when we do that, it results in new ways of conducting research and the types of, of knowledge bases that we can sort of form in the ocean sciences. 
So thanks, and I think I'll be coming back a little later. Yes, thank you so much, Corey. Next up, we have Brendan. Thank you, Mona. I'm gonna get started here. All right, is that visible? Yes. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, obviously, I'm at NSF, so uh, I'm going to be primarily in listening mode today. But I did want to come uh, with some information um, as it relates to what we're doing in the Directorate for Geosciences around this broadening participation issue. And so uh, what I'll be presenting is not ocean specific, but it is uh, applicable to you know, all disciplines in STEM, obviously, um, well, with the earth system sciences being um, in the forefront in, in what we're talking about today. So uh, I'm in a, a division within the directorate called the RISE division, and you see that description there. It stands for Research Innovation Synergies and in Education, um, and it's the interdisciplinary home. I'll, I'll have that a little bit more on, on a, a slide coming up for uh, the types of work that uh, are needed around education uh, workforce development, but also uh, big issues like climate, um, uh, global uh, related um, activities as it relates to earth system science and, and things of that nature. So I sit with um, other team members in uh, what is referred to as the Education and Broadening Participation Incubator. And so that's what I'll be presenting on um, today. So the mission of that incubator is all about talent development and broadening participation uh, for the earth system sciences or geosciences. And um, we have four kind of sub themes or sub areas that we focus on um, that you see there at the bottom, sharing knowledge, applying consistent methods, promoting promising practices and developing um, innovative ideas. And I would probably say um, this aligns with what Corey uh, kind of finished his his talk with uh, that we seek to build a community of practice across the earth system sciences uh, to um, engage in this kind of work and also help develop uh, necessary changes at, at different levels uh, that will help us uh, take full advantage of all the human capacity that's out there that is needed for the issues that we're facing today. The goals, um, again, uh, just breaking these down, we seek to, in everything that we do in, in that incubator, whether it be a program or, or um, internal activities across the agency, um, is to emphasize broad and participation elements in everything. So, and oftentimes in the community, uh, people are you know, saying, well, this is a, or, or they see uh, broad and participation activities as something extra that they have to do. And as soon as it is categorized that way, it becomes a burden when really there are probably a whole lot of things that people are already doing that um, just can be elevated, re, re, um, we'll say remarketed or rebranded um, as broadening participation activities. Um, but also there is work that needs to be done to, to make sure these, these elements are um, uh, raised to the level that they should be. Interdisciplinary uh, home for broadening participation work oftentimes um, scientists need to partner with social scientists or um, educational specialists or those experts that are not in their disciplinary um, arena. And um, given that NSF is a federal agency, we are uh, unfortunately still siloed a lot of times by our budget structure as well as some other um, kind of um, uh, structural issues. Uh, but uh, this particular incubator and rise as a division is a interdisciplinary home for the community. Okay, um, we will have um, areas and programs and um, you know initiatives that uh, allow the community to submit ideas, uh, proposals, um, uh, and engage with us to to move things forward. Uh, so we are excited about it being an interdisciplinary home. Also, the information dissemination and place for innovation. Um, gets to that latter point I made about building a, a community of practice. We see rise and specifically for what we're talking about today, we see our education and broadening participation incubator 
as a, a virtual maker space where uh, the ideas can come in and the resources are available in an equitable way and everyone has a voice, everyone has a value and um, uh, we just come in to, to brainstorm and then move things forward. So uh, programmatically, when it comes to our ecosystem, I'll use that word, um, we have several flagship programs and then we have other smaller initiatives that connect to the ecosystem to build this, um, this full, more holistic approach to so supporting students. And some of what I will say uh, basically repeats with what Corey was saying about uh, the ne necessity for building an inclusive or a welcoming culture. So we have three main thrusts in our ecosystem, uh, career development, champions, and then culture. And career development is the, more about the traditional um, preparing of uh, undergrads, graduates, or, or those that are early careers and um, upskilling them and moving them into the workforce. Champions is about the professional development needed for many individuals like yourselves who are already established experts in their fields in different entities, different parts of the research enterprise. But what is it maybe that uh, we did not receive in our academic training or even our professional training that uh, has us misaligned with the needs of the early career folks that are coming in now in 2024 and moving on. And then the culture piece is uh, like uh, what Corey was mentioning. What is it about how we're socializing and where we're socializing our early career people into academia, federal, private, nonprofit, what have you, in the research enterprise, and uh, that that is not welcoming, or things that can be changed uh, to allow them to, to, to bring all of who they are so that they can be fully um, engaged in, in the work that is necessary. And with that, we have um, three flagship programs that touch on each one of these main thrusts. For career development, we have the Geopaths program. That is temporarily paused, um, but we are, and stay tuned because we want to engage with the community to um, develop the next phase of Geopaths. It's almost 10 years old, so we're at kind of at this decadal review point in the program. For developing champions, even at the institution level, um, as well as the faculty level or expert level, we have the Golden Program, and that is still it stands for Geoscience Opportunities for Leadership and Diversity. Um, that's still viable. And for the last two years, we had um, the Cultural Transformation and Geoscience Community Program, uh, which focused on the culture of the geosciences. That's currently suspended because we are working on a new initiative, which I can't really talk about in detail, uh, that takes CTGC or this culture program to the next level. So, um, Last few slides, I wanted to pull out a, a prime example uh, from one of our golden, or actually a golden suite of uh, awards we made a couple of years ago. These were eager awards. Um, and so uh, if you're unfamiliar, those are kind of the exploratory awards, um, a, a mechanism that we use at NSF. And we made the suite of awards. You see the column on the all the way on the right. These are the institutions that those awards went to. But across the top, you see the themes uh, that each of the projects focused on, and some uh, projects focused on multiple themes, but I wanted to highlight those two kind of in the middle, uh, in that gold highlight. Uh, most of the projects were looking at mentorship, right, which is what we wanted to see and it aligns with the, the, the program goals of Golden, um, professional development at that expert or mentor advisor professor level. But the institutional policy projects, we are keeping a close eye on. These are projects that are looking at um, institutional policies related to tenure and promotion, related to workload, and the disproportionate weight that in academia that workload fall, falls on women um, and uh, faculty of color, uh, and what tenure and promotion values beyond publications and grant dollars, all the other work that um, is necessary um, and and as uh, Corey mentioned, uh, the the individual said, "Well, I'm not a you know I'm I'm a researcher. I'm not a, an educator or whatever that statement was." So looking at our value systems, and that's one thing that I would like to emphasize for the committee 
uh, to think about what what is it about our value systems and the ratings and rewards uh, that can be adjusted. So um, finishing up the last two things, as I mentioned in our ecosystem, we have the programmatic ecosystem, we have these main projects, but we also have a suite of projects to fill in the gaps so that we are, are doing our best not to leave leaky places in the ecosystem where uh, people can fall out. And so we have several supplement programs uh, for veterans, for people with disabilities um, in the geosciences, for post backs um, who have finished their bachelor's but maybe haven't really decided to move on to grad school yet. We don't want them to slip out. So we have a mechanism to catch them at that post back phase. And we also have an experience for teachers. And we see that as part of building those champions uh, that can help uh, seal up the cracks and build out the community. So the last slide, um, I just wanted to leave this as consideration for, for all of us. Uh, if you don't know Gus Speth, he's an environmental lawyer. Uh, I think he was one of the founders of the National Research Defense Council, I think. I have to go back and look. But anyway, this quote resonates with me, and I try to use it as much as I can. Um, and basically, Gus is saying he used to think in, early in his career that it was all about um, the natural and physical focus on the natural physical system and the, the research science that is traditional. But what he's realizing now that it's really about the individuals, it's about our perspectives as humans, um, and it's about what we bring to the research enterprise that will help other humans uh, be optimized so that we can um, uh, take advantage of the full human capacity to address these issues, as I mentioned before. So I'll stop there and um, look forward to the conversation. Okay, thanks, Brandon. Uh, next, we have Aradna Tripathi. Aradna, welcome. <laughs> Aradna, we can see your presentation. All you have to do is unmute yourself. <laughs> Great. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Uh, here we go. Yeah. So thanks for your time today. My name is Radna Tripathi. My pronouns are she, they. I'm a professor at UCLA, uh, where my expertise is in paleoceanography, paleoclimate, and geochemistry. Uh, I have also worked with others here to found the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science, which focuses on reparative climate action and environmental justice. One part of the center, CDLS Oceans, is focused on equity in ocean sciences and ocean justice. And part of my motivation for forming this is because I wouldn't actually be here in academia if it wasn't for opportunities for access. My family's from the Fiji Islands with ancestry from India due to the colonial histories of both places. My mom's parents were sharecroppers, they grew sugarcane, she was the first generation in her village to be literate. And in the US, there were a number of issues my family faced as immigrants. We've had to be resilient and often our hopes for the next generation have been what have carried us. Now, I learn about stories like those of my family, my own, so often from our students today. But what I see that is different um, is that in my case, I had these remarkable opportunities for access. I participated in programs at Cal State LA, a minority serving institution, and UC Santa Cruz, which is now also an MSI. At these places, I had advisors, mentors, role models, learning communities with supportive peers. These included things like a women of color research cluster that Professor Angela Davis set up at UC Santa Cruz when I was a grad student working with Jim Zakos, who uh, is here. You know, that meant that I was able to become one of three Asian Pacific Islander women to get a PhD in the US in my field in 2002. You know, those statistics that we were seeing earlier. And the various formative experiences that I've had have been part of the inspiration for the center. So what I'm gonna do today is describe how through a focus on evidence-based interventions and inclusive, equitable ocean science, we can bend towards justice. We can advance stewardship in ways that are that are meaningful. And so we do this through support of uh, an ecosystem of, of fellows. Uh, one of our fellows, Demarcus Robinson, uh, 
from FAMU, uh, where he's an undergrad, is now a PhD student at UCLA in ocean biogeochemistry. He just published with other co-authors the first US ocean justice strategy. Ocean justice derives from environmental justice. And the vision for from the report is actually described here. Equitable access, meaningful engagement, recognizing the value of indigenous engagement, expanding and improving ocean education to improve our workforce and also to build knowledge. So there are a whole series of recommendations and outcomes that come from this. So the work that is being done right now that you all are discussing, I think, is really at a meaningful time. So the work that we do with the center draws on uh, the, the scholarship of National Academy of Education faculty member Sylvia Hurtado and others on effective practices for inclusive science based on a meta-analysis of effective programs in the biomedical sciences. And that's what this figure shows here. So drawing on all the, these elements, the work that the center does is really largely focused, although not exclusively focused, on indigenous partners. The center is actually based um, in part in our American Indian Studies Center, as well as the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, the Institute of Environment and Sustainability, and other units. Uh, part of the reason why we do this is because UCLA is a land-grant institution, so that has its own meaning to Native peoples. Uh, we are settlers here. We're located on the lands of the Gabrielino Tongva people who are still present today and their stewardship of the lands and waters of Los Angeles are, are have really been critical for our own presence in this uh, in this area. Now, indigenous communities, communities of color and low income communities in many regions, including coastal ones, are considered frontline communities. And so our work, with CDLS Oceans focuses on these communities. We do this through our diversification of ocean sciences, but also through the research that we do, which is community engaged. We emphasize the social context of what we do because of the interconnected nature of the different systems at play and the way they intersect when it comes to the oceans and environment. From vulnerabilities to rising sea level, storm surges, to the community expertise that holds often vital information for environmental resilience and health. So the ethos for the work we do is to be deeply respectful, reparative, and to engage in reciprocity as we build relationships. So our model for cultivating leadership with the center is a network leadership model. We cut across departments, colleges, and universities with the fellows we support. Our ecosystem of fellowships program supports community fellows. We support faculty fellows. And most importantly, we support the next generation, early career fellows from high school through postdoctoral, people from two-year and four-year institutions. Our work brings together different interventions from community building, mentoring, team-based research, community engagement, technical and higher skills training through co-curricular workshops. Now, we've supported at this stage more than 250 fellows across green steam fields at the center. About 20% of them are in oceans related areas. Our levels of diversity uh, are quite high. That's what's shown this, uh, this figure on the lower right from a, a, a survey a, a couple of years ago. Now, this type of work is really important to be grown and sustained at multiple institutions because we're doing this work in a field where there's a growing diversity gap. This figure from Steve Boss at the University of Arkansas compares demographic trends in the country to diversity trends in the workforce. This matters from thinking about, you know, who are effective ambassadors to communities when it comes to ocean stewardship to who gets a seat at decision-making tables. Um, and what's interesting and sad to see is that in many fields, including ours, even though the diversity of the country has increased dramatically, the diversity of the workforce hasn't kept up. In fact, it's actually equivalent to levels of diversity in the US during the Jim Crow era some 70 years ago. Now, <clears throat> what I think is also important to note is that to in, with the center's model, in addition to very directly working on addressing those demo demographic issues, we intentionally work to support mentorship 
from people of different generations, activists, community leaders, people in higher education, people working in different sectors. We center on the resilience of those who are systematically marginalized. So we uplift, resource, and support people who might otherwise be expending enormous effort to persist in ocean science training or to work on ocean advocacy issues. We support them with an equity lens and we build community around them. At the same time, we motivate and equip and support those who are passionate about the issues, who see that there, there is a convergence of interests so that they can also share in doing the reparative work that's needed. So the center is for everyone. We don't exclude anybody from applying. And there's and there's many aspects of our work. I jokingly say we're like an octopus. The community and tribally led research projects we do are one heart of our work. This includes a service learning partnership with the Amamutsun Land Trust that I'll uh, describe more in the next slide, but also uh, partnerships with the Northern Chumash Tribal Council for their proposed Chumash, Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, um, to work with the Bay Foundation and Heal the Bay, who have now with us, uh, we've supported public participation of hundreds of community members in sampling efforts in marine protected areas and non-MPAs, areas where there's seagrass and kelp restoration. We've supported over 30 undergraduate and graduate students um, just in the last three years. Um, and they've been participating in service learning and research. We've also been sharing revised curricula to support inclusive classrooms. And this has impacted over 700 students. And we provide field-based oceanographic experiences. And this has now occurred for about 100 students. In our work with the Amamutsun Land Trust, we collaborate to support research with tribal stewards around tribal priorities, around land and coastal and marine stewardship. This includes sharing different knowledge systems to support community power, community health, climate, climate adaptation and resilience, from training in cultural resource management, geochemistry, environmental genomics, drone mapping, um, to assessing the impacts of stewardship and the access of, of climate models and ocean models. There's all sorts of work that's being done. The work is also being brought by tribal members into a youth leadership program where uh, people in higher education are sharing language and culture uh, relating to stewardship from kind of Western marine stem and also from traditional knowledge systems. So with that, I wanna acknowledge that with the work we're doing in centering equity in ocean science, we've been inspired by the pathbreaking work led at HBCUs uh, by Dr. Bob Bullard, Dr. Beverly Wright, and also others like Ashanti Johnson with the MS PhD programs program. And we continued to be inspired by work that's being done at minority serving institutions and non MSIs around the country as we learn of it. There's also a really exciting vision from the next generation of marine scientists, including Dr. Tiara Moore from Black and Marine Science. I mean, you know, this, there's this sense that actually there's a lot more work that's there below the surface of what we than what we might otherwise recognize. So that's what gives us hope. We also believe that our ceiling is for the next generation, their floor, but it is critically important to sustain and grow the type of work that people here are discussing. So I look forward to the discussion on how we can do that. Thanks. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Aradna. So panelists, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and I encourage the committee to uh, ask questions using Slido. So our, our statement of task reads that we ought to uh, uh, identify novel opportunities to uh, regarding ocean related views inspired social solutions oriented research and innovation. And we ought to think about opportunities and strategies to promote innovative multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral approaches. So my question to the panel is, uh, what kind of improvements are required in the research infrastructure to foster equity and justice in ocean sciences? Are there any frameworks for uh, use inspired transdisciplinary research that the committee should consider? And um, if there are, could you provide some examples of any kind of robust community um, university partnerships uh, that that the that 
the committee should consider. So I threw a lot in there, but basically the gist is, are there, um, what kind of improvements are necessary in the research infrastructure to facilitate the kind of innovation in ocean sciences that we, that we seek to foster? Um, maybe I'll, I'll bring something up. I think there's a, a really important model that actually comes from um, Dr. Beverly Wright, who I'd mentioned. She talks about the community place where um, university and community expertise um, and is is kind of at the same level, right? Um, and so there's an opportunity for university res researchers to think about how can we support the work that's being prioritized by communities uh, and work to really execute that vision, but also do that in a way where community members um, are uh, elevated, you know, with respect to the work they're being resourced. Um, often there are young people, uh, well, people of all generations who are, you know, in higher education or who are interested in work opportunities and can be supported for in doing this type of work. So I think that that model, seeing that kind of developed um, and implemented in ocean sciences at a broader range of institutions would be really key. And, you know, I think there that there, um, there are ideas we've been thinking about based on what we've heard from our community partners about, for example, having mobile field labs that, you know, they have that are on traditional lands so that people can sample for environmental DNA in the coastal environment um, and do sample processing, you know, and also have the ability to look at data to see how conservation and mitigation measures are making a difference. That's just one example, you know, but it's, then that means that the research infrastructure is not just sitting in the university, but there's some of it that's also sitting in the community. Um, yeah. Thank you, Radna. Others? Um, I'd like to hang a lantern on Rodna's suggestion here, which was really excellent. Um, I guess I'll share that um, at a recent conference where I talked about the uh, NSF funding, dis racial funding disparities, a, uh, a scientist who's also a tribal member approached me and to discuss specifically the trends for American Indian and Alaska Native PIs. And she wondered about how, uh, well, she shared with me that she noticed that when she visited various proposal calls uh, put forth by NSF and other funding agencies, that none of the topics that were being, that proposals were being asked for seemed to be relevant to her community back at home. Um, there was a mismatch between the science that the funders fund and the science that indigenous scholars like herself wanted to pursue. And so I wonder, uh, in a very similar way to what Aradna is proposing, I wonder if there are ways for funders to better, uh, uh, yeah, fund the topics that uh, these scholars are interested in pursuing that actually bring back benefits to their communities. Um, so there has to be a way to, to fit that into um, uh, funding infrastructure in some way to do that better than it's currently happening right now. Uh, thank you so much, Christine. Any other thoughts, Corey or Brandon? Sure, sure, I can go. Um, you know, uh, the funding one's an important one. I, I was actually a postdoc at an NSF Crest site at Cal State LA for two years. You know, and, you know, that was, you know, running at the same time as the STCs were spinning up, but at, at a much, much lower funding rate. You know, they were expected to have this research impact, but maybe a quarter of the funding that an SCC was getting. So I remember, you know, back then, you know, we couldn't buy the infrastructure, right? So we couldn't do the capacity building that, that she needed to do. We often had to, you know, go to our provost and our deans, you know, to get that additional money. Whereas, you know, an, someone, you know, housed at an SDC, um, you know, wouldn't have to do that in that case, right? And that creates an additional burden because oftentimes, you know, the type of work's being done out, out of minority serving institutions. You know, it's one of those things we tend to overlook is they're often already doing in community work. 
for there. And really what they need is the funding infrastructure, the personnel infrastructure right, to carry it off. Right? It was unusual to have a, a postdoc at a Cal State campus. It just wasn't a common thing back then, but you know, it, it actually helped us. You know, we actually, the small group, there were three or four of us back then actually helped to do that. And so I think that's something to think about it as well, that if this is a, something that you know NSF as a whole wants to elevate, that you can't expect an MSI to do it on a shoestring budget. Right with shoestring facilities and shoestring personnel. Um, yeah, we can do it. It's just it makes the work a lot harder uh, to do it. And frankly, it's unnecessary to have to do that. Right when we we can show this work because Crest work. I mean, that was a really great program. I mean, a number of us are faculty. You know, we're working at NOAA. You know, working with Cal Fish and Wildlife. Right, and so on. So we show you can do it. You can go into communities you don't traditionally work with. They can do really impactful work. But I, I can imagine if that particular center and others like it were funded at the rate of an STC, I can only imagine what that impact, you know, would have been. Yeah, just, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just quickly, uh, just the, uh, this this line, and thank you, um, Rodney, for starting the the reply, this this line of response um, is, it resonates heavily with a lot of what we've been talking about in um, our incubator at, at NSF. And so to that last point, you know, Corey was talking about the institutional capacity, not, not the researchers or the faculty or, or preparing the students, but the folks in the sponsored research office or the lack of them, or um, all of those that are, are part of that support system to assist faculty and students with their awards or, or submitting proposals or applications and things of that nature. There's a huge disparity um, across our academic institutions in, in that regard. NSF has a program called Granted. It's really new, uh, but that's its focus. It's, it's not on the science, but it's on all of those support systems, particularly at emerging research institutions and how to bolster them so that because it's not about the intellectual prowess, there's there's intellectual excellence at every institution, right? It's evenly distributed across the human uh, through the population. But as Corey mentioned, that some institutions don't just don't have the capacity, and I believe the pandemic unveiled a lot of that. Um, and and so, how do we capitalize on that? And it's something maybe for the committee to help NSF even move um, a, a bit more forward on. Last thing I'll say on the, on the other point that um, uh, Rodney and Christine brought up is the, the constraints that, and it's like NSF has a lot of flexibility in the federal government, but it's still a federal agency. And so lots of times we at NSF have to uh, be in alignment with the rest of the government. Um, and that constrains us. However, Organizations like professional societies or like HHMI or something like that that operate in the boundaries, we can partner with them to help move forward in some areas that we might be con constrained on if we were just to move forward solely. Um, so just just a, a how to um, Aradna's and Christine's what on that part. Okay, Aradna, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think that the one other thing that I would add to this discussion is that the, is the importance of actually having sustainable support for research infrastructure. So particularly the human and cultural elements of doing this work. Um, you know, I, I, I know that there's a lot of interest in kind of exploratory funding, seed funding. Corey talked about CREST as a model. That's a really, really important model, right? Science and technology centers based at MSIs that have long-term support. The importance of having those types of centers, um, particularly at MSIs and particularly at programs that are focusing on broadening participation in the ocean sciences, that's key. NOAA has also examples of this, although they had like only a, a certain number of slots, you know? And so with that, you know, it is key to grow that type of work. The other side of it is that um, looking for funding that lasts for even longer than this. There are expectations typically around higher education institutions um, uh, incorporating these into their budgets. But, you know, given what's been happening with the politicization of, of higher education funding and, and so forth, and, you know, the shifts on this from the public to um, student sector, 
you know, that's that's not something that's likely going to going to happen given all the asks. So there might be interesting areas for thinking when thinking about kind of public private partnerships for federal agencies to provide seed funding, but then maybe engaging in their relationships with philanthrop with private philanthropy and getting endowments for long-term funding, you know, things like that. I just came from a, a conference on higher education and climate. And there some of the folks that I'm mentioning, leaders at MSIs, particularly HBCUs, endowment, you know, to make sure that the work's sustained for the next generations is really, really key. Otherwise you have a shift in leadership and work gets defunded and then that's that. Thank you all so much. Um, so my next question, and by the way, these questions are inspired by uh, a, a subcommittee of this committee, and that includes Carlos, uh, Kiersey, Kristen, Peter, Shannon, and Shini. So thank you so much for your contributions. But my next question to the panel is, uh, is related to workforce development. So um, we identify, um, there are reports that have identified a plethora of skills that are required for young people to be successful in the day and age today, uh, ranging from cultural competency to communication skills. All of this is in addition to the core competencies that we require students in ocean or atmospheric sciences, royal sciences, so are there newer kind of frameworks, workforce development models that we should be looking at to accommodate uh, the skill sets that are needed to um, address uh, these, these the problems uh, that, that we have, that we face as a society, um, and, and inspire people to, um, to work in, on, on problems that, that they feel energized to solve? So are there any examples of uh, workforce development models, newer frameworks that we should be looking at? I, I, can, I, mean, I was in a cooperative science center from NOAA for about seven years, uh, you know, and that is a work, that's really a workforce development uh, program. Uh, you know, one of the things that they do is they emphasize training students, you know, in skill sets, you know, that NOAA is gonna be needing, you know, in the next century or so. Um, but there can also, you know, coming back to the last conversation, there can also be a mismatch in the infrastructure that the institution has at the capacity to support that <clears throat> training. You know, just to kind of give you an example, you know, when I was rotating out of my previous position to here, the new science and technology focus areas coming out of NOAA for training were you know, autonomous systems, uh, AI, uh, big data, genomics. A lot of institutions being supported through that type of center, they didn't have quite the, they didn't have the infrastructure to, you know, support that. Some degree because even though you might have the money or the funding coming in on the grant right to purchase the equipment you wouldn't have the long-term infrastructure so for example where i was at you wouldn't purchase a sequencing a sequencer because there would be no way to support a sequencing facility we just wouldn't have the capacity to do it you know that said though it does highlight i think for students you know early career professionals early on the types of skills that you need because they're going to be the non-traditional uh, skills. One of the things you know, I ran into is, as an educator for 15 years, it was uh, the stereotype coming in that you're going to be off on a sailboat, you know, swimming with marine mammals, you know, going to the tropics. And, you know, and there was this hard reality that, you know, later on in these students' careers, is they're, they're being told they're getting ready to graduate. Well, you really need a background in programming and, you know, communication because that's where the skill sets are at. And so sometimes the way that we think about engaging people early on doesn't really match up with what they need going out because there tends to be this, there can be this fear that if you present the discipline as too scientific, too technically oriented, there's a lot of hard skills you need there that it's going to discourage people right, from going into it. And I think, you know, one of the things we need are, are better models. And there are some of those models, I think, coming out of those, those NOAA centers, but like, how do you start to support those models with the actual infrastructure, right, those institutions to start to ease in that next generation and into the ocean science workforce? Yeah, I think I think to um, complement also what Corey has said, I wanted to highlight that um, you know there there are frameworks out there uh, that talk about the importance of kind of problem based learning um, in preparing people, and I would really strongly you know encourage um, the the use of that. That is really a way to then um, I think motivate some of the kind of 
harder technical skills, you know, or the relatability of fields that people might not otherwise feel relates to them. Um, I've seen that be a really kind of strong motivator and the amount of growth that I've seen in in students has been has been remarkable. There's a, a lot of uh, and a liter STEM educational literature on this. Um, I also put into the chat a link to a paper that was collaborative with colleagues at Conservation International and Arizona State University, um, where we actually asked employers in the conservation field what sets of competencies do they need, right? What are they finding that they need and where where are their gaps for people coming in, but also people to become and go into a leadership role so that people have, you know, a kind of this trajectory of the workplace. And, you know, of course, they're the foremost primary things are the scientific proficiency, the theory-based knowledge, technical and analytical skills. That's a priority. But also, in addition to that, problem-solving skills, practical experience, project management, writing abilities, communication skills, and so forth. And so this was just a short letter that we that we wrote kind of highlighting, highlighting that. Um, and that then allows us to kind of think about what the next generation of curriculum should look like, right? To prepare, uh, prepare people. Any other reflections just, from that? Yeah, just um just building on that that point that Aradna said uh here in GEO, we funded it's probably like eight over the last eight years. Um, some work at the Jackson School of Geosciences and um, at UT. So obviously that's not ocean, but there are a lot of lessons learned uh, because the workshops, there were a series of workshops focused on undergraduates and geo and graduates. And the format of the workshops was to bring the private sector in with the geoscientists, so to Arada's point, and ask um, with with the data showing that the majority of uh, students coming out of STEM with STEM degrees are not tracking into academia. And so what does the private sector require um, as far as skill building for individuals that they're interested in? And there was clear misalignment with what the private sector needed and what students were being prepared to do. Um, and so what do we do with that? You know, how, so NSF needs some help. Um, as well as designing programs uh, that can meet all of those needs and, and to build those holistic skills exactly as Aradna was listing there and Corey was mentioning also. So I wanted to offer that. I'm, I'm gonna try to find um, those reports and, and the websites and put them in the chat. Okay, thank you so much. Corey or Christine, anything else? Aradna, did you help? Yeah, gonna... yeah oh. go ahead, Corey. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna add to you, you know, Brandon's you know, that the non-academic you know, pathway, I think it's an important one. I recall yours about four or five years ago. You know, I used to be on the board of director for SACNAS, which is Society for Advancement of Chicanos Native American Science. You know, we made a visit to you know, headquarters and, you know, the other uh, folks who are also on the board in leadership, they were actually surprised here from NOAA. I think it was at the time, like 40% of their workforce was contract. They were contractors, you know, in the workforce. And that was something, you know, they weren't quite expecting to hear just because they had historic focus you know, in a society like Sacknes was focusing on going and being, you know, a faculty researcher at a, you know, at a big R1. And so hearing that was a bit of an eye opener for us. So I think, you know, finding out ways to highlight these different pathways into the workforce, right, as you're developing people through the student, postdoc, you know, early career professional pipeline, I think that's really important. You have to really, you do need to start to develop that. Yeah, I think that there's, uh, I think, Relating to something that's been brought up in the in the chat by Katie and Derbitson about workforce development, that there's also a need for more postdoc early career researcher specific. I yeah, I think that's that's really key and and something that's also specific to needs from ocean oriented folks. You know, one of the things that the center has been looking at is where there are we've mapped out uh, co curricular opportunities uh, on our campus and other campuses that are our partners. Um, for both technical skills and higher skills. So basically, where are there workshops on financial management, you know, mental health, uh, conflict resolution, coding in R. Um, but when we also see that there are gaps for particular educational career stages, 
or gaps, you know, with respect to content, then what we do is we work to bring in facilitators for, you know, that, that particular area. And so, you know, with that, we've also started looking in you kind know, of different places. Um, and I, I've seen this specifically benefit our Oceans Fellows. Um, like we work often with American Indian Studies and refer our undergraduate and particularly graduate students and postdocs to sit in on courses on working with indigenous communities so that they can learn about the protocols, right? In a way where they're getting a very structured course, something that is um, at a high level, has case studies, has theoretical frameworks and talks about this with respect to many different contexts. Um, and I also want to emphasize that, you know, wellness, mental health, financial management, things like machine learning, AI, you know, the things that we know are really kind of key for doing well as a, as a researcher in any sector that um, in oceans kind of going forward, those are also things to kind of be, be, be looking at offerings for. I'm going to bring the committee in. Peter, I'm going to come to you. Can I first go to Shannon? Shannon, would you like to ask a question? You have two. You can ask one right okay. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with the first one. Yeah, I'm really curious about this um, diversity and facial paradox. And so why is that persisting? What's kind of going on in institutions culturally? Kind of what is What are some of the institutional or incentive structures that are there in place that are not rewarding innovation, which is like, I think it's like, it seems like that's what we want out of our institutions, right? So curious about what's, say a little more about that. Who wants to go? Could, could you repeat the, the question? I had a little trouble hearing that. Yeah, the volume's a little low. I'll on that, that end. Yeah. No, sure. I, I can speak loudly. So the question is, what are some of the cultural and institutional factors that are allowing the diversity innovation paradox to persist? Can you identify some incentive levers on this? <laughs> I can see Corey, Aradna, Christine. <clears throat> You're all nodding. <laughs> yeah, so I think that there's, uh, you know, there's literature on kind of why diverse perspectives are penalized and not rewarded in the, you know, to, to begin with. There's some kind of interesting literature from social psychology on this. Um, and so <laughs> I don't, you think? I think that being aware that this pattern exists is probably one of the first things to, to do to address this. So I think it is really key to teach about this pattern in classes, encourage people to think about citation bias, for example, and why that might come about, um, and to think about what they're doing in you know a paper that they might be writing um, to potentially ad ad address this issue, to really get people to think about kind of the historic roots of the academy and why that means, you know, there is this kind of historic cultural legacy that's that's present there. Because I think we all agree that we want to see, that's key to science, is actually having the, the very best perspectives out there. And that's not necessarily always the perspectives that rise that rise to the top, right? So if we want to see fairness um, and see a garden of ideas where, you know, evidence is what results in things taking root, we can really actively work on that if we, we know that there's bias there for cultural reasons and that we all have it, right? Um, and so that that's kind of a starting point. So what can we do in higher education? Again, it's around the, the training that we do. And if we spend all of our time saying this doesn't exist, we're not being very scientific about it, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, I will just add, oop, uh, I'll just add that um, the diversity and innovation paradox that uh, was written about by Hofstra et al., um, that is really one component 
of uh, an entire system where our uh, evaluative, evaluative practices in STEM uh, just continuously uh, cyclically reinforce unequal outcomes at every stage of uh, women and people of color's careers. Um, it's, it can start early on as an early career uh, a scientist. Um, there's data showing that for the NSF uh, graduate uh, research fellowships, those prestigious GRFPs, that there are, that many more of those awards are awarded uh, to uh, uh, white students uh, compared to non, uh, compared to uh, students who are people of color. Um, these kinds of uh, disparities emerge in recommendation letters they emerge in where people of color get placed, like what types of institutions they get placed, they get placed into. Um, it, it's in publications as that uh, diversity and innovation paradox paper uh, indicated, teaching evaluations, service expectations, I could go on and on. And, and so, uh, and of course, funding disparities, of course, which I uh, discussed earlier. So the diversity innovation paradox that shows um, differences in citation rates based on topic and uh, researcher identity, that is one part of an entire ecosystem that causes cyclically reinforced unequal outcomes. So um, I don't know if that helps with identifying like causal incentive links. It's just to say that um, uh, everything is reinforcing each other, unfortunately, and we have to apply multiple multi-pronged approaches to solving these issues. It's not gonna be just, you know, if we fix peer review, everything is gonna magically fix themselves, right? There's no silver bullet to this problem. It would be better for us to take a mosaic approach to these issues of culture change. Yeah, and I mean, you can add on to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's some of it where it's a little harder to get at. So, you know, some of this popped up during the height of pandemic closures, but, you know, you can see where folks' identities get really tied up into the type of work, right, they've done for a long time. And so, you know, bringing something different can in some ways threaten, you know, that identity. And I recall one call early in the pandemic where we were asking how folks were doing and somebody mentioned how they weren't being able to go do their research of somewhere you know overseas right and i was kind of thinking to myself like if that's the biggest challenge you're facing right now you know you're 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 doing pretty okay um and what i really started to realize when i talked to other colleagues is their kind of identity was tied up and they're that person who goes to that place to do coral research every summer or you know they come to monterey to do kelp forage research or they go to panama or wherever it is over there and so sometimes you know changing the way we do science changes can sometimes be you know unconsciously viewed as a, you know, the threat against that identity to, to some extent. Um, you know, others is more direct, you know, it can be the funding, you know, that you get that you're always used to getting funding for doing things the same way. You know, I, people know, you know I run a, I ran a drone program at Monterey, you know, I run it here in Washington now, and it caused a lot of change. I remember we getting, because in the marine ecology community I'm in, yeah, it's a very, they've been using the same data collection approaches since the 60s, but it really hasn't changed, you know, how we go out and monitor, you know, coastal systems. and. You know, I recall when we first started going out talking about using the drones, and I don't know how serious folks were, but they were talking about like I was going to cost people their jobs. And I was like, well, like that's a really odd comment to make because we really, you know, we're coming in with a new way of getting data, examining these systems, and open to do a question. But the comments you were getting out, it was going to change sort of the the labor structure, right? It is there, you know, the funding that you get. In fact, you know, it, it when I left, I do recall, you know, a couple of the state, you know, funding entities they started to require that you had autonomous systems when you do coastal monitoring, it caused a little bit of a kerfuffle in the state because it was very different from how things were going. But I think it was the challenge there is people were so used to getting funded for doing things the same way for about 50 to you know 60 years that this change was, it was really sort of stressful uh, for them. And so, yeah, I said, it's not one thing or another, but it's this confluence of a lot of things, some that are harder to get at, some that are more direct, like who's going to get the rewards, right, for the way you do your research. Yeah, and I'll just chime in. I I wanted to hear from the the academic folks uh, there because I was taking a lot of notes. I got to take a lot of this back to to our our team for discussion. Um, I just 
drop the commentary in, in the chat from Mike Hume that I just read uh, a few days ago. And um, it, it, he emphasizes values. And this is what Corey was talking about. Um, we have, and, you know, everyone has some sense of their identity tied into their work, others, some more than others. And then that automatically drives what's valuable to us. And if you happen to be sitting in a position of uh, authority, a gate or something like that, and you have a certain value system, then it, it's going to be really tough uh, for you to see, and not good or bad, but just to, to see other value systems from other people or uh, other communities, et cetera. So, you know, how do we... How do we deal with that, right? That that's a big question, and something that um, is in the commentary is that, and this gets back to Gus Speth's quote that I had in my presentation. We're asking scientists, who we're all trained to hone in on a solution, and we're asking ourselves, our community, to hone in on a solution to a question that is open ended, and we. We're not trained to do that. When are we going to figure out that we need the experts that are trained to do that to help us do it? And so when natural and physical scientists figure out that social scientists are of equal value, and and but there's a century's worth of history of, of nose down looking from the natural and physical scientists towards those who are social science experts or educational um, you know, researchers, et cetera. But what we're talking about is a human problem. It's not a, it's not a science problem. It's not a research problem. It's a human issue. And we need those that have human expertise to help us deal with that. So I just want to offer that. Radna, did you have something to add? I don't think I can follow that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Brandon, you said it, so. Okay, thank you. Brad, did you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I guess the question is whether there are good examples and thinking of just to probe your kind of thinking on this, I mean, bias in, in funding systems has been under discussion of different kinds for a long time. So age bias or entry bias has been something. And there are ways then to differentially treat first time applicants or renewing applicants. Anyway, the question really is other, in other funding agencies, other good examples and thinking in a different space around indigenous participation. There are other countries that certainly deal with indigenous issues differently. I mean, from Canada, indigenous reconciliation is everywhere. And in the data side of things, the Assembly of First Nations created a protocol called OCAP. And there's an expectation that if you engage with Indigenous partners, you take OCAP training and bring that experience and knowledge to your engagement. And so they, they've actually created that. The Indigenous communities created it. So I'm just looking for other examples like that that might be best or better practices so that we could point to something to change what everyone agrees is an imperfect world. Thank you. Are there any additional examples, panelists, that you would like to share? If not, let me, oh, okay, Edgy, ask. I just want to say that the NASA has been playing with double blind with you. I have no idea how successful they are or how it has improved or helped with any of these things, but it is an example of trying to get as many people. I mean, there are challenges, but they're good examples to learn from as to how bad it is. Okay, I think Christine has something. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, it's a really excellent question. Um, I'm going to. Uh, Share. I'm going to answer your question hopefully a little bit indirectly, uh, just to share what I've gathered from what the NIH uh, tried to do to resolve their uh, black-white funding gap. Um, they actually 
first reported racial disparities back in 2011 in a report that was commissioned by the NIH. Um, and despite uh, having done that, you know, more than 10 years ago, uh, even uh, as late as 2019, they still hadn't closed the black-white funding gap at the NIH, despite many efforts. Uh, in, and in fact, it was at the exact same magnitude where white PIs had a 1.7 to 1.8 funding rate advantage over black PIs, uh, still in, uh, in recent years, uh, Compared and that was the same magnitude as it was back in the early 2000s. So uh, when I learned that, I wanted to know, well, what did the NIH try to do? Because it's clear that what they were trying to do didn't work. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that those lessons um, get transmitted to the NSF so that they don't repeat, you know, try to do the same things that they already tried that clearly didn't have an impact. And from my reading of uh, what the NIH tried to do, they really hyper focused on the on the peer review process, trying to find any way to reduce uh, the disparities in review scores um, it, between uh, proposals by white PIs versus black PIs. They re they overhauled their merit review system. You know, expanded the number of criteria that they used from whatever it was before to nine different criteria. Changed the rating scale from to so that people assign numbers from a scale of zero to nine. They did all of these things uh, to try to narrow that uh, the impact of bias within the review system, right? And none of those changes affected the black white funding gap. They did do a, a, a short uh, trial trying to double blind um, proposals. And what that had the impact of was that it uh, kept the scores for black PIs the same while uh, reducing the scores for white PIs, which I think is interesting because it implies that if there is bias in the system, which th there is, uh, we might want to reframe our thinking and think more about positive biases being given to, to, to proposals by white PIs. Um, but that was on a very small scale and it's not clear at all whether or not that could be, you would get the same impact if you deployed that on a wide scale basis. Um, and in terms of the deployment of double blind at NASA, that has also had um, disparate impacts on uh, research institutions that are, don't have these like mega research offices that can support all the additional labor that goes into needing to double blind your proposals. It's a lot of work to, you know, fulfill all of the requirements to make sure that your proposals um, don't reveal uh, identity information. That is all to say that the hyper focus on just trying to reduce bias within the peer review process, um, I think, Social scientists would probably agree with me uh, when I say this, but that ended up being a distraction from uh, real solutions that involve uh, looking at the actual distribution of material resources. Um, yes, we can continue to look into ways to improve the peer review process, but it should not come at the expense of actually, uh, again, addressing the things that produce inequality in the first place which are differences in uh, social prestige, uh, material resources, and insider knowledge. So um, I encourage folks to not think about, you know, the peer review process as a, as a one universal fix to all of our problems. It's very clear at the NIH that that just did not work. So we need to find other solutions that, again, talk about redistributing social prestige, material resources, and insider knowledge. Thank you. I, yeah. Go I think um, I I wanted to just kind of highlight some strong examples of models that I think the ocean sciences can draw from. From you know, I think Christine did a really nice job of talking about what can be done on the funding side, um, and so I'll instead talk about examples of models in higher education that can be drawn from. I think the PEP program that Ambrose Gerald at has. That I had set up at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is a really strong example of a program. Um, there's the Indigenous Resilience Center at the 
University of Arizona, uh, set up by Professor Carletta Chief. Um, I think that's another really invaluable program. Um, there And so things like this, but thinking about the ocean sciences um, are, you know, examples. I think there are, you know, another example of an MS, MSI that's made enormous headway in equity and access issues is Howard University. You know, in partnership with NOAA, um, they produced 60% of all African-American atmospheric science PhDs in the past decade. And top 10 programs produced fewer than 10. So people, so that's just like, that, that, it, that is really remarkable. Um, I think that looking at the work that the um, uh, Deep South Consortium for Environmental Justice, the HBCU Consortium, also the Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice um, is doing, the EPA has recently funded um, them as through their Tic Tac program so that they're a technical advisory center. Um, and so they're basically then redistributing funding to community-based organizations. Um, so they're, they're you know, uh, yeah, they're kind of serving in that leadership role and then supporting community-based organizations with this. CUNY is, and the New York Environmental Justice Alliance also is in a similar sort of partnerships. And so, you know, you don't quite see anything like these yet, um, but there there are, I think, opportunities in, in ocean sciences. Even in the agricultural sciences, you know, the USGS um, and, and uh, the USDA have, have been supporting different types of centers the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Centers, they're partnership driven. Um, and yeah, so I think that there's lots of examples around the community engaged side and also on the workforce development side. Jim, go ahead, please. Yes. I, um... NSF has had um, REU programs, research experience for undergraduate programs for a long time. And my experience with them is that uh, they tend to have much higher uh, ethnic diversity in them than the uh, graduate programs at the same universities or same place um, or diversity on the faculty. And so I'm, but I've never seen a, um, an analysis of the REU programs that would um, say whether they were very effective in attracting minority students into the ocean sciences. And uh, and then there's also different models. Uh, the UCARS uh, source program, where they bring students back multiple years, is very different, say, from the OCE model. I don't know which one's more effective in terms of recruiting minorities, but is there any comments on, on how effective they are in trying to uh, build up the graduate student population initially and then eventually into um, uh, the field of ocean science, either as faculty or private industry or whatever? I, mean, I can comment on the one I ran for the, before I moved here for about 10, 10 or so years. Uh, yeah, we were a little bit different when we started because we had a couple of, of different, we had a very different model in that it was distributed across all of Monterey Bay. So we had about six institutions uh, involved. So one of the successes in recruiting students was one, we leveraged our um, our network through SACNAS to engage you know, a lot of HSIs, tribal colleges, Pacific Islander serving institutions. Like we said, well, um, I think we still do. We have little polls of students that apply from Guam uh, every year, uh, you know, as well as HBCUs. Um, but part of what worked is that we had a, because we had so many institution types and so many faculty, there was a big diversity of disciplines for students to choose from. So we were actually really successful with getting computer science students from community colleges, because uh, they would often work with the ocean engineering folks at Ambari or the Naval Coast Graduate School for there. In fact, a number of them are either in ocean engineering grad programs or they're working, you know, as you know, researchers uh, at this point. Now, the tracking of them was a bit more challenging. So and, and if this was innovative at the time, I don't think it's innovative anymore. We, we were using we were using Facebook uh, back then, and it was a uh, that was considered novel because it's actually how we recruited students. Uh, we were actually using that as a recruitment tool. Um, they've moved off of that, and you know, we started going to things like Instagram and you know, Twitter, and now it's X. You know, and the platform. We always had a grad student assistant who would tell us what the hottest, you know, social media trend was, and we'd go to that. And so our students are on that. 
where we keep engagement on the face with Facebook platform, it's the families, because they will actually send us updates uh, through there. Um, you know, when we would sort of do highlights on alumni, they would say, oh, by the way, you know, they're doing this now, right? That, and it, it's actually, you wind up having to use a lot of different um, platforms, you know, email, we have an alumni group. You know, we actually ran a fall program for our REU, because that was one of the things we had noted. It's uh, students would leave an REU and then disengage, having to go back to their home institution. So we kept this online platform that we would engage with them uh, through the fall to help them prep to go to their first conference. Uh, you know, we go as a group. Um, you know, we would do stuff in the spring to help them get ready for grad school you know, in, in there. And a number of them are in grad school. I know one just finished up at Woods Hole uh, not too long ago. I think one, our first PhD, got their PhD about two years ago. They were the EPA. So we keep track of them. And so, but we wind up having to use a lot of different platforms that actually required a lot of staffing. And that was the other key part. Uh, our program was unusual in that we had a full-time education lead, an administrative assistant, and a full-time graduate student. And most of our youth don't have that. I think that's the other thing to consider here. It's not just one person. You know, there was like a full staff that, that was doing this as part of their full-time job. Yeah, just as a quick follow-up, any any thoughts on the different models? Because I was all, I've always been impressed with SOARS at, at UCAR because they bring the students back year after year and they seem to have so much confidence when you visit them and so on compared to perhaps uh, a program that, that OCE demands, which is that they only come for one, one, one summer. Yeah, I want to, I, I think your point about SOARS is a really strong one not only the kind of continuity of relationship, but also the the specific mentoring model that they use yeah. where they have multiple mentors, uh, writing mentor, you know, for example, uh, professional development mentors, mentors in many different areas. Um, so I think the, the care that's been taken to develop that has meant that it is, it's known to, and, and they also, the tracking data, it's a really effective program. Yeah. Uh, I think PEP, which I'll put uh, a link to um, in here is also known to be an incredibly effective program also with respect to the tracking. And that is one that, you know, it's in the ocean sciences. Corey's programs, I think, are ones to, to draw on as well for best practices. Our center, we support people coming back also for multiple years. And we've seen, though our numbers are quite small, we certainly have seen um, that that has been really effective. So I'm glad that Jimmy brought that up. But I did put into the chat earlier a link to um, a special issue that Corey and others, um, Lisa White and others have edited, um, where there are different kind of case studies um, that are presented. And I think actually you'll, you know, some of the case studies that are being presented are actually from people who are running REU type programs. So of course, their effectiveness is going to vary um, a lot depending on the structure. And also there's a lot of creativity and variation in structure. structure. So some of the, the papers in the special issue actually have um, some really nice examples. Is that the one in oceanography? Is that the, the one? Yeah, okay. Terrific. So I'm gonna move on to Shimi. Shimi, did you wanna ask your question? Um, I feel like there's been a lot of chat conversations okay. about this, so it's okay, we can move on to this. Perfect. Leila, did you want to ask your question? Um, yes, I kind of keep asking or finding a way to ask the same question. We've we've talked about the peer review process, and I, I really appreciate the thoughts that you all have that you know peer review is not gonna fix it, but I think that some of the committee is looking for some thoughts on how we can shift the the social science currency from the gold standard of NSF funding um, to the outcomes of the science, especially when that gold standard is built into the peer review. Any comments, Brandon? maybe we've exhausted the topic. <laughs> no, I, I I mean, I think that's something that NSF would want to hear from from the committee um, because we are currently, I hate to keep using the word constrained, but we are <laughs> by our merit review. But that doesn't mean that at the program director level, uh, how 
panels are constructed and um, administered and managed, um, et cetera, there's a lot of flexibility there. So to hear from the committee about, hey, at that grant, at that level of granularity, what what can be done um, in in that review part of the whole system uh, that can loosen uh, you know a lot of the the traditional ways that we and Christine was hinting at this that that we review uh, that we apply our our merit review and still as you mentioned keep it as the gold standard and I don't think there there there's any danger of um, adjusting what needs to be adjusted and and losing any credibility. I mean, I, I don't see any problem with that. But this gets back to some of the attitudes that um, some of my esteemed panelists have, have mentioned, that some people do think that, that if you start to tamper with the traditions, that somehow the rigor is going to be diluted. And that's, you know, that that's just a prevailing attitude out there that also needs to be dealt with so can i ask a follow-up question oh. to the door for the second question is there are there examples that could be pulled out of deficit-minded language that is showing up in reviews is that is that one way to and i know it's tricky business because peer reviews are confidential but can can we elevate some examples or maybe point the committee to some literature where we can help shape our recommendations. Well, I have a quick comment on that, which is that the, um, you know, NSF has, each division has these committed, committee of visitors that come in uh, every two or three years or four years to look at the, uh, and their job is to look at the review process and they write a report. And, and um, so there is some information. I, I don't think they're particularly thorough, but the, uh, based on what I've read, but it, uh, the, there are there are a large number of these reports floating around both for ocean science. Uh, the most recent one is 2023 uh, that that do bring in a group of experts and they look at the review process and, um, and make comments and including on um, uh, everything from whether you, uh, early career scientists are discriminated against or whether there's in, um, what it looks like in terms of uh, diversity of in other ways um, for those who are funded versus uh, those who are not. Christine, did you have something to add? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I sincerely appreciate this question um, from the committee. Um, I wish I had you know, the magical answer of what recommendations you all should offer. Um, the only thing that comes to my mind about one way to frame this is um, so the NSF is federally mandated to, um, you know, fund basic research, right? But it is also the only STEM funding agency with the federal mandate to train the next generation of scientists and engineers in the United States. And when we talk about NSF funding the best science um, for the, you know, for the good of, you know, the nation and whatnot, I think we should also consider that uh, we need NSF also needs to fulfill that other piece of its federal mandate, right? To train the next generation of scientists. And that could be further emphasized in this merit review process where when we are choosing the best science to fund, recognizing that given the current demographics of STEM and who are the reviewers, the best science that the current scientists might think is best may not actually reflect what is truly, you know, best for for the public good, such that everyone, regardless of background and identity, is benefiting from our work. I think we could further emphasize that important aspect of the NSF's job, right? And maybe make that more clear in, in the merit review process that that is also part of what we should be considering as the best science that needs to be funded at this time. So food for thought. Thank you, Christine. Peter? Yeah, thank you all for, for your really thoughtful comments. You know, 
from my point of view, uh, and my experience over the last several months in particular, I mean, DEI is under assault, and I don't think that's going to get better. Uh, this question I'm posing is really for those primarily who work with NSF or work at NSF. But as we consider, uh, you know, our recommendations, what are ways in which we can support you in making the case for the continued uh, efforts uh, to diversify our ocean sciences community? And I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping you might have some specific examples of, of pitfalls that you've seen, right, from your point of view, uh, language or ideas that that tend to be less effective than others. And if this is too much to ask, I understand, but I think it's an important point because we are really at a crossroads. Thank you. Brendan, why don't you get us started? Yeah, the, the excellent question and uh, an unfortunate one. Um, an example of a, a pitfall that are going to impact institutions, researchers, students, and, and science overall is that public institutions in states with uh, anti-DEI policies theoretically will not be able to uh, submit proposals to particular grants from funding agencies because their state policy says no, and the federal, we, we're, we're hands off. We're not going to change our priorities in the programs under this current administration. And that's another elephant in the room because November is coming. Uh, <laughs> so what, um, you, you know, we're, this is impacting state institutions and, and it could theoretically, uh, those researchers there, those, those students, um, et cetera. And, and not just for the scientific enterprise, but for the, the building of the infrastructure of emerging research institutions in those states that are public. Uh, because of the the overhead that comes along with a grant, you know, the, the so is this going to end up causing um, a greater divide in the academic haves and have-nots? Because the EPSCOR states happen to be the states where these policies, you know, you look at the maps, right? So that's it's a it's a huge issue, um, and what I think. One thing I, I think is needed um, is more interaction with, and this is this is a weird statement, more interaction with our business sector colleagues and marketing and branding. And, and academics do it all the time, but anytime you, and I don't want to broad brush, I apologize for saying that. The, the academics that I um, often, uh, um, uh, engage with, they don't even like to use those terms, but they do it all the time on their websites and when they're, at, when they're at meetings, recruiting students and all that kind of stuff. So what do we do as far as DEI? Because I agree with you hundred percent, it's under attack and it's, um, it's been looped in with all kinds of other uh, kind of weird ideologies and things of that nature. But how do we rebrand and retool and refocus ourselves that this work of broader impacts or broader participation continues in an apolitical sense. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a political thing. How do we find the value for anyone in what it is that broadening participation brings to the whole enterprise and, and to the planet that is outside of ideologies? And to help NSF figure that out, maybe that's I don't know. How do we bolster our social behavior and economics directorate, right? Um, that that directorate, uh, as opposed to not as opposed to, but in addition to also keeping the discovery science in the core research directorates um, where it is, or even higher. We, how, you know, we 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 certainly would love guidance and ideas on that. Thank you, Brandon. I'm actually going to uh, you can use this. Uh, sorry, can I respond to that? Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I don't mean to speak out of no, general, okay. but uh, I, I come from a university that's directly impacted by this. So I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. And I think it's important for people to understand 
what those laws, regardless of what you think about them, and I completely understand what they actually said. So there, at least in Texas, and I can't speak for any other state, but I know that um, this is one of the ones that people do point to, the law does not prohibit you from getting a grant to, to look at diversity initiatives. Nothing that we've talked about here is expressly forbidden in that law in Texas, at least. So I think what's really important when you think about these things is not to be hindered by, by what you think the law says, mm -hmm. to make sure you know what the law says, so that there's this tendency, I think, for people to be, be, be scared of, of the law and think that they can't do things that they really can do. And that I know for, for sure the University of Texas would support and does support diversity research, regardless of the Texas law, which states two things, by the way, it states that there can be no consideration of diversity in hiring, and it says that the university cannot have mandatory diversity training or a diversity department, but it really states nothing about diversity research uh, at the university. So I just want to make that clear that people should understand what the laws and not not prohibit yourself because of a misunderstanding of what the law is. Just ask a question. So diversity of hiring, does that mean if you have an NSF grant and you wanted to hire into that grant and apply DEI in some sense, you would be restricted? I'm not sure. That's a really good point that I think people should understand. Look, I think that the conditions, and NSF might understand this way better than I do, the conditions of the grant might supersede that in that sense, for example, for students. Um, but there are diversity initiatives that, you know, my university uh, is, is supporting for students that are only for certain segments of students, and that's perfectly acceptable under the Texas law. They typically don't touch students, too. I, I just want to chime in here. Um, we have similar considerations in the state of Mississippi, but when you, I will echo everything that Marsha said, when you look at the law carefully um, and really understand it, there are, there are places to work in, and most of these apply to staff, not even to faculty, and not to students. Because my understanding of the Florida law is that it applied to the use of state funds. Not for the use of federal funds. I think that there's yeah. all the laws are a little bit different. Like they're separate conversations. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. All right. So I'm going to bring us back uh, to whether you have a follow up uh, comment or uh, it's another question. Um, I have kind of a follow up comment that maybe, um, you know, I want to point us in a certain direction, if I may. Um, so some of the things that I'm hearing, you know, we're all appalled at the data that Christine showed us, right? And we talked about the evaluation process. And Christine, thank you for all the insights you brought about what NIH tried. Um, that's actually information that I had not heard before. So I would I would love to hear where I can get my hands on that and, and maybe dig in a little bit more. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm hearing in this conversation about panel reviews and how the system's sort of recreating itself is this idea that we have to find a way to align our stated values with our evaluation system, right? And how do we do that? And clearly, Christine, you talked about how NIH has been trying that unsuccessfully. I guess the one analogy I will draw on is the analogy of hiring practices. I think for the last 20 years in academia, we've really dug into our hiring practices. And there's been a number of things that people have tried, some of which did not work, but there are interventions that do work and that essentially make sure that the process is such that um, the evaluation criteria are aligned more closely to our stated values. And certainly at my institution, I've seen a huge shift through the use of these best practices in who we bring in. I mean, I, the, without a doubt, I know that we carried out searches over the last few years that clearly would have produced a different outcome 10 years ago than they did today. And I'm very proud of that. Um, so, and I know that this is the case at other institutions as well. So what does it look like to do that in the proposal review realm or in the, not just in the review, but just the whole process, right? And 
so I guess I want to, I, I still want to challenge us to keep thinking about um, ways in which the whole structure can be altered to align our stated values with the evaluation system we're using, actually. Um, and, and, and Christy had some ideas, right? What about elevating this notion of training the next generation? That could be one way of changing the rubric so that different proposals rise to the surface. Just like I think we have refined the rubric for hiring that are now resulting in, at my institution, that huge changes in uh, the number of students from diverse backgrounds in graduate school and also changes in um, the faculty. So um, I guess I, I would love to hear some thoughts if there is still time, though I also uh, yield to Mona, um, since I know you might wanna uh, roll out things in a different way too. Let's see if uh, folks have any comments related to what you just said. Corey, go ahead, please. Yeah, one thing to think about, you, know, you talk about the composition of your faculty, you can start to also think about the composition of the review panels themselves, you know, because even if you train, I mean, you can't train a younger generation, but if they're being trained by that generation that's resistant to change, it might be hard to get through to them. Um, you know, and I think the comments come up about some of the science that comes out of certain groups that it has more societal relevance than basic science application. And so, are you bringing in folks from institutions on those panels that actually come from those type of research backgrounds? Like, you know, I talk about, you know, the National Network of Minority Serving Institutions, and we have this tendency to think of them as this place where, well, that's where I go to get, you know, Hispanic students or tribal students or African-American students. We don't think about it's a place where, oh, that's where I go to actually learn how to do community science the right way. Right. Oh, that's where that person's doing, you know, the type of research that way because they're limited by their budget, so they've had to do something different. That's different. So, are you bringing those types of people right onto your panel that can inform the research? You know, I, I don't know. I've I've been asked to be on panels, and I've seen where things like the the question about the infrastructure and facilities right can become a, a thing. Well, they're too small; they're not gonna be able to do that. Right? Can somebody advocate for that? Well, if you give them the money to buy the, buy the facility, then they can do the research because they clearly right have the academic background right to engage in it. Um, you know, some of the social aspects, it's not unusual for folks who come from a basic science background. Like, I, I don't understand why we're, we would fund this. If there's someone on that panel that can advocate, the reason that this work is gonna be transformed is because it impacts this community and it's that community that might actually be leading be on the forefront of climate change, right, issues, right? You need those types of folks in there. So in other words, you need a different type of reviewer that you're probably gonna have to think about, right, having on panels, because you can do a lot of training. You know, I've Faculty member, we did a lot of faculty training. You know, my HR director, like, dear me, you can't say this, but the moment those those applications got to the panel, like they threw out that training and they looked, they looked for people who resonated with their pet issues, right? And so you wanted with these very non-diverse, you know, candidate pools uh, afterwards. So I think yeah, training can help, but you know, people have do have this tendency to go back to the things that they're familiar with and comfortable with. And so I think in some sense you have to bring in these disruptor types. <laughs> Right onto these review panels, who are going to take a look at these these types of applications and proposals in ways that maybe not historically, in ways that these sort of proposals haven't historically been reviewed. I I also want to highlight the Im importance of um, looking at outcomes at NSF and noting and of the importance of program officers themselves. Um, ensuring that we have program officers that are have broad representation, that um, they're looking at the data uh, with what's coming out of their panels, you know, what's coming out of their programs, and that there are opportunities for, um, you know, uh, accountability and discussion really within federal agencies. Because at the end of the day, the they're, you know, people just like like all of us, right? And so um, if NSF has a strong commitment to this, which it states it does, it's built into the mission of this, then ensuring that actually the processes um, within the agency at every level are reflecting that is key. And I think that the framings around workforce development, you know, ensuring it's representative of the US and so forth, those are things that transcend all, you know, all parties, right? So, yeah. So we're almost at the top of the hour. I can't believe that we've spent uh, two hours in this very rich, rich uh, discussion. So thanks to all the panelists. Um, so the my last question to uh, all the panelists is going to be, 
uh, this morning. Um, the NSF uh, uh, leaders are here, and they uh, they challenge the the committee to think about um, visionary, strategic ways in which we can move forward ocean science research, uh, but something strategic, visionary that is grounded in reality. So I would like to invite the panelists to challenge the committee to think of one bold change, one bold uh, step that we need to take in that direction. Well, I mean, I've been saying it for years. That there has to be an SDC equivalent program you know, that's housed at MSI to develop a basic ocean science workforce out there. And I, I don't think to this day anything like that exists at, at NSF. Yeah, I, I second that. I think that looking at the models that are effective, that are mission-driven from NASA, from NIH, um, and even some of the work that NOAA has, has supported, but is just not big enough in scale, you know, and so for NSF to make an investment on the scale of STCs, but are focused on workforce development, broadening participation, um, that that's key, right? And that's key to sustainability. It's key to coastlines and people. It cuts across so many kind of programs that and and initiatives that they've that they've launched. Um, I guess. Um, it's hard to pick one, but one thing you could consider is to advocate for funders, not only just, not only NSF, I don't know if your committee also covers, you know, other funding agencies like, I don't know, USDA or DOE, but advocate for all funders, uh, you know, government agencies and philanthropic uh, organizations to improve their data collection and transparency on their funding outcomes by various characteristics. I think we do lack the most basic data to support and evaluate how we're doing, especially for faculty diversity initiatives. Um, and actually NSF has been probably one of the best, if not the best funding agency in uh, um, sharing the, their funding outcomes data, you know, for for other agencies, it's far worse where they didn't even start collecting said data until like 2017 or something like that. But uh, making sure that that continues and gets better, especially as we move into future uncertain years, um, I think will be really important to ensure accountability. This was strategic. We have somebody from, oh, go ahead, Aradna, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to make sure I, you know, I did have a, a quick second one, and of which is on funding this kind of CUNY university model in ocean sciences, which I think is directly in alignment with the ocean justice strategy that was just released by the White House, right? And so this this is the time, I think, for something like that. Brandon, you know I, what I was about to say. It's only strategic that you're to you're at the end. You represent the agency to which we're making these recommendations. So, what do you suggest? What what should we consider? Uh, yeah, this, it, it, it's hard to follow uh, my my three colleagues. Uh, I'm thinking that a, a push for cross sector collaboration. So this gets to Rodna's point about the CUNY University. Uh, hubs uh, around our coast where there are not just academic institutions, but federal agencies, et cetera. I, I always think of the um, the UCAR model in Colorado because there's federal agencies there and and, and facilities and, and things of that and universities, right? So where can we design these hubs, scale up these hubs uh, that exist or people aren't thinking about? So that it is the um, not just ocean, but everything related to that in that uh, in, in that region, maybe regional models or things of that nature. But again, to Corey's point, so big investment would would be needed there. And the last thing I'll say is, and, and that's on the infrastructure piece for for student prep, faculty researchers. But then there's the ethics piece, 
what are we going to do about ethics as it relates to culture um, and um, you know, our professional societies, in particular, AGU is out in front as uh, defining harassment in any form as scientific misconduct. But there aren't many institutions that are doing that, and certainly not federally. So that's that's another part for the culture piece and retention of the workforce that we need. With that, we will close the panel. Thank you all so much for your very, very thoughtful perspectives. And thank you for to all the participants for, for a very thoughtful uh, exchange as well. Thanks again. Back to you. Yeah, that was really, really excellent, everybody. I so appreciate you all's time and wisdom and input into this process. This is a topic that I think does not um, feature prominently in the last decadal survey, and this committee is certainly interested in making sure that we represent it well um, in this next decadal survey. And Mona, thank you for moderating um, very much so.